This video is sponsored by Raycon. There was a period of my life where I basically had a complete mental map of every single arcade machine in a two mile radius from my house. A vast network of pizza places, comic book stores, and laundromats. And when one of these machines changed, it was a big deal. And it was the summer of 1992 when the word started to spread about a weird new Street Fighter 2 arcade machine that had popped up at a laundromat by my house. A Street Fighter 2 machine where you could shoot Hadouken's midair and change your character right in the middle of the match. And of course, this sounded completely ridiculous, like one of those My Uncle Works at Nintendo type stories. At this point, we were already living in a post Shang Long world, and I definitely wasn't believing this without seeing it with my own eyes. So I went out to that laundromat to look for the Street Fighter 2 arcade machine, and sure enough, it was actually real. <laughs> Between the release of Street Fighter 2 Champion Edition and Street Fighter 2 Turbo, there was a really strange version of the game that could be found. You could shoot projectiles in the air or spam them all over the place. There was basically no cooldown, so you could fill up an entire screen with Sonic Booms or Hadoukens. You could switch characters mid-match just by pressing the start button. And it was also substantially faster than a standard Street Fighter 2 machine. If you ever encountered one of these Street Fighter 2 machines in the wild, it probably blew your mind just as much as it did mine. And considering how much the arcade scene was fraught with hoaxes and lies and misinformation, you probably didn't believe it until you saw it with your own eyes either. It sounded like something that was too good to be true and yet there it was. I only got to play it a handful of times because for some reason the old lady who ran that laundromat didn't like people coming in if they weren't there to do laundry. Actually, now that I think about it, that still pisses me off. Like, they always had the newest stuff at that laundromat, like NBA Jam. Mortal Kombat, uh... I think they were the first place around here to have Tekken, but like, why would you get all the newest, best games if you don't want people to come and play the games just to do the laundry? It makes no sense. But anyway, the point is that despite the fact that I only played it once or twice, it stuck with me for years because there was just something about the spectacle of it. Like, obviously it was completely broken, uh, objectively not that great of a game, something you would never find at a tournament, but it just, it leaves an impression on you, especially when you're a kid. But that machine was basically gone as fast as it showed up, and anybody else who hadn't seen it with their own eyes that I would tell about it, they would either think I was full of shit, or that I was talking about Street Fighter 2 Turbo. But it wasn't Turbo, and I knew what I saw, but eventually years passed, and I kind of just forgot all about it. It wasn't until years later when I was looking for meme ROMs that I happened to come across something titled Street Fighter 2 Rainbow Edition. As soon as I saw that name, the memories of that machine came back to me and I knew that that had to be the game I played, and sure enough, it was. And after I knew the name, I looked it up and found out that this of course wasn't some uh, obscure Queens, New York exclusive. Tons of people around the world played this exact same version of Street Fighter. But what exactly was this game and where did it come from? If you look at the title screen of Street Fighter 2 Rainbow Edition, you see the logo that has rainbow colors, which is where it gets its name from, but it still just says that it's made by Capcom. And there's no physical branding from another company on the machines or any of the hardware. But if you look inside the code of Street Fighter 2 Rainbow Edition, you'll find a hidden line that says, distributed by Hongxi Enterprises in Taiwan. But with that in mind, I think it's safe to say that the old lady at the laundromat who didn't want gamers in there wasn't going to Taiwan in search of the finest Street Fighter 2 secret versions. So how does a game like that wind up there? As it turns out, Street Fighter 2 Rainbow Edition wasn't its own standalone machine. Rather, it was a simple modification to the already existing Champion Edition hardware. Essentially, this was the very first ROM hack that a lot of us ever encountered, and amazingly, didn't make the characters naked or wearing clan robes. And changing a standard Champion Edition machine to a Rainbow Edition machine was a very simple process. Because the chips containing the game's code were socketed, all a person needed to do was pop out the old Champion Edition ones, and pop in the new Rainbow Edition ones. Don't even need to solder anything. And in addition to how easy it was to convert a vanilla Champion Edition board to a Rainbow Edition board, counterfeiting was also rampant. Because Street Fighter 2 was such a runaway success, Capcom just couldn't keep up with demand for more machines. 
and it's believed that at some point there are several times more fake Street Fighter 2 machines out there than legitimate ones. And this became such an issue that Capcom started placing ads about it in trade magazines. The success of Street Fighter 2 Champion Edition has sent counterfeiters scurrying to make an easy profit using Capcom's proprietary, copyrighted, and trademarked material by manufacturing, selling, or operating counterfeit versions of our game. Counterfeit in this case means any Street Fighter 2 Champion Edition PC boards, parts of PC boards, chips, graphics, or other items containing our proprietary material that did not originate from Capcom. Counterfeits are illegal, illegal to make, illegal to sell, illegal to operate. Counterfeiting hurts our entire industry. It stifles the research and development necessary to produce top quality products. If someone offers you a deal too good to be true on a Street Fighter 2 Champion Edition, it probably is. It's very likely that Rainbow Edition machines weren't found in obscure places because the owners were looking for the ROM hack. Instead, it's likely that they were simply offered Rainbow Edition machines at a cheaper deal than a legitimate Street Fighter 2 Champion Edition machine. Eventually, Capcom would work internationally to crack down on these counterfeits and hacks with some degrees of success. Although Hung Shi was never named specifically by Capcom, it's likely that they were one of the operations shut down by the Taiwanese police. But that's not where the story of Street Fighter Rainbow Edition ends. In fact, the existence of Street Fighter 2 Rainbow Edition likely changed the entire trajectory of fighting game history. Meet James Goddard. James Goddard was a hardcore Street Fighter 2 fan who became so involved in the community that popped up around the game that he wound up running the first officially sanctioned tournament. And running this tournament was the beginning of a working relationship with Capcom. This relationship would eventually bring James to the development side of the games industry, and he was the one who pitched the idea for Champion Edition. Considering the overwhelming success of Champion Edition, and I believe to this day it's still the most successful Street Fighter game, if James had something to say to Capcom, they would listen. And this put him in a unique position when the hacks of his game started to circulate. He visited an arcade in San Jose, California to give this game a shot. He hated it. Rainbow Edition came out, the Taiwanese ROM upgrade with all the crazy fireballs in the air and the helicopter kicks working in the air, just everything broken. Super fast, super broken. We started hearing how these things are getting installed and operators are earning money off of them, but we're not getting any of the action. So I go down to, I don't know, Galaxy Arcade, I think it was in San Jose. I go and I take a look at this Rainbow Edition and I spend a good four hours playing it, looking at it and going, man, this is just garbage. On one hand, it's kind of like, woo, look at these crazy-ass fireballs in the air. And on the other hand, it's just like, but it's so unbalanced. It wasn't until he went and played the original Champion Edition again that he revised his stance. I sit down to play against my co-worker Joel Pambid, and the weirdest thing happens. He picks Guile, I pick Zangief, I go to play, and oh my god, the game felt like it was underwater. I had just spent the last 4-6 to six hours playing Rainbow Edition at 25% speed increase, so Champion Edition felt like shit. It was so slow. For the next 2 hours I could not shake that, and it threw my timing off. It was just kind of this oh my god moment where I went, the real threat of Rainbow Edition is not all the fireballs in the air and the craziness. The threat is the speed is addicting and it changes everything. James wrote a report about these games that he sent to Capcom and eventually pitched the idea that would turn into Street Fighter 2 Turbo. And at first he was met with tons of resistance, Capcom just did not want to make this game. The Japanese developers felt that speeding up the gameplay would completely ruin the timing and the balance. They felt that it would change Street Fighter from a game of reacting to your opponent's choices to trying to predict what they're going to do ahead of time. Furthermore, since James was a Zangief fan, they thought that he was just biased and wanted to speed the game up to make his slow character overpowered. But after some arguing, Capcom decided to just give James's idea a shot. So they ran a playtest with a modified sped up version of Champion Edition. Capcom Japan was really mortified when Turbo in Japan was super popular. There was a playtest where we showed up and there were kids freaking out, and that was kind of the end of the controversy. They just let me do what I wanted to do after that because it, it worked out. 
Despite their initial misgivings, the Japanese developers simply could not deny the success of James's suggestions. And thus, Street Fighter 2 Turbo was born. And even though it was little more than a slightly upgraded Champion Edition, that was the game that introduced fighting game fans to the kind of fast-paced action that we've come to expect, especially from the Street Fighter series. As great and as classic as the original Street Fighter 2 games were, if you go back and play them today, they really do feel like James described, like you're underwater. And there's a chance that nothing would have changed were it not for a group of opportunistic Taiwanese hackers. When Harvest Moon came out, I never would have expected that it would become one of my favorite games of the 16-bit era. I think I picked it up because it bore superficial resemblance to the 16-bit JRPGs that were my favorite thing at the time. But unlike those games, it was completely unconcerned with saving the world. You just live your life as a humble farmer, plant some turnips, meet a nice girl from the village and marry her. It stood out from the pack by being a fun, engrossing, and downright addictive experience that you didn't fight or kill anything in. But what if you said, forget about all this wholesomeness, and you said, yeah, you know what, let's throw in a little bit of killing. But according to an old internet rumor that's resurfaced somewhat recently, such a game does exist. But we can't seem to find it, and a lot of you have been messaging me about this game, so for today's episode of Gaming Mysteries, let's take a look at the evil farming game. Never in the history of this channel have I received so many messages and emails to cover a single topic. Except, you know, maybe Chris Chan, but I'm never gonna make a Chris Chan video. These messages spoke of a farming game like Harvest Moon, but with a twist. You have to kill your wife and hide her body from the police. And now, this is a story that's evolved a lot in the time since I started working on the video about it. In that time, my friend Nexpo made a video including this story and it greatly signal boosted the search. This led to a lot of new leads and I imagine that by the time I'm done editing this video, there's going to be even more information about it, but I want to get out what we know so far. The earliest instance that I've seen of someone talking about this online is on r slash tip of my joystick in April of 2013. Sparta 213. This game was kind of like Harvest Moon. I know almost nothing about this game. All I can remember is that it's kind of like Harvest Moon but with a dark twist. The game starts out with you and your wife. One night, you get into a fight and you end up stabbing her to death. Now the game revolves around you farming to stay alive while trying to keep the town from finding out about the incident that happened. Every now and again, the cops come to search your house and you have to hide her corpse. Now reading this, my gut instinct is that this was a flash game, you know, something that you would find on Newgrounds. And a few other people in the thread had this thought, but Sparta213 added an edit. I have no recollection of what console this game was for or when it came out. I know that it was released after 2000. I know this is so vague, but it's really hard to remember something you forgot. Also, it had to be before mid to early 2015. Graphics were not 3D. I'm 100% sure it wasn't a browser game. Now, I've never played this game, but it sounds cool as fuck and it sounds like something I would really want to play. And others felt the same as it was a very highly upvoted post and a mod stickied it to the top of the subreddit. And people began to get some more leads from Sparta213. Oh my god, that's pretty intense. What was it for? PC? PlayStation? And was it modern or from a long time ago? After the year 2000, I believe, but definitely before 2016. Do you at least remember if you were ever in high school or college when you played this game? That might help round down the timeline. When you said it definitely wasn't a browser game and it was made after 2000, what made you jump to those conclusions? Well, I can remember that it wasn't as browser game, it was too high quality for that. And it was made after 2000 because I don't think that society would have been okay with something like that. I also just have this sort of gut feeling that it was after 2000. Are you sure farming was the focus of the game? Yeah, I am. Why did you have that in mind? Nothing in particular, just keeping the possibilities open. One of the games that people suggested this might have been was called Wild Season. Wild Season was a 2015 farming game that was presented a bit like a more mature Harvest Moon. However, it contained no such murder plot. There is also the suggestion of Scapeland. However, Scapeland is a bit too recent and it's also in 3D, looking nothing like Harvest Moon. Other users suggested that it might have been an RPG Maker game, which definitely seems like something that might be possible. 
Granted, no RPG Maker game could ever top Tamer's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 Sonic styled RPG. This is the prophecy of light and darkness. Let's get down to business. Another user suggested that perhaps it was all just a dream. At this point, the most likely origin of this game is your dreams. It's the exact sort of thing the average dream will create. Something you enjoy slash think about in real life, Harvest Moon, crossed with a terrible incident you have to suffer through in guilt while nobody around you actively notices and are just generally probably suspicious of you. Everyone has the guilt dream. This looks like yours. You probably mix it up with real life as everyone does sometimes. With how odd it is and how much actual gameplay and art they'd have to create to get it off the ground, I highly doubt anyone actually made this. And while I do agree that this is an awful lot of work for something that would presumably have been a free project by an indie dev, the dream explanation doesn't really pan out for me. I've definitely had dreams that put me in an unlikely situation in a video game world that I was familiar with, but nothing that was ever so believable or realistic, or even that much felt like a video game that I would bring it out with me into the real world and think it was real. I always feel like my dreams personally are a lot less coherent than people describe their dreams as being though, so maybe that's just me. Either way, the dream explanation would seem a bit more unlikely, as a couple of years later, a user named David Spade AMA would come looking for a very similar game, PC, Evil Farming Game. There was this game I used to have downloaded in about 2006, before I upgraded my computer and lost it. It was a farming Stardew Valley style of game, where you murder your wife, and then you try and pretend you never killed her. And that was the whole game. Keep farming and make sure no one finds out you killed her. There was a fishing minigame, and I specifically remember fishing up evidence of your wife's murder, and then you pass out. Another user was quick to point out the thread from all those years back. This is one of the top posts of all time on this sub, and it remains unanswered there. So it probably wasn't a dream then. Maybe OP can provide us with more details than the old post. Oh wow, I thought I was the only one. Not mentioned in that post was the pixel art gameplay and weird cutscenes in a different art style. It was downloaded off some shoddy indie devs website that also had a ton of graphic live leak style videos to download. The name was so out there that I can't think of what it was. It might have started with Ash and then kept going, but that might have been another site. And while it's possible that David Spade AMA simply went back through the tip of my joystick archives and decided to start a wild goose chase, it seems a little unlikely to me. It's just such an obscure thing to try and be back and turn into a whole internet thing. He also addressed the RPG Maker question. What graphical and era details can you add? Also, do you know if it was an RPG Maker game? Was it a standalone game? Did you download off the web? It was not an RPG Maker game, and I do think it was freeware, downloaded off the web and not a physical disc. It was its own game, downloaded off what I think was a developer's website, and there was a ton of messed up stuff on the website, like r slash watch people die type stuff. It had a weird art style. I remember the game Y2K is what made me think of it. It was pixel art during gameplay, but had cutscenes too, which I don't remember if they were voiced. The question of the game Scapeland was brought up once again, and while David Spade said this wasn't the game, he did say that the cutscenes might have resembled the graphical style. A lot of people at this point wound up comparing this story to the Candle Cove creepypasta. To put it briefly, the Candle Cove creepypasta played itself out over the course of a forum thread. In the thread, various users recalled details about a creepy TV show named Candle Cove. The fact that it was a creepy children's show and people couldn't seem to find it was central to this story. Personally, I can't help but think that if that were the case with this story, there would have been more specific details by now. But really all we had at this point was a vague overview of the plot, look, and game mechanics. David Spade AMA denied this claim and said it was definitely not something that was either for children or pretending to be for children. Another game was suggested in this thread as well, a game called Reap and Sow by Snow Owl. David Spade AMA didn't respond to this suggestion, but let's take a look at the game Reap and Sow. Reap and Sow is an RPG Maker game that does combine farming gameplay with other elements. However, these elements do not include the murder of your wife or hiding the body from the police. Instead, the game involves you going into a creepy dream world at night where the crops that you farmed can help your gameplay. It seems like a really cool game, but it's not this game. 
The search for this game would heat up once again later that month in December of 2018 when someone posted and longtime viewers of my channel are gonna groan when I say this. So get ready. A Redditor claimed that he had this game on his old laptop, but the laptop wouldn't boot up. You see, the hard drive on the laptop was messed up and needed to be recovered. Avoiding the police after killing your wife living a normal life. Hi all, first time posting here. Today I found my old laptop, but sadly it won't boot up. But it brought back some great memories, particularly a game I'm about to describe. So at the start of the game, you killed your wife, but after that, you just lived as a normal managing your farm. However, it had a twist. The police could come at any time and find the body, so you had to constantly be wary and move the body. The laptop was built in 2001, and I bought a new one in 2003, so it would have been between that time. It wasn't a browser game, and I think I may have gotten it from uTorrent but cannot remember TBH. Hope this is enough info, and many thanks. Commenters gave suggestions on how to recover the data, how to fix the hard drive, blah 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 blah, you know how the story goes. But let's just see where I went. Edit. Many thanks to all those offering to recover my hard drive. I'm actually in the UK and a lot of the offers seem to be from the US. My local computer store opens Wednesday 2nd January, so I'm going to take it in to see if they can get it to boot up. Many thanks again, it's very kind of you all. Edit edit. Laptop checked in earlier today. Quite busy, but should have an update Friday. Final edit. Sad news. The laptop is bugged. The dampness slash moisture of the storage I placed it in is knackered at all. Any final suggestions? Edit edit edit. I am retrieving quotes from professional data recovery firms. Update. The platter of the hard drive was damp, and it's been deemed unrecoverable. I'm really sorry to have built hopes up. I'm sure you are. In this thread came a number of new suggestions. So at the time this was posted, if you googled for a game where you kill your wife, you'd get a game called Moirai. If you do that search now, you get Stardew Valley, which is really funny to me, but the game is definitely not Stardew Valley. So Moirai is a defunct mystery game which does take place in a farm village. You're searching for a missing person in a cave and you find them dying and when you encounter them, you can choose to either let them live or to put them out of their misery. Although it is a farm game that potentially involves murder, you don't kill your wife, you don't hide the body, and the police don't look for you. Also, it was made in 2016, it was 3D and looks nothing like Harvest Moon or Stardew Valley. So that's the end of that lead. And now... This right here is probably where I would have ended the video had Nexpo not put his out. Thanks to the video that Nexpo put out, there's a lot more eyes on this search now and there's a lot of new leads. All of the evidence that's known so far has been collected on a new subreddit r slash that evil farming game. One of these new leads involves a redditor named Westy Free. It was back in April that Westy Free had made a post on r slash tip of my joystick looking for this same game. It also had a few more details about how your wife is killed. So I vaguely remember a game located in a farm, I think so. You had a wife, but in like the first 10 minutes of the game you had to either stab her, kill her, or drown her. Maybe there was also an electrocuting outcome, but I'm not sure. Stabbing was also straightforward, you stabbed your wife, hid the body, all the other however the police came to investigate and you had to tell them lies to get them away. After that, you would go on with your normal life, do work, etc. However, at any given time, the police could investigate again for the body. I think there was a big story slash action scene afterwards, but I can't remember after a certain amount of time. Since I probably stopped playing since I was a kid back in the day, I hope this is enough to go by. One interesting detail about this post now is that he mentioned a drowning scenario and remember, one of the other posters mentioned a cutscene where you find evidence in the lake. But this still didn't get as much further in the search and most of the comments were just kinda like, oh this again? But after the release of Nexpo's video, some Redditors decided to try and contact some of the original OPs who made these posts. And a Redditor named Zorin Va managed to get in contact with Westy Free. Hey, I wanted to ask a quick question about the mysterious farming game about killing your wife. Sure. Do you remember if it was a downloadable game or maybe a ROM hack for another game for an emulator? Many of us are still trying to find this game. 
Downloadable, 100%. Okay, thank you very much. By the way, I'm going to my uncle next week to get the game. Holy shit, really? Yes. Was it on a disc, or perhaps a USB flash drive? Hard drive on his laptop, I believe. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got yet another hard drive in play. There's no talk yet of this one being buggered, but as of the recording of this video, he hasn't gotten back with the laptop. Another Redditor named IvyLeaf33 collected some of the more informative comments on Nexpo's video. There's a bunch that you can see on r slash that evil farming game, but I want to focus on the ones that have what I think are the most promising leads. One of the leads pertains to the word Ash in the edgy website that was mentioned in the older Reddit posts. Okay, might be a stretch, but in 2008 to 2011, there was a shock site that was popular in my region, Balkans, that had a URL like Ash and Remains or Ash and Remains. It hosted metal songs, if I recall, and had shock videos of murders with metal music in the background. It was hosted with a Swedish or Russian domain, I think, and it wasn't a .com domain. It also had an abundance of ads. But lining up with the Reddit posts, it did have downloadable games which were indie developments. I remember playing a really cool monster truck game and a Mortal Kombat fan game. Hope this helps. Edit. A friend of mine told me that it's most likely Ash and Bones. The name Ash and Bones to me seems to trigger some kind of vague memory, but I don't really recall it clearly, and nobody on Reddit has been able to find either this website or an archive of it. A few other commenters pointed to it potentially being on a disc that was included with a gaming magazine. This was a really common practice at the time, and I used to love getting those discs in the mail. One commenter suggested that they played this game on a disc they got from PC Gamer. Another commenter suggested that they were from Austria and played this game from a German magazine. As a result, a number of Redditors are currently pouring through German game magazines and PC magazines of the time. There was even a user, Aaron2005X, who had a gigantic archive of German demo discs. Another Redditor named Zeri discovered a complete online archive of a German computer magazine, Computer Build. People are currently looking through these archives, but as of now, no one has found the game in them. Finally, literally as I was about to go record this video, there was another new post by a Redditor named S Reject. He had a different account of this game that raises a few questions. Full disclosure, Nexpo's video brought me here. Make of it what you will. I have been searching for a game since at least 2010 that aligns near perfectly with the details given in previous posts. The consistent details. The game was created no later than 2004. I had it on a laptop prior to getting my first tower in Christmas of 2004. The game came from an shady free game website. Sorry, I don't remember the site. Ash doesn't strike a nerve. The game is isometric 2D top-down, Zelda A Link to the Past style player view. There's a cutscene upon starting a new game in which you murder a woman. There's a cutscene at the start of each day that progressively explains the backstory. I don't remember much about it other than a sour relationship. You spend the gameplay moving the corpse between field plots while avoiding police coming into contact with it. Details that have not been mentioned in relation to the game I'm searching for. The game had Reap in the title, Reaped, The Reaping, Reap What You Sow, something along those lines. Images are low quality pixel art, something you might see created in MS Paint. Cutscenes are single spread textless comic slash storyboard style images. The layout is a farmhouse slash barn on the left, 2x2 two two of square garden plots in the center, and a road on the right. The screen doesn't scroll. Farming is not the mechanic on display within the game. You use the corpse to fertilize crops in an attempt to decompose the body. If you under or over fertilize a plot, the plants will die and the plot becomes useless. Cops will come at random times to search the fields. You must shoo them away from the field with the corpse. Likewise, you must not be holding the body if a cop stops to talk to you. As days progress, more cops come. The win condition is to fully decompose the body. Details that conflict with other testimonials. There is no fishing minigame. Outside of a start screen and cutscenes, the only other screen was the layout explained above. The focus was not on managing crops. It was a story device towards decomposing the body. There was planting and harvesting, but you didn't gain directly from it. The game had little to no text outside of the start screen that I recall, so it would be hard to deduce bad translations. 
And there's a few things we have to consider here. For starters, he said Reap, which immediately makes you think back to that game Reap and Sow. But once again, that conflicts with the game he's describing, and when people showed him Reap and Sow, he said, no, that's not the game I remember. That being said, if this game does exist, I'd be willing to bet money that the title does in fact include the word Reap. It's the perfect word to describe a game that combines farming and murder. A farmer reaps crops, but the personification of death is the Grim Reaper. It's incredible wordplay, you'd be stupid not to have the word in your title. And the contradicting elements of the story that he pointed out also make me think back to a theory that a few other posters had. Perhaps there's either two versions of the game, or people are conflating two different games. Although the original posts claimed that this was definitely not a browser game, a number of people said that they swear they played this on either Newgrounds or Congregate. It wouldn't be completely unheard of for a Flash game to be made and then a more fleshed out, fully developed version to come out. But as of now, this is all the information we have about this game, and as the story develops, I'll keep you updated. This video is sponsored by Raycon. I've had my Raycon earbuds for a few years now, and I still use them all the time to listen to music or podcasts while traveling or working out. Amazing quality whether you want to pump up or wind down. With the holiday season approaching, they'd be great for anyone on your list, and they start at half the price of other premium audio brands. And Raycons are available in five stylish colors, so you can pick the perfect color for everyone you're shopping for. And with free shipping and returns, gifting is easier than ever. Just click the link in the description box, or go to buyraycon.com slash wang and use code HOLIDAY for 15% off your order. The evil farming game has been found. Was the subject line of a lot of emails, direct messages, and comments that I received. Is it true? Short answer, I don't think so. Long answer, mm, kind of, but not really. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, I recommend that you check out my first video on the evil farming game. But in short, there was an old video game similar to Harvest Moon that people remember. But this one involved killing your wife and hiding her body from the police while you go about your day farming. So for today's episode of Tales from the Internet, let's take a look at the game that people thought was the evil farming game, as well as how it was found and the ramifications of this discovery. A thing that I've noticed sometimes about these lost media searches is that what happens a lot is they'll run out of steam and then all of a sudden someone will come to the community brand new and they'll just inject the community full momentum once again. In the case of the evil farming game, it was a redditor named Simone Brune, username PlumpDev, who just knew that she played this game before and had to get involved in the search. It begins with a post she made on May 1st to r slash that evil farming game. I downloaded and played this game sometime between 2014 and 2016. So, I've played this game, and it frustrates me to no avail that I can't find the site I downloaded it from. Around 2015, I only had a shitty little laptop that, at best, could play Binding of Isaac Rebirth. So I would download games from a few free PC game sites. This is where I downloaded this game. The site was not hidden or obscure in any way. It would be the top results for either freeware games, free PC games, or abandonware games. These were the three search terms I'd use to find games. One of the sites I am 80% sure I used is FreePCGamers.com. A site I might have used is this, FreeGamesDL.net. The site I actually downloaded the game from looked more similar to the latest site, but it was much, much more simple. Mostly white with no banners or the like. Every category would be listed on the left side, and the content would be listed as separate blog posts on the right. The site was not a piracy site. It was a site offering legally free games. It is not Moirai. Moirai was released after I had played that game by quite a lot of time. I was trying to become an indie game dev at the time and basically lived on Twitter. I remember when Moirai came out and all the buzz it created among game journalists who report on indie games. For the game itself, I remember very little. I remember that the game had barely any instructions and that I didn't really get it. It was not an advanced game. I know people compare it to Harvest Moon, but that is giving the game way too much credit. It was a very simple pixel game with weird graphics that would invert in color and make staticky sounds. The one thing I remember quite clearly is that the fishing portion was in 2D perspective, 
like side scroller view or one third view, as in very close to side view. I don't have anything to add to the gameplay that has not already been said, however, what I remember vividly is the site I downloaded it from, which is what I wanted to share. For six hours, I've been searching for the site I used, and even searching through sites that look similar enough, but to my frustration, I have not found it. She would go on to create mockups of what she remembered. She made one of the fishing side game, and she made one of the site she found the game on noting that it was a simple blog format with direct downloads to the games. And she also posted pixel art of a farmer that was similar to what she remembered. She also mentioned that at some point you pulled up a crappy pixelated foot that belonged to the dead wife. There was a top-down perspective when you went hiding her, and there was also a barn that you could hide her in. Simone would spend 14 hours the next day trying to figure out what site she got it from. This included not just regular Google searches and things like that, but also checking sites like SiteLike.org, which would give you sites that aren't normally listed on Google. She would then take these sites and go to the Internet Archive and see how these sites would have looked around the time she found the game. But she couldn't find the site, so she decided to take on a more brute force approach, entailing simply going through tons and tons of different online games. One by one, she went through games on sites like DarkHorrorGames.com. Every single horror game that was on Game Jolt up to 2017, as well as doing similar searches on itch.io and Newgrounds. She recalled that in my original video, someone in the comments section had mentioned a game called Ashes to Ashes. And although there was a game on Moby Games with that title, it was a shooter that would definitely not be it. There was a game that turned up called And You Will Be Fit For More Than Ashes that caught her attention, but that didn't seem to be it either. Since a lot of people claimed that they'd seen Markiplier play this game at some point, she went through his whole back catalog to no avail, as well as John Wolfe, who mainly plays horror games. She had already put in an absurd amount of hours into this search, noting that she had no day job and nothing but free time to look for this game. And on that note, a couple days later, she would make another similar posts with more websites and more games, including Reap What You Sow, which did come up in the initial search. And she noted that this particular game is similar enough to some people's description of it that it's very likely that a lot of different people are remembering different games and kind of combining them into this one farming game blob. And the more the search goes on, the more I think that this is probably true. At this point, she had also gone back to Markiplier and John Wolfe's catalogs, looking from their very first videos up to videos three years ago, and then going and doing the same with Jacksepticeye. The only game that even briefly gave her pause, though, was one game that Jacksepticeye played in 2013, a game entitled My Only. It's a pixel art game where you kill your wife at the beginning, but that's pretty much where the similarities end. She also took notice of the thumbnail of a game called Don't Escape. Although this is not the game, she said that the thumbnail reminded her of the thumbnail from this game. Although she noted that her memory of this might not be perfect, so don't think the Evil Farming Games thumbnail looked exactly like this, but rather it just kind of triggered a memory in her, so she put it there in case it does in someone else. At this point, I can only imagine the sheer mass of indie games throughout the years that she was exposed to in this search, and she commented on that at the end of this second research post. As a final note, during my search, I found many games that are lost to time. Games that only have a mention and a screenshot to it, with the dev long moved on and no current social media. But personally, I find the journey fascinating. I get to see games I have not seen in 15 years, and get to look at games I've never seen before, and that might be gone in a few years. Even if I don't find the game I am looking for, I appreciate the experience. But it was her next post that would be the most consequential. The post that would bring a flood of messages to my inbox saying that the mystery had been solved. May 10th, 2021. I found it. It's called The Red Sun Sets Over the Fields of Grain. It's an app game. It was removed from the App Store at one point for violating their respective terms of service. That is why it was so hard to find and why so few have played it. For over a week, I've spent 14 hours every day searching for it, but I finally found it. I am a very tired woman, but a happy one. So let's take a look at this game. Aesthetically, it does appear to be a lot like what people describe. A pixel art farm game that involves murder. And then after the murder happens, you try and maintain your little farm like everything's still kosher. As the developers described this game, it was intended to be a commentary on simple, mindless phone games. 
Life on the farm is not as simple as it once was. You return home one day and are provoked into committing murder. Life appears to carry on as normal after the killing, but is everything truly alright? Can you forget your deep-seated guilt by planting crops and buying power-ups? Can you ignore the glaring reminders of your past? This seemingly simple and fun iPhone game raises questions about complacency and mindlessness in smartphone video game culture. Rather than simply tap away and watch the gold coins increase, the Red Sun Sets pushes its users to carry the burden of the main character, establishing a strong link between the player and the character that the player controls. Made in 36 hours at Carl Hacks 2015, Carlton College. The game itself, as was mentioned in Simone's post, could not actually be downloaded and played. At least not from the App Store for violating a litany of Apple's rules. Rules that were partially cataloged by the developer. Unfortunately, this app violates several of Apple's app approval guidelines, such as, and these are direct quotes, If your app is plain creepy, it may not be accepted. If your app was cobbled together in a few days, it likely will not be accepted. We will reject apps for any content or behavior that we believe is over the line. What line, you ask? Well, as a Supreme Court justice once said, I'll know it when I see it. And we think that you will also know it when you cross it. Apps portraying realistic images of people or animals being killed or maimed, shot, stabbed, tortured, or injured will be rejected. Apps that present excessively objectionable or crude content will be rejected. Apps that are primarily designed to upset or disgust users will be rejected. Thus, the app will never make it onto the App Store in its current state. And this is something worth noting here because although it might seem at first that the app was taken down from the store so only a small amount of people played it, it's more likely that this app was never on the App Store to begin with. Meaning that the only people who would have ever played it are people close to the developer or somehow involved in this school. And if you want to play it, the developer uploaded the files and the instructions on how to recompile it and play it on your iPhone. Honestly though, it's a bit above my head and I couldn't do it. And a few people in the comments tried to as well but couldn't seem to do it. And one user, Shotuni, noted that the code was so old that they would have had to download another program to transfer it over and then be able to play it and that process just didn't seem to be working out. However, another user, Stardews, pulled the game's image assets and uploaded them to an imager gallery. And these images reveal the story of the game. Apparently, it begins when you walk in and find your wife cheating on you. The guy sits up on the bed and looks at you and you kill him. Nothing crazy, but pretty graphic for this kind of pixel art game. Also in the art files, for some reason, a spaceship? And also a painting of a guy who kind of looks like me. Creepy. That being said, there's also a few things that don't quite match up to me. Gameplay-wise, it doesn't seem to resemble Harvest Moon at all, outside of it being a farming game. The menus and whatnot remind me a bit more of like a lemonade stand type thing. It appears to me that you allocate your resources a certain way and then you just let them do what they're gonna do. And once again, as I said before, it's very unlikely that this game was ever actually on the App Store or played by anybody outside of the developer's circle. But that being said, it is kind of strange how strikingly similar this game is to what was described. Some people thought maybe even that the developer made this game as a response to the search for the game, but it was actually made before Sparta 213 ever made his first post. Sparta 213, of course, being the first person to post that he was looking for this game, and who would a day later come to this thread to respond. It breaks my heart to say, that this isn't what I remember, and I've never owned an iPhone. That being said, this is the absolute closest thing that anyone has found, and there is a very real chance that this could be it, and that I have false or unintentionally fabricated memories. I am shocked at how similar the two really are. Very, very good investigative skills. You found something that, to my knowledge, nobody else has after years of searching, and that, in and of itself, is a feat that I was beginning to think was impossible. Many kudos to you. And after Sparta responded, Simone updated her post saying that she might have jumped the gun. Edit, I think there are multiple games that people confuse for the EFG. I'm not done searching. Edit, edit. I got too excited yesterday, and declared this game as THE game too soon. I had just taken my sleeping aid and was about to fall asleep while doing some last-minute research on my phone before bed when I found the game. 
got a bit too excited, didn't think about the title too much, I apologize. I should have clarified that through my research, I've come to the conclusion that we're not looking for one singular game, but multiple. People's descriptions vary sometimes drastically and contradict one another. For example, in Sparta's later clarifications in AMA, he states that the game he played was focused primarily on farming and was very story heavy and had a village and villagers. Basically, it was a long play RPG farming game. But the game I remember, and many others remember, was a vaporware style arcade game where you try to hide the body and avoid the police in a more Looney Tunes style gameplay, with little to no text or additional characters. Basically a short play arcade game. These things cannot be true at once. Or at least, not within reasonable doubt. I don't think the search is over, but... We have found a corner piece to the puzzle, and can now start mapping out a frame of EFG games. And I think the multiple evil farming games theory is most likely true. There's probably one very specific game that Sparta is remembering, and that some of the people who also remember it are remembering, but it's very possible that a lot of people who think they remember Sparta's game are remembering a different game, or one of many other games. Because you have to think, when the original Harvest Moon came out for SNES, it was notable for the fact that it was an RPG with no violence. I mean, in any other game that resembled it at the time, basically the object was, you know, you hit things until they die, and you do that until you get stronger so you can make things die better. Surely there were a lot of indie devs that had that thought and made a project. So it's basically a certainty that there were many Evil Harvest Moon type games that existed. In any case, Simone would continue this search over the next few days, searching things like developer forums, school projects, abandonware sites, ROM hack sites, fan sites, obscure game reviews, and listing games of note she come across such as Dear Red, Wishbone, and a Harvest Moon parody called Darkest Moon. Ultimately though, at this point Simone had been putting several 14 hour days into this search. And although she kept on finding more and more interesting little things, she wasn't finding the thing. And at this point she was gearing up for university to start, so the search had to come to a close. But there's still one more lead left for her to look into. And I wish I could see the look on your face when I say this. There's a hard drive. There's always a hard drive. The hard drive on her shitty old laptop that she had mentioned at the very beginning. She still has it, however, it needs one part to work once again. A replacement USB SATA bridge. As of me making this video, she has found the part that she needs and has ordered it from eBay. However, as she's noted, because she lives in Sweden and has ordered it from the US, it may take as long as two months for it to actually get to her. And when it does get to her, there's no guarantee that this was the only thing wrong with the drive. But if it does work, and that game is still on the hard drive, this mystery could very well be solved. And if that game is on there, it'll be really interesting to see whether or not it matches up with the original game Sparta 213 remembered, or for that matter, any of the other people who came around at the time since and thought they remembered this game. I think it's extremely likely that if she does have this game on her hard drive, some people are gonna be like, yeah, that is the game, and some people are still gonna be looking for a different game. And when this does happen, I will keep you updated. But that's all for now. Thank you to Simone for putting such a ridiculous amount of time and work into this search. The evil farming game has been found. No, for real this time, no fake out. But there is a catch. You see, as it turns out, the evil farming game wasn't actually a game after all. Rather, this was a very specific piece of content that Sparta 213, the original poster, was remembering. And after this piece of content was found, he did confirm that this is it. I can already hear the rattling of the torches and the pitchforks. As always though, if you have no idea what I'm talking about, I recommend you watch my first videos on this topic. But to summarize, people remember there being a game like Harvest Moon, except instead of merely tending to your crops, you killed your wife and hide her body from the police. All the while still maintaining your farm. The search has been going on for several years, and that brings us to today. It's only been two days since the release of my last update video on the Evil Farming game. And it's been about a year and a half since I made my first video on the topic, and since then the channel has grown significantly, bringing a lot more eyes to the search this time. 
And sure enough, this lost media winning streak we've been on on this channel continues. This time, it was a viewer named Aqueous Snake. After having watched this last video, Aqueous Snake remembered something. On June 6, 2015, Vinesauce Joel, Varg Skeletor, streamed a game called Global Defense Force. At some point during the stream, Joel is talking about games his friends used to rent, one of which being the Nintendo 64 game Body Harvest. He remarked that the game was great, but the name was weird. He says it makes him think of Body Harvest Moon, like if there was a Harvest Moon game with corpses. So he starts to riff on this idea of Body Harvest Moon. Harvest Moon, it's just regular Harvest Moon with your wife, and midway in the game you have an argument with your wife, and you accidentally kill her with like a... like a... I, I don't know, like a... A saw blade? No, no, fuck it. You, you kill her with like a, a, a barbecue uh, kebab uh, rack. Like a, you impale her accidentally and you're like, oh shit, I didn't mean that. And at the same time as you gotta like, you know, rescue, uh, not rescue, uh, you gotta manage your farm, you know, raise your chickens and milk the cows. You also gotta like uh, hide the body from the cops sometimes, from health security checks. And, uh, yeah. This bit from the stream would then get clipped by a YouTuber named Tuskull, who would create an animation over Joel's narration, dramatizing what the game might look like. This stream occurred one year before the original post made by Sparta213 looking for the farming game. Aquia Snake would then post this animation to the farming game Discord. With Joel's clip being so similar to what was being looked for, it quickly made an impact. Simone Brune, who you'll remember from the last video, made a post to the subreddit about the animation, saying that she's sure she's heard this clip before. She realized that she had come across it around the time that Sparta made his first post in 2016. Someone else who was looking for the game had posted it to Twitter. And whatever game it was that Simone has on that broken hard drive, she believes she found around the time she was looking for the game back then. At the time, she had mostly stuck to small circles on Twitter and was kind of disconnected from the Reddit search. She believed that people were looking for a Vinesauce fan game based on this concept. Based on the Vinesauce fan game theory, user PM Me Your Ears made a post in the Vinesauce subreddit checking if there's any knowledge of such a thing in their community. The only response came from a user named Crush3000 who suggested that perhaps people had heard this clip and it implanted the memory of the game in people. After all, memory could be funny like that. And this was a theory that PM Me Your Ears had already been considering, having made a post in the Evil Farming Game subreddit about it. And this was a theory that was further evidenced when user Kylo Riley was looking through the AMA that Sparta had done last year. In the thread, he was talking to someone about sleep issues he'd been having. Sparta 213. I didn't really have dreams on the medication, so I don't know. It could have been a standout. The insomnia is gone now that I stopped taking the medication. Kind of nutty if you ask me. Flame the Hedgehog. Well, glad to hear that you're getting better now. This has all been such a strange event, so I wouldn't be surprised if it was one outlier half-dream while watching Vine Sauce. Who knows? It could have been a Terminal 7 Dream Cancer. Sparta. Nothing could be ruled out. Additionally, PME Your Ears had dug up another old message in the farming game Discord, posted by user Zella, all the way back in March of 2020. Zella had sent Sparta a message and received the response, Thanks for reaching out, man. Sorry for the late response. I honestly have no more information than that already presented. I've just chalked it up to being dreamed up by me in a half-awake, half-asleep state while watching a live stream. The stream in particular would have been a vine saw stream, if you really want to scour, but that's hours upon hours of footage. And Zella had posted that interaction with the caption, Time to start searching for Vinesaw streams from early 2016. Which I guess would have been just a little bit too late. Deprachan, the mod of the Discord, immediately sent a message to Sparta to see if any of this information jogs anything, but Sparta wasn't responding. So at this point, the members of the Discord server are searching through any Vinesaw they can possibly get their hands on looking for anything that might possibly resemble the game, not ruling out the theory that maybe someone did make a Vine Sauce fan game based on this riff. So they're looking through old streams, old fan art, talking to people on the Vine Sauce Discord channel, but it doesn't seem to be turning up much of anything. 
And then finally, in the afternoon of June 14th, a few hours before I'm recording this video, Sparta responds. So guys, I just got around to looking at the Vine Sauce animated video that someone found, and as anticlimactic as it may be, I believe that this is likely the source of the game. It fits everything exactly. And I used to fall asleep all the time watching Vine Sauce videos. I can't help but think back all the way to that original thread that Sparta made and that one person in the comment section, Mikori, who had suggested that perhaps it was all just a dream. I mean, granted, they also thought that this dream might have been tied to some deep-seated guilt that Sparta had in his life. And, you know, not just falling asleep watching Vine Sauce. But still, that was one of the first people that was on the right track. So now, with the original farming game mystery solved, Sparta's original game that he was looking for turning out to not be a game at all, but a Vine Sauce stream, where does that leave us? There still are some other games that this reminded people of. Simone has something on her hard drive. And something that really stands out to me, thinking about all the memories that this story triggered in other people, something that came up a lot was the fishing minigame. A lot of people seem to remember a fishing minigame in this, yet Joel's stream had no mention of fishing anything. So even though the fishing thing had nothing to do with what Sparta was thinking of, some people remembered a game like this that had fishing. As I said in the previous video, there probably are a lot of different things that people are remembering because of this. And additionally, there is a fan-made game in the works. The evil farming game Replanted, made by Jeremy of Whistleblower Studios. It's currently slated for an October 2021 release. Anyway, thanks to everyone who was involved in this search and helped bring it to an end, although it's really anticlimactic for this to have turned out to not be an actual game and to have just been something that that Joel Vinesaw said as an offhand joke, it feels good to have some kind of resolution to one of the channel's long-standing mysteries. We're really on a winning streak with these lost media stories, and I feel like a big part of that is just how big the channel has grown. Since the first time I covered the farming game, the channel has almost doubled in subscribers. And ultimately, the big break in the case wound up just being to bring it up one more time and have the one guy, Aqueous Stake, think, hey, wait a second, I remember this. 1993 was a big year for Charles Barkley. It was during this year that his record-breaking performance as a member of the Phoenix Suns earned him the NBA's MVP award. He had quickly become one of the sport's biggest stars, a household name, frequently in the media and appearing in countless commercials. It was later on in 1993, at the peak of his fame, that the game developer Accolade would release a game bearing his name. Barkley, Shut Up and Jam. The game focused on two-on-two -on -two games of no holds barred anything goes street basketball, and it featured Charles Barkley along with a cast of fictional characters. However, Barkley's fame would not be enough to carry the game. It received mostly lukewarm reviews, and ultimately the game would more or less be forgotten about, completely overshadowed by NBA Jam, which by basically every measure was a superior game. A sequel to Shut Up and Jam would come out in 1995, and ultimately it would receive a similar reception. But that's not where the Barkley Shut Up and Jam story ends. In fact, it's barely where the story begins. It was 15 years later, in 2008, that the game would receive an unlikely resurrection. Not as a basketball game, but as a fan-made JRPG-styled adventure. Barkley Shut Up and Jam Gaiden. A game that thrusts the player into the world of post-cyberpocalyptic Neo-New York City. A world in which basketball is illegal. This game would go on to completely eclipse the original Barkley Shut Up and Jam games and become one of the most popular fan-made games of all time. This is the story of that game, and its ill-fated sequel. Barkley Shut Up and Jam Gaiden is one of the most absurd games to have ever existed in both concept and execution, yet it somehow managed to be an incredibly enjoyable experience. How is it that such a game can even come to exist? To answer this question, we should take a trip back to 2006. 
It's a story of a small indie development company called Tales of Games, with a deliberately awkward apostrophe S possessive games. Like the tale belongs to the game. The company was formed by four users of the game development centered Salt World forums Bort, Jeezy, Drool, and Chef Boyardee. Also known as C Boyardee, and yeah, I'm talking about that C Boyardee, but we'll get back to that later. The birth of Barkley's Shut Up and Jam Gaiden begins with a seemingly innocuous passage on Michael Jordan's Wikipedia entry. At the time, the section in his article about Space Jam mentions that there's debate among fans whether or not the movie is canon. But the way the passage was worded, it made it seem as if it could be referring to the canon not of Looney Tunes, but of Michael Jordan's actual life. And it was that thought that opened up the brain holes that would plant the seeds of Barkley's Shut Up and Jam Gaiden. And this is a thought that's referenced at the very beginning of the game when it says, The game you are about to play is canon. And on January 21st of 2007, a trailer of the early game build made an RPG maker was posted online and began to gain some attention. If only just for the absurdity of there being a JRPG based on a dystopian future where basketball is illegal. Over the course of the next year, the game would be moved from RPG maker to game maker, which the developers found just had a lot more flexibility to it. A flexibility that they would take full advantage of. And it was on January 1st of 2008, a full year after the original trailer was posted, that Barkley's Shut Up and Jam Gaiden was released. The Great Beeble Purge of 2041, a day so painful to some that is referred to only as the Beeble Knocked. Thousands upon thousands of the world's greatest bowlers were massacred in a swath of violence and sports bigotry as the game was outlawed worldwide. The reason? The Chaos Dunk, a jam so powerful its mere existence threatens the balance of chaos and order. Among the few ballers and fans that survived the basketball genocide was Charles Barkley, the man capable of performing the verboten jam. Flash forward 12 years to the post-cyber apocalyptic ruins of Neo New York 2053, a chaos dunk rocks the island of Manhattan, killing 15 million. When the fingers put on the aging Charles Barkley, he must evade the capture of the b-ball removal department, led by former friend and bowler Michael Jordan, and disappear into the dangerous underground of the post cyberpocalypse to clear his name and find out the mysterious truth behind the chaos dunk. Joined by allies along the way, including his son Hoops, Barkley must face the dangers of a life he thought he gave up a long time ago and discover the secrets behind the terrorist organization Blood Moses. A tale of Zobbers, B-Balls, and Atonement, brave dangers I've heard of, face spectacular challenge that even the greatest bowlers could not overcome and maybe, just maybe, redeem basketball once and for all in Tales of Game Studios presents Chef Boyardee's Barkley Shut Up and Jam Guide in Chapter 1 of the Hoops Barkley Saga. Many people expressed disbelief that this game was actually completed, and that's a very reasonable reaction. The idea of a futuristic cyberpunk JRPG based on a forgettable Charles Barkley video game from 1993 seems like one of those, hey, wouldn't this be funny ideas that comes up at the bar, and everybody has a good chuckle, and then they move on with their lives and forget about it. Rarely do these kinds of ideas ever come to fruition, but sure enough, there it was. And it turned out to be so much more than just a funny idea turned into reality. Real care was put into making this an actual good video game. I personally went into the game with the expectation that maybe there'd be an hour or so worth of actual content before the developers get tired of the idea and the whole thing falls apart, which is so often the case with RPG Maker games. But Barkley's Shut Up and Jam Gaiden wound up being a pretty substantial, fully fleshed out experience with a story that, despite its absolute ridiculousness, managed to get me invested in what would actually happen. It managed to walk this tricky line of telling a compelling story while at the same time mocking a number of genre tropes. And the combat system itself was a breath of fresh air. Every single playable character in the game has their own unique combat system that keeps the game from getting repetitive as turn-based RPGs tend to do. So despite the fact that every single thing that made this game what it was could have worked against it, 
It was actually a very high quality game and people took notice of that. Over the next few years, the game would consistently receive praise from both fans and the gaming media alike. And during this period of time, Chef Boyardee, one of the key writers behind the game, would become somewhat of an internet legend in his own right. After the release of the game, he created a YouTube channel where he would post satirical rants and wacky animations. The most famous of which being his three-part Dilbert series which bore a striking resemblance to Famicom's Bart the General series. In a way, Chef's Dilbert series was very similar to Barkley in that he took these well-established pop cultural figures and put them in a surreal narrative that's completely incongruous with their established canon, yet at the same time, still manages to tell a compelling story that worms its way into your subconscious. It was clearly a type of storytelling that this man had a particular talent for. And in November of 2012, it appeared that these talents would be put to use once again when Barkley 2 was announced. Warning, the announcement you are about to read is canon. Tales of Games Studios is excited to announce The Magical Realms of Tirnanog, Escape from Necron 7, Revenge of Kukuline, the official game of the movie, Chapter 2 of the Hoops Barkley Saga. The sequel to the 2008 edutainment tour de force, Barkley's Shut Up and Jam Gaiden. Barkley 2 is an action RPG that continues the story of the previous game and features an open, non-linear world for the players to explore and discover. Barkley 2 pits the player as X114 Jam 9, an amnesiac bowler with no recollection of his past and no concept of his incredible b-ball destiny. Only the arcane wisdom of the otherworldly slam scholar Cyber Dwarf can reclaim his lost memories and lost b-ball powers. But first, X114 Jam 9 must evade the sinister grasp of the malevolent AI Kukuline, his would-be captor and the ancient nemesis of all ballers, hoopsters, slammers, and jammers. The ball is in your court. The fate of the galaxy, the post-cyberpocalypse, and all of b-balldom is in your hands. Do you have the courage, vigor, and sagacity to slam with the best? Or are you just going to jam with the rest? Stay tuned because we'll be running a Barkley 2 Kickstarter campaign later this month. In the meantime, check out our Twitter account of at Tales of Games for updates or contact us for further information at contact at talesofgames.com. But be careful, the post-cyberpocalypse is coming. Semper Game. And a little while after that Kickstarter would launch. Mystical greetings. I'm Eric C. Boyardee Shoemaker, one of the lead guys behind Tales of Games Studios, the indie game development company working on Barkley 2. Barkley 2 is the second chapter of the Hoops Barkley saga, and it's a direct continuation of the story from Barkley Shut Up and Jam Guide in the previous game. Uh, it tells the story of X114 Jam 9, a wayward amnesiac baller searching the post cyberpocalyptic wasteland in search of the Cyber Dwarf, the, the only one who can reveal to him the mysterious truth about his past and his glorious b-ball destiny. And it might seem a little strange that a weird indie fan game like this would even need a Kickstarter, but they had a much bigger vision for this title. We're doing a lot of really new and interesting things with the mechanics. Barkley 2, as you can see from the video, is an action RPG. And we have a lot of really, really cool and crazy ideas for this game that we really want to explore. Uh, this is a game that focuses on exploration, uh, discovering secrets, uh, getting lost in a, a giant world, and it, it's, it's a game that we want to make as fun to play as it is funny. Things change over time. People, places, and quests change over time. The things you experience might be completely different from what your friends experienced because you did them at different times. The official big idea behind Barkley 2 is that everyone will have a different game. Things changing over time is the backbone of this idea. Large open world. The Necron 7 is a large open environment with dozens of areas to explore. There are things to find in every corner and secrets everywhere. This is a game all about exploration, edutainment, fast-paced action RPG combat. Barkley 2 has mouse-aimed shooting gameplay that takes inspiration from action games like Crimson Land and Soldat, but also RPGs like Dark Souls and Gothic. Stats, classes, and an incredibly deep character creation system give you complete control over your character. We want to make Barkley 2 a game that is not only funny, but fun to play. 
Randomized Gun System Guns are randomized through a complex system similar to Diablo's or Borderlands, offering millions of possibilities. Shotguns that shoot ooze, machine gun rocket launchers, and gravity rifles are just the tip of the iceberg of our gun system. Even more than this, you can fuse guns together in a system similar to demon fusing from the Shin Megami Tensei and Persona series. The weapon combinations are nearly unlimited. Dwarfnet Connect with fellow dwarfs and dwarf enthusiasts on the in-game Dwarfnet message board. Jack your cranial USB into the data matrix and search for clues or chat with tech-savvy dwarfs about vidcons, layups, and the latest jock news through the amazing power of bio-cybernetic technology. Clearly, they wanted to expand the scope of this game by a massive margin compared to the original, and there were some really interesting rewards to help them get to their funding goals, like a cyber dwarf body pillow, or a custom animated gif in the style of Chef Boyardee's Dilbert series, or a chance to impersonate the developers during an interview. And they actually managed to reach their goal very, very quickly. In fact, not only did they reach their goal, they completely smashed it. All in all, the campaign raised $120,355. This was destined to be one hell of a game, and it was slated for a 2013 release. And throughout 2013, after their smashing Kickstarter success, they would provide frequent updates on the game's progress. Their updates would often tell of what specifically was being worked on in the game, provide screenshots, and that August they provided some gameplay footage. Only a few months had passed and it seemed like the game was already very far along in development. But a few more updates went by and a few more months began to pass Then, as the end of 2013 was nearing, it was clear that this game was not coming out quite yet. And finally, in December of 2013, Tales of Games provided a new update. We're pushing the game's release date by a healthy margin. I know. Shocker. When it all boils down though, I think we should blame all of you, the backers. Yeah, that's right, I said it. The reason is we are about where we would have been development-wise if we had made the $35,000 game. But instead, we've spent a little more money and have only about one half of a $100,000 game. Meaning, since our Kickstarter had such great success, we've expanded Barkley 2 in considerably huge ways. I would say the game has tripled in size overall from our original idea, and we are loving how this bad boy is going to turn out. We think the direction that we've locked in on is going to blow some pants off. Not our pants though, we honor our stretch goals. This, however, has brought us to the current concern we're facing in development. Keeping the game this size. We've seen too many times projects pursue grand schemes regarding its scope and depth only to fall short or even completely. We are being very careful to avoid this. By moving methodically, we're making sure what we work on for the game is definitely on the road to what we want to be in the game. It's a tale we've heard so many times and clearly a tale that the Barkley 2 developers were also aware of. A Kickstarter game that's already ambitious at its outset becomes weighed down by more and more ideas and an urge to make everything bigger and better and more massive. More features, a bigger world, more options, more endings, more everything. But Tales of Games were sure that they wouldn't be the ones to fall into this trap. But of course, it wasn't long after this update that they began to fall into a very familiar cycle. The updates would become more and more sparse, the Kickstarter backers would get restless, and then the developers would show up to assure them that the game was still going to happen. So every few months, Tales of Games would return with an update full of screenshots, talk of new features, and a little bit of self-deprecation. Years would pass, and that original 2013 release date would become a distant memory. More and more people were ready to put Barkley on the list of Kickstarter games that never were, but the developers continued to insist that the game was not dead. But finally, after several years of stringing along the backers, in October of 2017, Tales of Games would provide their last update, ironically entitled, Barkley 2, Another Fantastic Week. But don't get me wrong, this wasn't a post indicating that the game was over with or anything like that, it was actually just more of the same. Updates with new features, some new footage, and the announcement that they've added fishing. 
And after this post, radio silence. And as more and more time passed, people began to demand refunds. Did Tales of Games finally throw their hands up in the air and say, fuck it? And what happened to all that footage that had been shown over the years? Clearly something of this game existed. The cycle of giving some kind of update every few months had ended and nobody had heard a damn thing about the game until June 2nd of 2019. It was on this date that word began to emerge from parties inside of Tales of Games that the game was officially dead. This came about when GZ, one of the developers of the original Barkley, took to the Something Awful forums. Chef vanished from the project two and a half years ago. I've tried contacting him multiple times and haven't received a response. Bort left around the same time to be a family man. The Kickstarter was not necessary, especially in hindsight. The majority of work on the game was unpaid. Myself, Bort, and Chef are the original Barkley One creators. I did not join the Kickstarter with them because I was aware of the many problems that could and did arise. I was asked to join the project three years after the Kickstarter when the project had little money and was in shambles. I was committed to trying to finish the game, but it was consistently set back by horrible management, and I ended up quitting. The person who owns Tales of Games and is running it now had nothing to do with Barkley 1 and has zero game dev experience. He is the TOG PR guy. When I quit, Lazarul also quit. We were the only two remaining who understood the technical inner workings of this game. Laz worked on this project nearly from the start, pro bono, and was tired of the nonsense as well. There is no incentive for TOG or anyone attached to the Kickstarter to talk about this debacle. What were the management problems? An entire book could be written on the problems this game had. To name a choice few, there was a revolving door of workers on the game. Many were lured in with percentages. You can only promise so many points. One of the reasons I quit is because I could not see this circle being squared. Divide and Conquer The team was split and there were 50 back channels where everyone had their own way of understanding the game. Goldfish Attention Span A large amount of work was only done at most halfway, then abandoned to work on some other cool thing. Unwillingness to cut or simplify anything despite not having the manpower and the game dragging on for years on end. Management dictating how work should be done, despite not understanding how it actually works. Leading to needlessly complicated systems, obsolete systems, and totally broken systems. The development of Barkley 2 is extremely complicated and unnecessarily dramatic, so it's very difficult to explain things without walls of text. I'll do my best to keep things short and sweet. Where did the money go then if everyone worked for free? People were paid. The point that I was trying to make in the original post is that the majority of work on this project was done for percentage slash good faith. This could have been done without a Kickstarter. I didn't have direct access to financial info, but from what I gathered in my time on the project, about two thirds of the money went towards wages and the other one third went to other expenses, conventions, etc. I'm assuming the person who is running Tales of Games now has bailed too. Nope. Despite him admitting to me directly the game will die without me working on it, when I finally got tired and said I'll quit unless changes happen, he accepted my resignation and as far as I know, is trying to keep the project alive by finding new hires. And it should be noted that when Chef left this project, he went on to work on another game called Katana Zero. This game actually was completed and was released in April of 2019. After word spread of the collapse of Barkley 2, what remained of Tales of Games was coaxed from hiding. Greetings from established TOG villain BH Room. Besides Barkley 2 dev being 100% dead, everything else you may have seen about the great TOG schism is pretty accurate. I owe everyone a long ride above the B2 saga. In the meantime, how should I address Q's? BHRM would spend some time on Twitter answering people's questions before posting a long write-up to the Kickstarter page. Hello to all justifiably restless backers. I think for this first post, I want to cover what has happened recently and specifically why I haven't updated in so long. First, it's my fault. I consciously avoided updating, even at the requests of other people who worked on the game. The reason more than anything was cowardice. 
but I framed it under a strategic reasoning that once we could start giving good news, then the delay would be much easier to swallow to backers. The good news came few and far between, and I would continue to move the goalposts in response. This was stupid and wrong. I should have been much more transparent with how the game was going, and the trials we were encountering keeping the work going. I am sorry. You all are the reason we started working on this game with such concerted interest in the first place, and cutting you out hoping for a massive turnaround that would wash all the silence under the bridge was foolish to say the least. My hope is that, while this is always going to be too little and too late, I can at least explain what the problems were. Second, this is Liam, BH Room, and I started as the producer and was the one who wrote most of the updates. I am Bort's brother. Bort worked on the first Barkley along with GZ and Chef. Most of you know this. I'm going to avoid a massive chronology for the time being, since I just want to get this out, but I am committed to answering any questions you all may have. As the game continued to age, people left the project for lots of reasons, mostly due to taking jobs or losing interest. Everyone still working picked up slack as the game went on, but this game always needed competent and constant development in order to come out under the lofty pretenses we had established. This was my first game and lots and lots of problems at the beginning were due to my inexperience. I do not think this game was doomed. I do think we needed a big rebuild about midway through though. Until earlier this year, the game languished as we didn't really have a full-time person working on the things that really matter in the game. Combat, mean quest events, bosses. GZ was on the project last year and would work when he could. In those times, we would make progress, but always, in my foolish mind, just short of being enough to update. As I mentioned, this was entirely wrong of me. I would write it off as under the hood work. That wasn't the pop we needed for our big, hey, we are in dead boast. GZ is now gone, and he is the most upset about the state of the game and how we left. I never wanted that to happen, and had always wished that there would be some working solution. That is not the case. I think his points are perfectly valid and his frustration with the game is well warranted. I want to confront those realities moving forward to and make sure that if there is a solution where the game is fully completed and realized, I don't repeat mistakes that might jeopardize relationships I've already damaged or destroyed. Finally, and before this becoming too long for a first post back, I am slowly inching the game forward with the help of a part-time coder named Paperjack. We are both hoping that we can get the game in a better state in the coming months. I will update more about that soon and get feedback on more constructive things like how the game actually is and plays. I'm assuming there will be another few posts for me addressing your questions and concerns and giving more information about what all has happened to get the game in the predicament that it is. I am going to attempt to answer all questions on Twitter and directly to me in KS. Based on those questions, I'll formulate the next update, which I guess will be no more than three days from now? How much B2 is too much B2 in your feeds? Once again, I'm going to work hard to make this right and make this game. So technically, Barkley 2 isn't dead. But after seven years, I kinda have my doubts that we'll ever see it completed, and even if we do, what is the game without the original team behind it? Can Barkley 2 become great without the assistance of the original people who took such an absurd concept and made it legendary? But as of now, it seems like BH Room has kept good on his promise of providing more frequent updates, so I guess we'll see. As a kid, I didn't really go to the movies that often. Most of the movies I watched were on VHS or TV. But every once in a while, I would make a trip to the Ridgewood Theater, its lumpy, sticky floor and a bicycle in front of the screen to see movies like The Lion King or Mortal Kombat. And of course, who could forget? Street Fighter, the movie. The movie sucked, but I liked it. And then that summer, a laundromat by me, the very same laundromat that I played Street Fighter Rainbow Edition, got Street Fighter the movie, the game. That game sucked, and I didn't like it. But one thing that stood out to me at the time was a character named Sawada. It seemed like he was important for some reason, and I even remember an issue of was either GamePro or EGM said something about how Capcom was really excited about this character. Yet for some reason, I didn't remember him in the movie. Well, as it turns out, there's actually a pretty interesting story behind that character. 
So for this episode of Gaming Mysteries, let's take a look at Captain Sawada, the forgotten Street Fighter character. Street Fighter the Movie the Game came out in June of 1995, developed by Incredible Technologies, the same people who brought us Time Killers. Originally this game was planned to be Street Fighter 3. It was going to include a few characters from the original Street Fighter game that didn't make it to Street Fighter 2, as well as Gunlock from Saturday Night Slam Masters and Mega Man. All of this fell to the wayside when Capcom informed Incredible Technologies that they would now be working on Street Fighter the Movie the Game. With its digitized graphics, this game drew obvious comparisons to Mortal Kombat. And now, Street Fighter and Mortal Kombat are two game series that they both have their own strengths and weaknesses. To me, this title felt like they took those strengths of both games, threw them in the garbage, and put together everything that was left. But despite this game being what it is, it gives us some clues as to things that were going on behind the scenes at Capcom at the time. The key to everything, of course, is the character Sawada. As I mentioned in the intro, when I first saw Sawada and read about him in magazines, I saw this guy with no shirt and camel pants, and I was like, I don't remember this guy at all. So I watched it again to look for him, and it turns out that he is there, but barely. He just pops in for a few scenes to say a line or two with a heavy accent with lines that seem dubbed. Colonel, yes? A single boat against everything he's got? The pilot would have to be out of his mind. And the more you think about this, the stranger it is. Why cast someone in such a small, generic role like that if they're struggling to deliver a few simple lines? There's so many hungry actors out there, surely someone else could have done that role. Well actually no, nobody else could have filled this role because it was specifically made for this man. In fact, the character was even named after him, his real name being Kenya Sawada. So here's what happened. When they were doing the auditions for Ryu, the director, Steven D'Souza, decided that Byron Mann was perfect for the role. But then Capcom comes along and they're like, hey. We got this guy, and we really want you to make him Ryu. That guy was Kenya Sawada. Kenya Sawada had actually been working with Capcom and even portrayed Ryu in some of the Japanese commercials. Capcom was hoping to take this actor, Kenya Sawada, and build him up as their own in-house action hero. They wanted to use Street Fighter to launch this man's career, so it was really important that he plays the role of Ryu. But there was a problem. You see, a lot of this movie was written around the playful banter between Ryu and Ken. Banter that was contingent on Ryu being able to speak good English. This was not something Sawada could do, so they are able to come up with a compromise. The role of Sawada was created so Capcom could get their guy in the movie, and Byron Man could stay on as Ryu. Byron Man would later comment in interviews that there was a bit of tension between them on set because of this. And as good of a job as Byron Man did as Ryu, I can't help but think how many magical scenes we would have had if we had gotten Kenya Sawada's English interpretation. There's probably another universe somewhere where there's thousands of white DMDs made based on Sawada's Ryu. And all that being said, there's another component to this story that ties it all back into the games, and that component is Fei Long. You'll notice that in the movie, every Super Street Fighter 2 character is included except for Fei Long. And it had long been rumored that Sawada was originally supposed to be Fei Long, but then they changed it for some reason. One rumor is that they thought the character was too generic. Another was that they thought people would mix him up with Ryu, and I get it, I mean you got too many Asian guys walking around and people get confused. But those theories don't really make that much sense to me. I mean, considering that they had E Honda and Balrog just be chun -Li's camera crew, that clearly, clearly that aren't married to any specific details from the games. What I think is that Capcom, being so invested in this actor, Kenya Sawada, just wanted the name out there to give him a little bit more recognition. I have absolutely no evidence for this, but I wouldn't be surprised if Capcom specifically asked for him to be named that, replacing Fei Long in the process. And when you look at the game, the Fei Long Sawada connection goes even deeper. You see, Fei Long, once again, isn't playable in the game. However, his theme music is present, and that theme music in the game belongs to Sawada.
Wonder why that is. And then in the game, there's a stage called the Dungeon. A stage that bears a really strong resemblance to the pit for Mortal Kombat, and it features in the background two out of four possible characters being detained. E Honda, Kami, Chun-Li, or Fei Long who is portrayed by Kenya Sawada. As it's commonly told, Fei Long was supposed to be playable in this game. And he had his moves performed by Sawada, but they just simply couldn't get the character ready in time for release. As was the case with Blanca, although he did make it to the PlayStation version. But ultimately, we never got to see what there actually was of Fei Long in Street Fighter the movie, and all we got was Sawada, with his attacks that a lot of people think are a sword, but actually it's just a graphical glitch that looks like a sword. Well, you may not be surprised to hear that Kenya Sawada didn't wind up being Capcom's own personal action hero like they had hoped, but he did go on to work pretty consistently since then, appearing in a variety of martial arts movies up to as recently as 2018. Immediately following Street Fighter the movie, he was in Thunderbolt with Jackie Chan, who he had become good friends with and worked with again in the Shinjuku incident. And you might be surprised to hear that this actually wasn't the last appearance of the Sawada character. He did show up in a few episodes of the American Street Fighter cartoon as an antagonist to Guile. And in some of these appearances, he has a sword, meaning that the animators of this show, like many of the players, also thought that graphic glitch was supposed to be a sword. He would also appear a few years later in a three-issue story arc of the Brazilian Street Fighter comic. And much more recently, Kenya Sawada would reprise his role in the Japan-only PS3 game, Mainichi Isho, in which he gives the character some self-defense lessons. And believe it or not, although he hasn't made any more appearances in any Street Fighter games, the character still is officially recognized by Capcom. He made an appearance on the Shadaloo Combat Research Institute website that Capcom maintained for Street Fighter V. So albeit unlikely, it still is in the realm of possibility that he could show up in another Street Fighter game. If you ask me, the single greatest character in the entire Resident Evil video game series is the one... What? The only... What is it? Barry Burton. Whoa. Not this weird, clean-shaven imposter. I don't know who that is. That's uh, Dave Coulier or some shit. No, I'm talking about the real Barry Burton with the red beard and whatnot. And for years and years and years, hardcore Resident Evil fans were trying to figure out who this actor is, the guy who played the original Barry, and nobody could find him. You beat the game and it just says that his name is Gregory, no last name or anything like that. How are we supposed to figure out who this actor is just by Gregory? There's a million Gregories. But people kept on trying to find this guy for over 20 years and it seemed like we would never find him. But guess what? Gregory has been found and I've got all the information in this video. Resident Evil is one of, if not my number one favorite game of all time, and one of the factors that I think made it so memorable is the acting. I've been thinking something is wrong with this house. Oh my god, it's a monster! That game is famous for its terrible, awkward, yet super charming and quotable voice acting. If you've played this game as much as I have, it probably almost feels like these actors are a part of your life, and yet most of us have no idea who they are. And Capcom really didn't give us much to work with in that regard. You beat the game and it just tells you everybody's first name, that we don't even know for sure if they're real names. In the case of Barry, they only gave us the name Gregory to figure out who he is. And, you know, of course, because of that, people's imaginations go wild. They're wondering, uh, you know, are these people they found in the streets? Are they friends of the developers? Are they porn actors? Who knows? We don't know. People had all kinds of theories about these actors over the course of so many years. They did all kinds of research back in the day on their 56k modems, but it never really seemed to amount to much. It wasn't until more perceptive gamers started to notice that Barry's voice actor was actually in a bunch of other games. As it turns out, this particular actor has loaned his voice to a lot of characters throughout the late 90s and 2000s. And thankfully, some of these games did a much better job of actually crediting him. So as it turned out, Barry Burton in the original Resident Evil game was voiced by a Norwegian translator and actor named Barry... Uh, God, if I have any fucking Norwegian followers on this, they're gonna murder me for how I try to pronounce this guy's name. Barry... Barry, uh, Gjurde, uh, Gjurde, Gjur... 
Uh, one of those has ha one of those has to be close. But yeah, this actor, who's really named Barry, has loaned his voice to a lot of games, including Mega Man X7. How long has this madness been going on? Elibits. Let me tell you a story. And he's also done a bunch of commercials. Motorcycle riding is fun. And look at him. That's Barry, right? That's Barry. It's like a little bit older, but that's Barry, right? We found our guy. That's it. End of the story. Mystery solved, right? Not quite. You see, in an interview that Barry did with Resident Evil Database, he said that he was actually not the guy in the live action scenes. I have never ever been called Gregory, nor have I ever used that name. Possibly Gregory is that live actor's name, or is it just a fabrication? I don't know. I was, and I still am, very surprised to see people writing on internet blogs as if they were experts on myself or other voice actors. There were just so many, many errors and inaccuracies. You would be shocked. So there you go. The voice actor Barry is not Barry in the live action scenes. Barry actually had two different actors and thus the two decades long search for Gregory continues. And that search would continue for a long time until September of 2017 when an internet user going by the name Dr. Raichi discovered the actual Gregory. And after being discovered, Gregory, whose full name is Gregory Smith, went on to do an interview with ResidentEvilDatabase.com in which he shared a lot of inside information from the production of these live sequences. Gregory, who was and still is an Australian school teacher and principal, was actually discovered in the streets by Capcom developers. He so closely resembled the drawings they had made of Barry that they saw him and just knew that they had their guy. Gregory actually did record some dialogue for the game, however the producers didn't like his Australian accent. Can you imagine that? Like, Barry could have been Australian. Hey, nay, you were almost a Jill sandwich, mate. And as it turns out, when they were filming these live-action sequences, they didn't actually tell the actors what they were working on. Gregory had no idea what Resident Evil even was until kids in his town recognized him from the game. He also put to bed the rumor that the people in his picture were his actual family. According to Gregory, they were also actors. So there you have it, a 21 year old gaming mystery finally solved. Jill Valentine, also known as the Master of Unlocking, is one of, if not the most popular character from the entire Resident Evil series. Ever since fans got that first glimpse of her in her Monica Lewinsky hat and those shoulder pads that would make Rue McClanahan tremble with jealousy, they've wanted to know more about the actress behind Jill Valentine who is only credited as Inez. Well, it's been more than 20 years, and she still hasn't been found, but I am going to tell you what we do know. Ever since my video about the actor behind Barry Burton came out, people have been asking me about the other actors from Resident Evil. And by far, the character that I get asked about the most is Jill Valentine. And it, it figures that this character out of all of them, the one that people want to know about the most, has the most confusion around her. The first bit of confusion around who played Jill Valentine revolves around an actress named Una Kavanaugh. The idea that Una Kavanaugh played Jill Valentine in Resident Evil 1 is a factoid that spreads so far around the internet that it fills up every comment section that talks about her. Even my Barry video was full of people saying that Una was the one who played Jill. In fact, a lot of people claim that Una Kavanaugh did both the voiceovers and the live action scenes, and if you put the pictures side to side, you can kinda see a resemblance. Kind of. I don't know if it's 100%. And even if you thought it was 100%, there's still a problem. In 2011, Resident Evil Database contacted Una Kavanaugh to find out if she played Jill Valentine. Hello, Una. There are many rumors about you playing the role of a character called Jill Valentine at the intro of the first Resident Evil game. It is called Biohazard in Japan. Please make it clear for all of us Resident Evil fans. Did you or didn't you play the role of Jill Valentine? Please answer me. A simple yes or no would be enough for me. The doubt has been killing me for years. From Monique. Una responds? No. Doesn't sound very happy that people think it's her that played the part. And because of Una's denial, there's now an idea going around that she was actually voiced by another actress named Una Kavanaugh. Even though there is a little bit of evidence that supports this, I don't think it's true. And I think this idea came from how IMDB works. So you see, you have the actress Una Kavanaugh, who people were crediting Resident Evil to. She has it removed from her IMDB page, but the credit still exists. 
This causes IMDB to split the page off into another Una Kavanaugh, or in this case, it's actually been done where there's three of them. Then people see that, oh, there's another Una Kavanaugh because of this quirk of how IMDB works, and people run away with the idea. The only piece of evidence that I could find supporting the idea of two Una Kavanaugh's is a correspondence with Ward Sexton, who did the game's narration. The owner of Games and Movies blog, Alessandro Conte, contacted Ward Sexton to ask him about a list of possible cast members. Hello Ward, I am a big fan of Resident Evil games and movies. I have a question about the Resident Evil 1996 game. I know that you were a narrator in the game, unfortunately, the actors and actresses who played in the live-action scenes were credited under pseudonyms. On the internet, I found this information that these actors played the characters and also did the voiceover roles. And he gives him the list of actors that he has. Is this list correct, or were the characters played by other people? I want to know the truth, and if you know something about it, please tell me. And Ward Sexton responded, Yes, the list is correct. My good friend Scott, however, passed away on September 27, 2000. Scott referring to the voice actor for Chris Redfield, Scott McCulloch. And although now this is a highly credible source, the narrator for the actual game, it's still possible that he wasn't as close to the Jill actress as he was to the other actors. If that's the case, the name might have escaped him, but then he saw that the other actors' names were correct, so he said, yeah, it's correct. And this theory becomes more likely to me when we see what Barry Yeard, um, I probably pronounced his name wrong again, what the voice actor for Barry Burton had to say about the actress for Jill. On another topic, I remember the actress playing Jill is from Northern Alberta, Canada, and she was asking another Canadian actor if he had attended NAIT, the Northern Alberta Institute of Technology, which is in Edmonton and where she had studied. I do not remember her name, but it was not her first time voice acting. I thought she played her part quite well. So if Barry didn't remember her name, it's also possible that Ward didn't remember her name. There's just a lot of things that don't really quite add up for me here, like how all the other voice actors who've been identified seem to have very prolific careers, yet Jill, who shares an uncommon name with another actress, supposedly, appears to have no other credits, despite Barry saying that this wasn't her first gig. And there are a few other possibilities that people have brought up. Some people believe that she was portrayed by an actress named Leesley, uh, Liesel Wilkerson. I am butchering everybody's name today, sorry if you're watching this. And when she was asked about whether or not she played Jill Valentine, she said that she didn't remember. And I know that sounds totally ridiculous because to us it's like, yo, this is Resident Evil, how could you not remember Resident Evil? But you have to understand, it's a business where you could be working on so many different projects that it all just kind of becomes a blur and you forgot what you did. So since she doesn't remember, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to play a clip of Jill versus her voice and you can decide for yourself. Kenneth was killed too. Maybe by this creature. Here in Hong Kong, you can easily get run over. Watch out! Watch out! I'll put a poll here for you guys to judge, but honestly, I think the only real credible lead we have here was Barry saying where she went to school. Things get even more convoluted when we look specifically at who might have been Inez the live-action Jill Valentine. Obviously, we've already ruled out Una Kavanaugh as the live-action actress because she, the picture people were saying looked like Jill, is the actress who said she wasn't Jill, so that's, it's not her. I think we'd safely say that's not her. Some people think Inez was an actress named Michelle Yerger, who was also in Miss Congeniality and The Princess Diaries. Here's her mugshot. I don't know, I don't, I don't really see it. I don't think she's an ass. There are also people who think that she was portrayed by an actress named Ashley Bashum. Once again, I hope that's the correct pronunciation. Now this one is definitely false, because this actress was born in 1983, meaning that when Resident Evil was shot, she would have been 12 or 13. And another factor that muddies any conversation about Jill Valentine's live actress is Jillia Voth. A lot of you probably already know about this, and it's a pretty easy connection to explain, but Julia Voth is an actress-slash-model who Jill Valentine's design was based off of in the Resident Evil remake. Jill's kept this appearance all the way up until the present day, and Julia Voth has even went so far as to cosplay Jill in real life a few times. So when people ask, oh, who's the real Jill Valentine, they'll say Julia Voth, and they're correct. But Julia Voth is definitely not Inez, as her connections to the game only began on the GameCube. 
So with all that out of the way, what are the concrete facts that we know about Inez? We got a little bit of information from an interview series creator Shinji Mikami did with Biohaze.com. The actress for Jill was only a high school girl at the time, and she had to run around outside in the middle of the night and got mosquito bites. So she made that face. I want to go home. The cheap shot was totally my mistake. I didn't have enough time and money, also I should have picked the actors judging on performances, but it's too late now of course. Yeah, that face that's going on right there, that's not like some deep method acting, that's a legitimate I don't want to be here face. So from this interview we can gather that although she clearly wasn't 12, she was very young and in high school in Japan. I'm also 99% sure that the girl credited as Inez is really named Inez. The reason I say that is that all of the other live actors that have been found had their real first names credited. Barry, who was credited as Gregory, is Gregory Smith. Wesker, who was credited as Eric, is Eric Pirius. Chris, who was credited as Charlie, is Charlie Kroslavsky. And it's from the mouth of Charlie Kroslavsky that we get something that might actually be another lead. In an interview that Charlie did with Raccoon Stars, he had this to say. At the time, I was represented by IMO, Inagawa Motoko office in Tokyo. I am pretty sure that all the actors on that shoot were hired from IMO. I actually also worked for IMO as a casting agent. This agency hired bilingual foreigners to work in the office doing castings, taking talent to auditions and film and TV shoots to act as their manager and translator, as well as being talent ourselves. This is a company that still exists to this day and is one of the leading agencies in Japan for foreigners to come do acting work. It's quite possible that somebody who worked for the company at that time might know. That's not necessarily 100% the case because if you remember from my Barry video, they just found him walking up the street and he looked like the drawing. So what's the deal? Is Inez ever going to be found? I mean, now people have been searching for more than 20 years. And if I'm being totally honest, maybe she doesn't want to be found. Doesn't need to be reminded of sweaty, miserable nights getting eaten alive by mosquitoes in the middle of the woods. Or, you know, approached by random weird dudes who've been in love with her for 20 years. Don't need that. Or maybe not. Maybe she's just walking around out there with no idea at all that she's Jill Valentine. Pokemon can kill you. Don't take my word for it, just listen to this guy. That's Pokemon. Son, I found out that Pokemon means pocket monster. But wh why should they carry these monsters in their pocket. Pokemon World is a world of the demonic. Uh, there was even a couple of reports where children had been stabbed by other children over Pokemon cards. Our kids are going out in gangs on the streets and they're so used to killing each other in their fantasy games and on their video screens and blowing each other away and blowing each other up that when they walk down the streets and they pull out their 45 and they pump some friend full of bullets, they kind of think in the back of their mind, well, they're just going to We'll turn off the machine and they'll get up and they'll be there tomorrow and I'll shoot them again. And now, as crazy as this guy might sound, there actually has been a history of the connection between Pokemon and death. A lot of it is just rooted in creepy pastas, but there actually have been some times where Pokemon actually killed people. And now to help explain the connection between Pokemon and death, I brought in my pal Izzy Nobre. Take it away, Izzy. Have you guys ever heard of the Lavender Town Syndrome? This is how the story goes. Basically back in the 90s, something like a hundred kids committed suicide because of Pokemon, the original Pokemon game, or rather games, there were two of them, Pokemon Blue and Red. The story goes that after the kids got to Lavender Town, the, the, the music that played in the background of the song drove them to commit suicide. And then people came up with all these explanations about binaural beats or whatever else. Now, if you're not sure what Izzy means by binaural beats, there's this idea of a kind of a digital drug. There's a theory that certain combinations of sounds will cause your body to react in a way that's very similar to getting high from drugs. This concept is very closely connected to ASMR, and some people say they can feel it while others say that they can't. They could explain the idea of sounds triggering such an intense physical response in someone that it would cause them to kill themselves, uh, let alone kids. I remember reading about this story some 10 years ago or even more, and the internet being a different place back then, and of course, we were all, I guess, a little bit more naive when you were young. I actually thought that this was a real thing. 
And probably the reason why I thought this is because it wasn't the first time I heard about Pokemon harming kids. Dano Shenji Porygon, the 38th episode of the first season of the TV show, was infamous because upon its airing, a bunch of kids had seizures right in front of the television sets. The show had a bunch of that episode specifically, had a bunch of flashing lights and special effects that just triggered uh, seizures in a bunch of kids who were prone to that, who I, I assume at least a good handful of them had no idea they even had that that condition until the show, well I guess now you know, kid! And that wasn't even the only instance when the Pokemon franchise was connected to kids getting messed up. Back in the late 1990s, Pokemon and Burger King had this partnership where to celebrate the release of the first movie in 1999. Uh, whatever the Happy Meal equivalent at Burger King is, they were giving out Pokemon toys. There were 57 of them, if I'm not mistaken. I actually happened to be in the United States back in that year, and I collected a good chunk of them. Well, the little containers, the little Pokeball containers that came in, were later deemed a choking hazard and in fact at least two kids suffocated to death because of this little pokeball so they had to conduct a recall of all those toys the most expensive by some accounts recall in history so even though we now know that the uh, lavender town syndrome it really didn't happen it's it's kind of easy to see why in a lot of our collective consciousness it was like oh Pokemon is killing kids? Yeah, I, I can see that happen. They, they've, they've done that a couple of times. It says something about how effective the psychological horror of Lavender Town was. We're talking about the original Game Boy. It was an 8-bit monochromatic video game console and still that music was so unnerving. And not just the music, but the whole idea. Like up until Lavender Town, Pokemon is this cheery adventure. You're a little kid and you're uh, off to see the world battling with these little uh, monsters and you're collecting them, you're trading them, you're bumping into other trainers, there's a bit of humor uh, in, the, in the series as well. Then all of a sudden the tone changes completely as you enter a haunted town where this is playing in the background. So it's really, it's unsettling, right? I remember actually being scared having to battle my way through Pokemon Tower. That song really does a number on you. And not only that, but in universe, right? Up until that point when Pokemon uh, are hurt, they just pass out. They faint, you take them to the uh, Poké Center. They are, well, wake, woken up, I can say revived, right? Because technically they're still alive, they're just sleeping. They're fought, they're, they fainted. But then suddenly, you find out that yes, Pokémon death exists in this universe. It makes you think, what happened for these Pokémon to die? If we, I've been fighting with these things for, for hours up until this point, and nothing happened. So, is there something more sinister that goes on in this world? There, there's something else, some other kind of Pokemon battles that are going on that are killing Pokemon, some kind of satanic ritual going on up in this piece? What? Why are they dying all of a sudden? I guess to quote Pokemon itself, that atmosphere was super effective. And that's why to this day, the Lavender Town Syndrome Creepypasta is one of my all-time favorites. Interestingly, and I have no idea whether or not this has any connection to the Lavender Town Syndrome myth or not, but in Pokemon Gold, Silver, and Crystal, the Lavender Town theme song had been changed to be way, way more happier and upbeat. Check it out. Hey, you want to see something really hot? Look at all that juicy pixel thigh meat. Did I just score? <laughs> Alright, it was different times, and you had to make do with whatever you could get. And you couldn't get a peek at that delicious Samus cake, unless you were pretty good at Metroid. You gotta beat the game in under three hours if you want to get a peek at the thigh meat, and if you manage to beat the game in under one hour, you get a little tummy action. And of course, if you can get either of those endings, you get to play as Samus your next playthrough without her suit. But what if you're absolute garbage at Metroid, and no matter what you do, you'll never be able to beat the game in under three hours? Well, I strongly believe in inclusivity, and a world in which even the trashiest of gamers can get a peek at that 8-bit Samus booty. And that's where the Justin Bailey code comes in. Next to the Konami Code and the Mortal Kombat Blood Code, the Justin Bailey Code is probably one of the most famous codes in video game history. All you have to do is go to the Metroid Password screen and enter Justin Bailey in all caps and then nothing but dashes. And then you spawn as Suitless Samus. But who is this Justin Bailey that the code is named after? 
There's a few theories, and most of them are definitely wrong. One of the most popular things that people assumed about the code was that it was just named after someone who worked on the game. That's actually the explanation that I thought was true for most of my life, and it turned out that there's no such person who exists. A second popular theory about Justin Bailey was that it was some kind of slang word that came from England. People would say that a Bailey is a British word for swimsuit, and then she's just in her Bailey, so it's Justin Bailey. And if you're watching this, and you're British, you already know, that that's not a thing. That's just something somebody made up. A Bailey is not a swimsuit or anything resembling that. In fact, the Justin Bailey code probably didn't originally represent anything because it definitely wasn't put there on purpose. Rather, the Justin Bailey code is just a quirk of how Metroid's password system works. Here's an explanation from the Metroid database. The Justin Bailey password is a total fluke. If you play around with Metroid's password system, something you can do with the Metroid Password Generator program found in fan apps. You can come up with other names and words that work as passwords. The Justin Bailey code is one which was found early on and happened to work pretty well, so it became widely reported. And if we play around with one of these password generators, we can see that the Justin Bailey code is a code that can be created normally with how the password system works. It's super, super unlikely that a code that was put there deliberately by the programmers would also happen to check out as valid in the password system. And if you play around with it enough, you can find a lot of codes that'll do these kinds of things, such as the Dragon Ball Z code. Or my new favorite, the Justin Wang code. You see, the Justin Wang code essentially dooms you to an immediate death by Metroids, but I guess life is just like that sometimes. There's only one password in this game that was put in deliberately by programmers and does not check out with the normal password system. Narpus Sword, or Nar Password, I'm not really sure what it means and there's a lot of debate over it. But essentially, this password is a god mode for Metroid that was probably put in there for testing purposes. If you test this code on a Metroid password generator, it doesn't check out as a valid code, yet it still works in the game. If the Justin Bailey code were put in there deliberately, it's very likely that the same thing would happen. So now that we know that the Justin Bailey code is a code that can hypothetically be generated organically by Metroid's password system, does that mean that it was? Did someone just happen to get the Justin Bailey code through a normal playthrough of Metroid? Definitely not, because even though it's hypothetically possible for the password system to generate this password, there's no way to play a game that would give you this password through normal means. And there's a few pieces of evidence for that. First of all, it's the missiles. If you use the Justin Bailey code, you start off with 255 missiles, which means that you would have all the missiles in the game. But if you play the game with the Justin Bailey code, there are still missiles around to be picked up. In a normal playthrough, there would be absolutely no way to have that many missiles and still have missiles lying around to be collected. Oh yeah, and the code also makes the game think that you've logged nearly 600 years of playtime. Unless Justin Bailey was a time traveler who really, really, really liked Metroid, it just didn't happen that way. So what that means is that there's probably just some guy, probably named Justin Bailey, who tried his name as a code and it just happened to work. Not only did it work, it was an amazing code that was useful for a lot of people. But still, this is before the internet, it's not like Justin Bailey could have just went online and shared its code, so how do so many people know about it? The answer to this question probably lies at Nintendo Power. The earliest known published appearance of the Justin Bailey code was in the October 1991 issue of Nintendo Power. In this issue, there was a section promoting Metroid 2 that also included some tricks for Metroid 1. One of those tricks being the Justin Bailey code. This section, according to an interview on MentalFloss.com, was most likely written by a guy named George Sinfeld, who at the time was Nintendo Power's senior editor. Here's what George Sinfeld had to say about the code. The fact that Justin Bailey works as a password at all, let alone one that features a powered-up Samus, is pure coincidence and was not put into the game intentionally. Justin Bailey, Sinfeld says, is just one of the many working codes that happen to make sense to a human. And due to how Nintendo Power's editorial process worked, it's very likely that the trick actually was sent in by THE Justin Bailey himself. If the password wasn't put in intentionally, that means someone happened to cross it by accident. And since no one is prone to typing in random proper names, it's possible that an actual Justin Bailey decided to try out his own name as a lark. The latter theory holds up, 
In order to compose the strategy guide, Sinfeld would have referred to in-house information as well as tips sent in by readers. And if you ask me, this is pretty much the only explanation for the Justin Bailey code that makes any kind of sense. But it's really strange to me that, for all these years, no one seems to have come forward as the original Justin Bailey, not even really as a hoax. It's such a famous code, and you would have to figure that it would be a really mind-blowing, memorable moment for the person who discovered it. It's such a million-to-one thing that you would think that the original person, the original Justin Bailey, would want to claim some kind of responsibility for it. I don't know, maybe he died or something. R.I.P. Justin Bailey. Glass Joe is tied with Gabby J. Yay! For the most prolific career in the entire Punch-Out! series, sharing a record of 99 losses and one win. A few weeks ago, a viewer asked me if I could make a video about Glass Joe's one win. I'm sorry I didn't save the comment and now it's lost in the mishmash of all the other comments on my other videos, but you remember who you are. And this was something that I had never really thought about. In Punch-Out, the records were always something that I always just kind of glossed over. But if you really think about it, there has never been a bigger bum in the history of boxing than Glass Joe. You know, he's the guy they put in Punch-Out so that an absolute beginner can get used to playing the game. You have to really, really try to lose to Glass Joe. Or, you know, be one of these kids. He's gassed. Dodge the right way. Or Mike Tyson himself. I couldn't even be glass. I couldn't be glass Joe. Although, granted, Mike Tyson did get his win back. The point is, for Glass Joe to even have a single victory. There have to be some really exceptional circumstances. It's clear that Nintendo put that win in there for a reason, but who is it against? What seems like the obvious answer at first would be the win is probably against Gabby J. Yay! Funny thing is, Gabby J actually has one victory of his own. Let's read about it. Born in Paris, Gabby J originally was a waiter at a small cafe near the Eiffel Tower. However, one day, something snapped, and he felt the need to become a professional boxer. After graduating from the Glass Joe Boxing School, by KOing Glass Joe his one win, he entered the professional circuit. So Glass Joe is so bad that he even got beaten by Gabby J. And that's not to say that Glass Joe couldn't have possibly gotten his win back, but it just doesn't seem that likely. Another theory about Glass Joe's single victory comes from the old Nintendo comics made by Valiant. In 1990 and 1991, Valiant Comics produced a series called Nintendo Comic System. In this series, there were four flagship titles. Super Mario, The Legend of Zelda, Game Boy, and Captain N the Game Master. In these books, sometimes they would have stories between the main stories featuring other Nintendo games. And one of these issues featured a Punch-Out! comic entitled The First Fight. This comic tells the story of how Little Mac came to meet Doc Lewis. After suffering what appears to be yet another loss, Little Mac gets told off by a promoter who tells him that he should just give up boxing. Doc Lewis interrupts this conversation and takes Little Mac under his wing. What makes this comic relevant to the mystery of who Glass Joe beat is that if we look at this panel, we see a boxer who very much looks to be Glass Joe knocking out Little Mac. And we get an even better look on the next page when Matt gets his comeuppance. And that'd justify the promoter's reaction in this comic. If you're so bad that you get beaten by Glass Joe giving him his first and only win, you're not cut out for this. But the thing about this is, like many of the Valiant comics, this story contradicts the established canon of the game. Because according to the official story of Punch-Out!, Little Mac hadn't even started boxing until he came to meet Doc Lewis and begin his training. And the 0-0 record that Little Mac starts the game with corroborates this fact. If there had ever been an encounter between Little Mac and Glass Joe before the first Punch-Out! game, it wasn't sanctioned by the WVBA. But there's another suspect who could potentially have been the person who Glass Joe beat, and that's where the story gets kind of complicated. In an issue of the official Nintendo magazine, one of the programmers for Punch-Out! stated that Glass Joe's single victory came from Nick Bruiser. Nick Bruiser, of course, being the final opponent in Super Punch-Out!, and Glass Joe, of course, doesn't appear in Super Punch-Out, so now we have lore that's spanning across the entire Punch-Out series. And that should be enough to settle it, right? We've got a Nintendo Insider telling us that that victory came when Glass Joe somehow defeated Nick Bruiser, but 
it's more complicated than that. You see, despite the claim by the programmer that Glass Joe had beaten Nick Bruiser and that's where his one victory came from, if we look at Nick Bruiser's record, he has no losses. So let's take a moment to figure out where this discrepancy could come from. The first thing I had considered is that the Punch-Out games, they each feature a number of different circuits. It's possible that maybe different circuits had a different governing body. It would be strangely complicated for it to work out that way, but maybe one body recognizes the fight while another doesn't. But that's not the case, because if we look at every single circuit in the Punch-Out series, they're all governed by the WVBA, or World Video Boxing Association. It's possible that maybe between Punch-Out and Super Punch-Out, the WVBA disavowed the fight, taking away Nick Bruiser's loss. Then, for some reason, between Super Punch-Out and Punch-Out Wii, they re it. And then all of a sudden, Glass Joe has his win back. But that seems needlessly controversial, although I guess in a fight where something like that happened, maybe it would be an exceptionally controversial fight, but uh, I'm not sold on it. Another angle that I considered was maybe Super Punch-Out is a prequel and took place before Punch-Out. If that were the case, then in Super Punch-Out, Nick Bruiser could have his flawless record, lose to Glass Joe after that game, and then Glass Joe has his win in time for Punch-Out. That could also explain why Nick Bruiser never appears in another Punch-Out game, you know, that's a disgrace. It would also explain why Little Mac isn't in Super Punch-Out, because he hadn't trained to box yet. And I know there's some debate over whether or not your character in Super Punch-Out is Little Mac, but I think it's very clear that it's a different character. Even though there is some newer, at least in the English language, stuff, some newer material that refers to him as Little Mac, it's clear that that wasn't intended. You can look at early screenshots of Super Punch-Out and see that originally it definitely was Little Mac and then for some reason they changed the design. That seems like it would be an odd choice to me, to make a character the same character despite deliberately making him look different. And then you have a developer for Punch-Out Wii who corroborates what I'm saying. We researched the entire series, and we realized that one of the main elements of the franchise was the story of Little Mac, and he doesn't appear in the Super Punch-Out! universe. We think that the connection between him and Doc Lewis, Max Trainer, was the core reason that the NES game was better received than its sequel Super Punch-Out!, but now I went off on a little bit of a tangent, and the thing about that theory is it doesn't exactly add up for reasons I'm about to show you. Although this theory would make the Little Mac thing make sense, and it would make Last Joe's victory make sense, the other boxers' records contradict it. If we look at the records of the boxers who returned for Super Punch-Out, Sandman goes from two losses to three, Super Macho Man goes from zero losses to three, and Bold Bull goes from four losses to 19. What's going on, big guy? So if these returning boxers' records in mind, it's safe to throw out the prequel theory. But then I noticed a small detail in Super Punch-Out that got me thinking about a theory that can make all of this make sense. So when you win a match in Super Punch-Out, it gives you a record of all the times that the boxer got beaten at. In addition to whatever time you set, it'll also have times set by a bunch of imaginary people. When you beat Nick Bruiser for the first time, among these names will be... G. Joe. Clearly, this implies that Glass Joe beat Nick Bruiser. And obviously, I'm not saying that winning in a video game equates to getting a win added to your real-life boxing record. But what this did make me think of is a theory that makes it possible for Glass Joe to have his one victory in real life, real life, while Nick Bruiser still has a flawless record in Super Punch-Out. What if Super Punch-Out is a video game? What I mean by this, what if Super Punch-Out exists only as a video game within the greater Punch-Out universe? I mean, obviously if they want to imply that Glass Joe actually played the game instead of time, it does, but that also fixes the contradiction between his win and Nick Bruiser's perfect record. And then that, that gives us this timeline as I see it. At some indeterminate time between the original Punch-Out game, in these 100 bouts that Glass Joe has had, he'd managed to somehow beat Nick Bruiser. It is a WVBA sanction match, and it's some weird fluke, but he gets the win regardless. Obviously disgraced, Nick Bruiser never shows his face again in the WVBA, meaning we never see him in another Punch-Out game. Then Super Punch-Out, the video game, comes out, and Nick Bruiser is included, because, you know, he's a legend, he's Nick Bruiser, give him a flawless record. Glass Joe plays the game and sets a pretty good record. Or, you know, maybe someone over at Nintendo just made a mistake, but why would that ever happen? So 
there you go. Glassjaw's single victory comes against Nick Bruiser in a world in which Super Punch-Out is a game within a game, or maybe they're just wacky boxing games that exist in a vacuum and we shouldn't overthink their barely existent stories. If somebody asks you to name the big two franchises of survival horror video games, I think it's a pretty safe bet to say that you would probably pick Resident Evil and Silent Hill. And although Resident Evil veers off into more of a sci-fi and action-y direction, while Silent Hill has more of a focus on a atmospheric Lovecraftian style of horror, they probably have more similarities than differences between them. And when it comes to the original Resident Evil and Silent Hill games, one of the biggest similarities is, of course, the amazing voice acting. What is it? What's that? Another big similarity? Kanabi was sometimes just as bad as Capcom was with crediting their actors. In particular, the case of Harry Mason, aka the main character of Silent Hill. In the original Silent Hill, Harry Mason was credited only as Michael G. People searched for years and years and years trying to find out what that G stood for and who was the man who played Harry Mason. And thankfully, we finally know the answer. After the release of my videos about Barry Burton's voice actor and Jill Valentine's voice actor, a lot of people asked me if I could make a video about Harry Mason's voice actor. And at the time when you were asking me, I didn't even know that there were any mysteries about Harry Mason's voice actor from Silent Hill. But I took a look and it turns out that when you get to the Silent Hill and you look for the list of voice actors names, the people you've been listening to for hours, ironically cast by a group known as STARS. All of them are actually credited by their full names, except for one guy. Harry Mason, played by... Michael G. Why would they credit the entire cast by their full names except for the lead actor? Considering that everybody else was given a full credit, it seems really unlikely that this was the case of incompetence or Konami simply not caring. Perhaps Michael G. was so embarrassed by his performance they just didn't want to trace back to him. I mean, it was an interesting performance. Have you seen a little girl? But certainly, it was no worse than what was out there at the time. After Scissor Man, I ain't scared of no ghosts. So who could this possibly be and why would they be credited in such a way? One of the most common theories about Harry Mason's voice actor was that the G stood for Goff. As in Michael Goff. Not to be confused with the Michael Goff who portrayed Alfred Pennyworth in Tim Burton's Batman movies. But no, there actually is another Michael Goff who is a very prolific voice actor. And Silent Hill fans very quickly connected that Michael Goff to Michael G. The factoid that Michael Goff played Harry Mason became so commonly accepted as fact that it made its way onto his IMDb page and the October 2007 issue of EGM magazine. You've probably heard Michael Goff before, you probably know him as either Deckard Cain from Diablo or one of the several other characters he's portrayed. So let's compare Michael Goff's voice to Michael G's voice. Stay a while and listen. Huh. Radio. What's going on with that radio? So what do you think? Is that the same voice? It doesn't matter what you think! Because eventually Michael Goff responded to the claim that he was Michael G from Silent Hill. In 2008, a GameFAQ user named Discord the Lunatic contacted Michael Goff. Mr. Goff, there has been considerable debate over your involvement or not in Konami's Silent Hill video game of 1996. The actor who played the role Harry Mason is simply credited as Michael G and there has been a long-standing internet rumor that he died sometime in the late 90s slash early 2000s. This has since been supplanted by a rumor that you are the mysterious Michael G. Since I could find no evidence either one way or the other, I thought to write and ask directly. Thank you for your time. This was Sunday, September 7th. This morning, I received a reply date stamp September 10th. Well, I wish I could tell you that I am the mysterious Michael G, but no such luck. I've asked IMDB to remove the credit. Don't know who played Harry Mason, but it wasn't me. Best, Michael. So there you go, something was basically unanimously accepted as fact, debunked by the man himself. And that places us back to square one, but thankfully there was another lead to go off of. 
In February of 2007, Thessaly Lerner, who did the voice of Lisa Garland from Silent Hill, did an interview with Cowboy from Hell of the now-defunct website Survival Horror Online. In the interview, she dropped a major clue about the potential identity of Michael G. Did you get to work with Silent Hill's director, Keichiro Toyama? And if so, did he have much to do with the direction of your acting? No. I don't think so. It was a long time ago, and I had no idea it would be the cult phenomenon that it has become. The voice director was the same guy who was the lead character. He had to do the voice because the guy who was supposed to be that character got another voiceover job that paid better for that day. I vaguely recall some Japanese peeps at the session, but I can't be certain. After the release of this interview, Harry Inaba was quickly identified as the voice director for Silent Hill. However, there wasn't that much that could be found out about him online. Not even any other projects or anything like that, and a lot of people started to think that maybe Harry Inaba was a pseudonym. And this was a trail that would go cold until 2012 when a Twitter user, at Chris Blood, found Harry Inaba and asked him about Silent Hill. Hi, I have a question about a video game that you directed in 1999 called Silent Hill. Did you voice act the part of Harry Mason? Hi, no I did not do the voice acting for Harry Mason. It was performed by the guy Michael G who directed it. I was the producer. Thank you very much. Sorry that I misunderstood your position. Do you happen to know what G stands for? That's okay, happy face. And the G should stand for Gwyn, but let me check my records and get back to you. So we finally had a last name to go with G from one of the men who would know best. Michael Gwyn. But who was Michael Gwyn? People started looking for Michael Gwynn, and of course, as with everything else in this case, there was little to nothing to be found. And nobody would really find out anything about Michael Gwynn until June of 2018. Which is actually after a lot of you guys started asking me about Harry Mason, so I'm glad I waited to make this video because now we have a solution. With the help of a guy named Retro Player, aka Dennis Murphy, William Lockwood of RelyOnHorror.com managed to track down Michael Gwynn and secure an interview with him. As it turns out, Michael Gwynn is now retired from voice acting, but he does have a few games that you probably know under his belt. He's appeared in things like Time Crisis, Be my guest and let me entertain you, Ridge Racer, Ridge Racer, remember that one? And uh, Castlevania Symphony of Night as Dracula. That means in addition for every classic line that ever came out of Harry Mason's mouth, he's also responsible for probably one of the greatest lines ever uttered in a video game. What is a man? A miserable little pile of secrets! And for all of those games, he's also credited as Michael G. Why? Was the decision to use a shortened version of your name in both games due to the fact that these voiceover jobs were non-union? I've heard some actors choose to modify their credit so as not to get in trouble with the unions. Can you comment? No, not at all. It had nothing to do with union. When I signed a record contract with CBS Sony, they felt like my last name, Gwyn, was going to be too hard for the Japanese to say. They wanted it to be catchy and easy. You think that a lot of thought goes into these things, but I was literally in that meeting with my management and Sony, and I said, when we were kids, we just used to use our initial for our last name. And everybody just lit up. They were like, oh, that's great, Michael G, it's perfect. Unfortunately, Kenny G released an album about three months after that meeting, but in Japan, they never made the association. During my voiceover work, I was always known as Michael G. That was primarily because the Japanese couldn't pronounce my last name. So no, it had nothing to do with unions or hiding or anything like that. There was no union there. Your union was only as good as your management was. After that, I heard they were making foreign artists sign contracts. I don't know if that was true, that's just what I heard. Who would have guessed that such a simple line of reasoning would have led to a mystery that would go unsolved for almost 20 years? And strangely enough, the Michael G thing winds up tying back together with the Michael Goff rumor. Here's an interesting story about the Michael G thing. I didn't even know that I had an IMDB profile, and they were linking Michael G to a guy by the name of Michael Goff. The irony is, I knew him. He was actually one of the teaching assistants at the University of California Santa Barbara's acting department. We didn't know each other well, but I knew him. He is probably five or eight years older than me, something like that. But I had to get in touch with him, I can't recall why, to let him know, because he was kind of annoyed that people kept thinking he was Michael G. 
I don't know if that fascinates people or not. And thus, the mystery of Michael G has been solved. I remember it like it was yesterday. Thanksgiving Eve of 1992. I'm looking through TV guides to plan my Thanksgiving Day viewing because for some reason they never played normal TV shows on Thanksgiving. There's no Disney Afternoon, there's no Way Cool Weekdays, it was just some random bargain bin assortment of shows with no apparent rhyme or reason. So I'm looking through the TV guide and all of a sudden, something catches my eye. Battletoads. Battletoads? Wait, do they mean THE Battletoads? As in, a Battletoads cartoon? And so that year I planned my entire Thanksgiving around watching that Battletoads cartoon. Had my VHS tape ready to record, and I had my alarm set even though I couldn't sleep because I was so excited to watch the Battletoads. And then finally, after what seemed like an eternity, the moment came and it finally happened. <laughs> Although now, if you hear about a video game adaptation coming out, you generally expect it to be trash, we didn't have that same expectation in 1992. At that point, the Mario Brothers movie was still a year away, and the video game shows that were out were pretty good. The Legend of Zelda cartoon and the Super Mario Brothers Super Show were both really good in my opinion. And then you also had a bunch of other video games crammed together in Captain N, the Game Master, and the Power Team. Maybe my standards were different when I was a kid, but I enjoyed those shows thoroughly. So anytime there was a new video game coming out on TV, it was an event. But the fact that you probably do not remember this Battletoads cartoon at all shows you just how successful it was. But anyway, let's take a look at it. So the one episode of Battletoads that exists begins with a title card that tells us the name of the episode... Battletoads. And it's written by David Wise. Note that this is not the same David Wise who wrote the soundtrack to the Battletoads video game. Coincidentally, this is an entirely different David Wise who also happened to be a writer for the Ninja Turtles cartoon. A series that you might say bears a little passing resemblance to Battletoads. Cowabunga! Cosmorific! Professor T-Bird and Princess Angelica are being chased through space by the Dark Queen and her goons. So far, this is pretty standard Battletoads fare, except for one detail. There's no toads. But that's okay because Professor T-Bird has a plan. The genetic essence of the Battletoads! Oh god. He's gonna make some toads. But with this essence, we can create a new generation of Battletoads to protect you! Yeah, this is an origin story. Cut to our toads-to-be. Meet Morgan Ziegler, Dave Shar, and George Pye. These three guys are a bunch of high schoolers who are having a bad time at high school. While playing some video games, these guys talk about how nice it would be if only life were more like a video game. Oh my god, how meta. Suddenly, T-Bird and Angelica come through the screen and T-Bird sprays the boys with his toad juice. And the magic toad juice turns them into toads. But don't get too worried, they can turn back into humans if only they say the magic words. Let's get normal! Gosh! And if they want to, they can turn back into toads with the other magic words. Let's get horny! Toads You're kidding me, right? You have two chances to get a catchphrase. Actually, wait, three chances because they really wanted to make Psychotronic happen. Psychotronic! Actually, wait, they got four catchphrases because they also like to say... So you have four catchphrases on a Battletoads TV show, and not a single one of them is totally awesome. I'm glad this show didn't get picked up. But anyway, where the hell did this origin story come from? Because I've never heard of such a thing. And I know that sometimes when you adapt a video game or any other property, you take some liberties with the backstory to make it a little different for what you're doing. And at first, that's what I assumed was going on here, something they just made up for the cartoon. But then I checked Wikipedia, and according to Wikipedia, the Battletoads were humans in the games, but I don't remember that. According to the game's backstory, the Battletoads originally have been human computer technicians and roommates. The trio tested the original Battletoads game by playing the game as the Toads in a sort of virtual reality simulation. They became suspicious of both their boss and the chief game programmer Silas Volkmeyer, 
and decided to investigate the office at night. Upon finding the video game unit turned on, they tested it to see if it had been tampered with. This was a trap, and they were transported to another planet permanently transformed into Battletoads. I just do not recall that story, and now it also contradicts what happens in the cartoon. But I thought maybe I just forgot about it, so I checked the instruction manual of the original game. Here's what the manual says. After her defeat by the Galactic Corporation at the Battle of Canis Major, the Dark Queen and her renegade space troops retreat to the outer reaches of the universe, hiding out in the dark spaces between the stars. Meanwhile, on board that spaceship Vulture, Professor T-Bird and the Battletoads, Rash, Zitz, and Pimple, are escorting the Princess Angelica back to her home planet, where her father, the Terran Emperor, awaits her safe arrival. Along the way, Pimple, the biggest Battletoad, takes Angelica out for a cruise in the Toadster to a nearby leisure station. Pimple and Angelica burn space, but the Dark Queen ambushes them before they can get there. Luckily, Pimple manages to send out a distress signal before the Toadster is gobbled up and carried away to Ragnarok's world, the Dark Queen's planet. So there's the situation, Toad. The Dark Queen's kidnapped the Princess Angelica and your best buddy Pimple. What are you gonna do about it? You're gonna get real mad, that's what you're gonna do, and then you're gonna get <laughs> Why does the story of Battletoads suddenly turn into, like, a late-night sex hotline dialogue? Professor Bird's gonna set you down on Ragnarok, but from there it's up to you. You've got a long way to go, Toad, through ice and fire and nightmares so- I, I can't, I can't finish this, but you, you get the story, there's no humans in here. So at this point, I'm completely puzzled where this other origin story comes from, so I'm looking at Wikipedia's sources. There's a source linked in the part where it specifically talks about the Battletoads having always been human in the games, and it links to a Killer Instinct blog. The post that it links to talks about the possibility of Battletoads appearing in Killer Instinct. Did you know the Battletoads are actually human? That's right, the Battletoads are human video game testers testing a video game called, naturally, Battletoads. That became part of the game itself as the Battletoads, Zitz, Rash, and Pimple. Now imagine an alternate version of this story that would fit with the lore of Killer Instinct. Ultratech, taking a human and performing anthropomorphic tests on him that results in the creation of a Battletoad. The Battletoad is entered into the KI tournament to see how he performs with the promise of being returned to his human form should he successfully defeat his opponents. Ultratech has some of the best scientists in the world, having spliced human and reptile DNA to create the intelligent Riptor, and then even creating the fire being Cinder. So it wouldn't be far-fetched to believe they could develop a human-turned-toad battle warrior, right? So although this writer was actually correct in predicting that Killer Instinct 3 would have Battletoads, specifically Rash appeared in the game, this is basically just a speculative blog post that doesn't really serve as a source for proving that the human backstory is canon. But with that being said, we have all these different sources giving the same backstory, and it's a backstory that also contradicts the cartoon, so it had to have come from somewhere. Well, as it turns out, this story came from the June 1991 issue of Nintendo Power. In that issue, there was a Battletoads comic that was written by Valiant, who, if you watched my Glass Joe video, you'll remember that Valiant wrote the Nintendo comics that came out around that time. The Battletoads comic follows the story of three guys, Morgan Ziegler, Dave Shar and George Pye, which are the same names that they had in the cartoon that came out a year later. Morgan, Dave, and George are so exciting to watch play video games that they can fill up entire arenas, which is strangely prophetic for a comic that's mostly been forgotten about. These guys become suspicious of the game's designer, Silas Volkmeyer, and rightfully so because he's definitely up to no good. So the still human Battletoads sneak into Silas's lab to investigate what he's been up to and find that the game has been tampered with. When they go to see what's been done to the game, they wind up being turned into Battletoads permanently. And it was all an evil plan hatched by Silas Volkmeyer and the Dark Queen, who as it turns out, was also a game character that Silas brought into reality. Can you blame him? And from that point on, the game and the comic mostly go in the same direction while the cartoon starts to do its own thing. 
What you got going on there, pimple? At some point, the Dark Queen and her goons come out of a Slurpee machine and have a fight with the Battletoads. And while they're fighting, a surf rock version of Hava Nagila plays for some reason. <laughs> Why would they do that? Is, is Morgan Ziegler having his bar mitzvah? Does the winner get a bris? Can he even circumcise a toad? Eventually, trying to fit in on planet Earth and needing to pay the bills, Princess Angelica gets a job at a coffee shop. Hey, watch it with the jelly donuts! Some more fighting happens, and then this is the point where the cartoon meets back up with the game in the comic. Princess Angelica gets kidnapped, and everything culminates on a big battle at the top of a rotating tower, and the Battletoads save the day. Ultimately, I don't think the Battletoads cartoon was that bad. I actually liked it a lot when I was a kid and would watch that same VHS tape over and over again. But it definitely didn't match up with the other game cartoons that were out at the time. At the same time, there was much worse stuff out there, and we were still a few years away from being saturated with anthropomorphic animal superheroes. Over the next few years, we wind up with cows, and mice, and sharks, and cats. If anything, maybe it's just that toads were a bit too turtly. And as for the backstory of the Battletoads being human, Although there is not a single in-game source that corroborates that story, there are some allusions to it in the SNES game Battle Maniacs. In particular, Silas Volkmeyer makes his debut in the game and it makes reference to his ability to manifest game stuff into reality. To me, that makes it likely that the Nintendo Power backstory was intended to be canon. Furthermore, it's also a neat way of explaining why the Battletoads games are so hard. You have the game designer who's deliberately making the game impossibly hard because he wants to kill the Battletoads. But I'll put a poll up to see what you guys think. Super NES RPGs were the best. Final Fantasy VI, Earthbound, Chrono Trigger. To me, this was the absolute greatest time in gaming. But good things don't last forever. As Nintendo started to talk about their new Ultra 64 console, it was clear that the Super Nintendo days were coming to an end. But screenshots of new 64-bit RPGs and game magazines gave me hope for what would come next. One by one, all of those games got cancelled, but hey, at least we got Quest 64. But a few years later, after some of that bitterness washed away, I came across a bunch of screenshots that kind of brought these hopes back. This is the story of Chrono Resurrection. If you've been watching my channel for any amount of time, you can probably tell based on my song choices that Super NES RPGs were a big deal to me. And although there are a lot of classic JRPGs that came out after the Super NES, to me there was never really anything that captured that same magic again. But maybe part of that feeling is just because of all the time screenshots in Nintendo Power got my hopes up only to leave me waiting around like Fry's dog. Final Fantasy 64. You could probably hear the saltiness in my voice because doing the research for this video got me all agitated about this game again. So it starts in 1995 as game magazines start to publish pictures of what appears to be Locke, Terra, and Shadow from Final Fantasy VI in full 3D. Some of these magazines call it Final Fantasy 64, some of them call it Final Fantasy VII, and then the one that really took the ball and ran with it was Game Players. They published a whole article about how this was definitely Final Fantasy VII and it's coming out in December of 1996. But Game Players was full of shit, because this was definitely not Final Fantasy VII and it was definitely not coming out, ever. What this actually was, was a tech demo where Squaresoft was simply experimenting with ideas for the next Final Fantasy game. They were trying to see what they could do with the upcoming Nintendo 64 DD, and considering that what they wanted to do with Final Fantasy VII would have taken 30 DD discs as opposed to 3 PlayStation discs, that was the end of that. But Squaresoft wasn't the only game in town. It was HAL Laboratories that developed what was one of the last great RPGs of the 16-bit era. Of course, I'm talking about Earthbound. And where Final Fantasy 64 failed, Earthbound 64 would surely succeed, right? And unlike Final Fantasy 64, there were a lot of different pictures, a lot of different scenes we would see in magazines from this game. 
In particular, there is a picture of a 3D nest that really made my imagination go wild. And even better, this was actually supposed to be a release title for the 64DD. But then you could look at the pack watch in the back of Nintendo Power and see that release date getting pushed back further and further. And then they changed it from a DD game to a regular Nintendo 64 cartridge. And as people seem to be giving up on the game, there's a tiny glimmer of hope at Nintendo Space World 1999. It was at this show that there was a playable demo of Earthbound 64 and an announced release date of March of 2000. But March of 2000 comes along, there's no Earthbound 64, and then finally, in August, they unceremoniously announced that, yeah, Earthbound ain't coming. And as for that playable demo, who knows where that thing is? It might be riding away in somebody's basement, maybe they threw it in the garbage. <laughs> Can you imagine if somebody threw Earthbound 64 in the garbage and that's just it, it's just gone now? But in retrospect, thinking about these two games, I realized that I was hoping for something that was never planned to ever actually come out. Final Fantasy 64 would become Final Fantasy 7 and it was a classic. Not as good as Final Fantasy 6, but you know, a classic nonetheless. The story that was meant to be told in Earthbound 64 was eventually told in Mother 3, and yeah, that game never received an official English version, but we all played the patch. What was really building up in my mind was this idea of playing as these characters from my favorite 2D RPGs, Locke, Terra, Shadow, Ness, in 3D. And even though that specifically was never really on the menu, it's clear that I wasn't the only one who was thinking that way. At the same time that I was growing increasingly frustrated with all these cancellations, a young developer named Nathan Lazar was thinking about how he could make his own. Well, I remember wondering back in 1999 what a 3D Chrono Trigger would look like. I realized at the time that I had to learn programming to accomplish my dream. So I started researching programming, which I had no previous experience with. In the process of learning how to program, I also learned a lot about console programming thanks to extensive research and development on Nintendo 64 and PS1. And so it began. I started to create a demo of Chrono Trigger on the Nintendo 64 as an application of what I learned. After beginning to develop his programming skills and making some small homebrew projects, Nathan started to work on his own Chrono Trigger remake that he entitled CT64. The plan for CT64 was to have two separate modes. The first mode would be a 2D mode with enhanced graphics and 3D spell effects. The second mode would be fully 3D with some cinematic camera angles based on the Ocarina of Time. Does a project like this sound a bit too ambitious for a fledgling programmer? Well, as it turns out, it was. In 2000, a year after work on CT64 began, Nathan brought the project to a hold. Nathan felt that his programming skills just weren't what they needed to be to accomplish what he wanted and he wanted to take some time off to improve them. And it was during this time off that he received a job offer that would take him to Montreal to work for DC Studios. No relation to DC Comics, I'm talking about the company that made the Bratz game. Break it down. Perfect. Nathan worked for DC Studios for three years until he needed to take a significant amount of time off due to health issues. And it was during this downtime that his mind went back to CT64. Although he was undoubtedly happy to be working in his dream industry, perhaps working for the company that made Mia Hamm Soccer 64... Oh, great touch on the ball. ...wasn't quite what he had envisioned when he was trying to make Chrono Trigger 3D. So Nathan went and updated the personal project section of his blog. Chrono Trigger Brink of Time. This was a personal project of mine a few years back. I decided to reopen my interest in this because it dawned on me that I never finished the project. I don't like not finishing things. The Chrono Trigger remake project was alive once again, this time known as Chrono Trigger Brink of Time. Nathan quickly began assembling a team of hardcore Chrono Trigger fans, including Matthew Valente, who was his original musician from CT64. Having more experience now, Nathan also had a better idea of the kinds of resources it would take to bring a project of that scale to fruition. So he narrowed down his goals a little bit, and rather than remake the entire game in 3D, he decided to stick to 10 scenes that would link together major set pieces. A lot of people did ask him about the full remake, but he said that the only way that would be possible is if Square Enix themselves said, yeah, let's fund this project. Work on Chrono Trigger Brink of Time began in April of 2003. Throughout the following year, he would provide sporadic updates, but it was still a very low-key project. 
At some point he released a teaser image of the project which was now renamed to Chrono Trigger Resurrection. This image got some people interested, but it was nothing compared to what would happen in May of 2004. It was in May of 2004 that, planned to coincide with E3, they released the official website for Chrono Resurrection. Welcome to the home of the Chrono Trigger Resurrection project. We have been vigorously working for the past year on this project and we are excited to bring it to the public eye, in full for the first time. Chrono Trigger Resurrection is a 3D remake of Square's SNES classic Chrono Trigger. The demo, which will be released on Christmas 2004, recreates 10 of the best scenes from the original game. Currently, the demo is 25% complete. We expect to release a trailer when the demo is over 50% completed, which should be around the end of August. When the project is completed, only the PC version will be released to the public for free. The GameCube and Xbox ports are internal and only official developers for those respective platforms will be able to play them. There are various screenshots of the scenes, characters, stock art, concept art, and even some sample music located in the media section. We invite you to navigate around the rest of the website to find out any information about the project and post your thoughts on the forums. We hope you look forward to our next news update. Chrono Trigger Resurrection Team. And those screenshots in the media section were a game changer. The quality of those images far exceeded what anybody would ever have expected, especially at that point in time, what a fan game might look like. These images perfectly captured the vision of a 3D Chrono Trigger, and with Final Fantasy 64 and Earthbound 64 distant memories, it was bringing some of that same hope back to life. As a result of this, Chrono Trigger Resurrection started to receive a ton of coverage on different game websites. Basically, any gaming forum you could go to, it became the talk of the town. The official website was getting slammed with traffic to the point where they had to upgrade their hosting service. But it wasn't just the fans who were noticing this. As the game started to receive more and more attention, Nathan started to notice that the website was receiving traffic from IP addresses that were connected to Square Enix. At first he was alarmed, but then this traffic persisted for three months. Because so much time had passed without them ever hearing from Square, they assumed the traffic was coming from employees who were just curious. Or maybe the unlikely scenario that people had been asking for was coming true and Square was ready to fund a 3D Chrono Trigger. But then on August 24th of 2004, Nathan received a correspondence from the law offices of Kirkpatrick and Flockhart on behalf of Square Enix. We understand that you are developing Chrono Trigger Resurrection, a 3D remake of our client's Chrono Trigger game which will recreate scenes from the original game. Your conduct in this regard constitutes copyright infringement and, inter alia, violates our client's exclusive rights to prepare derivative works based on its copyrighted work. Your use of the words Chrono Trigger in connection with your remake and on your website opcoder.com and your use of logos, scenes, characters, and other images associated with our clients' games constitutes trademark and copyright infringement and false designation of origin. Accordingly, demand is hereby made that you immediately cease and desist from further development, promotion, sale, or distribution of any project which is based on or derived from our clients' Chrono Trigger games and that you cease and desist from all use of the Chrono Trigger trademark and logo and all use of images or artwork from Chrono Trigger games. And this was kept quiet until September 18th when Nathan made this blog post. It's been a while since I have updated my website. As most of you know, I have been working on Chrono Resurrection since May like a mad dog. The project has since been cancelled at the request of the original IP owner, Square Enix Co. Ltd. While I am disappointed, I understand their legal obligation to protect their copyright. Here are some interesting notes about the production of Chrono Resurrection. Only 3,000 man-hours were consumed creating content for the six-scene trailer between roughly five people. We plan to have ten scenes in the demo. As good as the graphics looked, if we had spent a full day instead of a few hours each day working on it, it would have looked much, much better. Those ten scenes were Chrono's House Upstairs, Chrono's House Downstairs, End of Time, Guardia Forest, Battle of Xenon Bridge, Frog Cutting the Cliff with the Masamune, Battle with Magus, Black Tyranno with Azala Boss Battle, Dalton Battle on Blackbird Flying Over Kingdom of Zeal, Lavos Battle 3 Stages. Chrono, Frog, Mara, Luca, Magus, Robo would have been playable characters. Over 800,000 downloads of the normal quality trailer have been tracked so far. 500,000 of those were in the week of the announcement of the Cease and Desist. 
Over 300 employees from Square Enix downloaded the trailer within that time as well. Contrary to what some folks have said on the internet, everything we have shown is rendered in-game. This is not CG, that includes the trailer, smiley face. I have received too many emails with condolences and offers and I am very happy people have been showing their interest. The team and I will be moving on to an original project which will start pre-production very soon. If things go as planned, we'll have a website up with some preliminary art or information. Now, I have to update the rest of the site and start coding again. Smiley face. Until next time. So once again, the hopes of RPG fans hoping to see their 2D favorites in glorious 3D were crushed. But that's not exactly where the story ends. After all, on that project page, Nathan did say that he doesn't like not finishing things. And four years later, on February 20th of 2006, a video appeared on a YouTube account belonging to Nathan. Although they never publicly released it, obviously for legal reasons, they did go ahead and finish the Xenan Bridge section from the trailer. And four years after that, Nathan went and uploaded another video showing us one of the unfinished sections. Alright, that looked cool as shit, and it's making me annoyed that this got cancelled again. But this is a story that's going to be told over and over again because despite the fact that companies keep taking down these kinds of projects, fans keep trying to make them. And as for what happened to Nathan Lazar, in 2012 he successfully crowdfunded a game called Football Heroes. Football Heroes has grown into what appears to be a very successful series. So even though his dream project, that 3D Chrono Trigger remake, was snuffed out by Square Enix, it appears that that inspiration still led him down the right path. As soon as the first Resident Evil game completed development, Capcom knew that they had a revolutionary, genre-defining hit on their hands. So work on the sequel began almost immediately. And it seemed like things were coming along quickly, with footage of the game being shown off mere months after the first game came out. But as the game came closer to completion, development was marred by internal conflicts and ultimately, producer Shinji Mikami decided that it just didn't live up to the standards of the first game. So the game was thrown out in February of 1997 and the entire thing was rebuilt from the ground up into the game we know today. And although the Resident Evil 2 that we did get is widely regarded to be the best game in the series, Hardcore Resident Evil fans have been left wondering what could have been, and many of these fans became obsessed with finding the original game. This was a search cursed by a surprising amount of misdirection and treachery. A search with a cast of characters almost as fascinating as the game itself. This is the story of Resident Evil 1.5. Ada. No. With the remake of Resident Evil 2 here, I think this is a good time to talk about one of my favorite mysteries of one of my favorite game series of all time. I'm talking about the lost original version of Resident Evil 2, commonly known as Resident Evil 1.5. Ironically, this is my second attempt at making this video because I threw out the first one. I'll never forget my excitement when I first saw the game in motion in the CD-ROM that came with Ultra Game Players magazine. And then for the months following, every single video game magazine would tease us with more and more screenshots and descriptions of what the game was like. But as you certainly know, the game we wound up getting in January of 1998 was not the same game that they had been showing us for over a year. And people actually did succeed at digging up that prototype eventually, but before I go into that insane, meandering search, I want to talk a little bit about what didn't make it to the final game. The most obvious difference between Resident Evil 1.5 and Resident Evil 2 is the characters. You're probably aware that Claire Redfield was originally going to be a motorcyclist named Elza Walker, but what you might not know is that she was originally supposed to be a relative of Forrest Spire, the sniper from Star's Bravo team. They were going to call her Rachel Spire, and while it might have been a cool way to flesh out a minor character from the first game, I think making her a Redfield was a good idea. There's also the case of Leon, who, even before the development of Resident Evil 1.5, was going to have a different name. Grant Bittman. 
I'm kind of glad they changed that one because I don't know. To me, Grant Bittman sounded kind of sounds like a kind of like a wienery name. Oh hi, I'm Grant Bittman. Oh my god, I'm nauseous. Watch there be someone Grant Bittman watching this who gets pissed off. Leon, who was originally going to be an experienced cop and not a rookie, would never cross paths with Elsa. Rather, they would meet up with a different set of characters. Leon would meet the cop Marvin, who would live much longer, and Ada, who was originally going to be called Linda. Elsa would meet a character named John, who used Robert Kendo's character model, and his story arc would resemble Ben's in the final game. Elsa would also meet a cop named Roy, and she would also have Sherry in her story arc like Claire, but in the earliest prototypes, Sherry had a yellow outfit. As in the finished game, both characters would meet William and Annette Birkin, and they would also meet Chief Irons, who was an ally and not a villain. There was also the case of the locations. Both versions focused heavily on the police station, but in the original 1.5 version, the police station was more of a modern US police station. They thought the modern police station was a little too boring though, so we wound up getting something that more closely resembles an art museum. Very, very early on in the game's development, they were playing around with the idea of returning to the mansion from the first game, but now obviously it would be destroyed. It was rumored that this concept was actually intended for a game called Resident Evil Dash, but there's no evidence that that game has ever existed. And the gameplay itself was a lot more ambitious too. You could have more zombies on the screen, they were infinitely spawning in some places, and it was a lot more gory. You can get blood on yourself, you would have wear and tear on your clothes, zombies could be blown in half and still crawl at you. Perhaps all that was just a bit too ambitious for the PlayStation hardware at the time. But this is all just descriptions based on screenshots and video clips and interviews and articles. The actual game, the thing that we saw in motion, had to be out there somewhere. But where was it, and who had it? Around the time that Resident Evil 2 was officially released, a sizable community was growing online asking this very question. And obviously, a thing like this is going to attract a ton of liars and scammers. People are trying to get your money, you're just trying to get some attention. And that did happen, but it actually wasn't terribly long until the first legitimate contact was made with someone who had access to the game. It was in 1999 that a friend of a Japanese Capcom employee contacted Kim Larson, the owner of Bioflames.com. Bioflames.com was one of the leading websites about Resident Evil 1.5, and if you ever looked the game up back in the day, you definitely came across this website. So this Japanese contact provided Kim with over a hundred cell phone photos of Resident Evil 1.5 in motion. These pictures did not match up with any other content that was known to the community at the time, meaning they were almost certainly authentic. But maybe they got spooked or something, maybe they got in trouble because that Japanese contact disappeared almost immediately and has never been heard from again. And after that contact was made throughout the years, all kinds of rumors would spread about private collectors and Capcom employees who had access to the game and were keeping it to themselves. It was on November 29th of 2006 that a forum user named Random Wav spelled out exactly what was verified to exist of the game. The 1.5 community know of only a few betas, all of which are not for sale under any circumstance. If those betas were to find themselves to the public, the original beta testers could find themselves in a lot of trouble with Capcom. Each beta Capcom issued has, to my knowledge, a small file which contains certain code that Capcom can use to see who was the beta tester. Capcom used this with the beta tester who leaked the early build of the final Resident Evil 2, and that guy almost got put behind bars due to the agreement he signed with Capcom. Until those agreements run out, we will not see a rip of the betas. Now, the betas exist. However, the people who own them either won't risk releasing them, or they're within private collector's hands. This is true of the three known copies of 1.5. Two are in private collector circles, and one is still with the ex-Capcom employee. With Capcom taking these leaks so seriously, there's absolutely no way any of these copies would get out to the public, except in the unlikely scenario that someone either betrayed a source, or got out of a contract. What's the easiest way to get out of a contract? Die, of course. And legend has it that that's exactly what happened. And I say legend has it because this is more of a hearsay thing than anything with concrete proof, but it's said that in 2007 there was an estate sale belonging to a deceased Capcom employee. Among the assets that were for sale were Resident Evil 2 prototypes. And the timing of this estate sale makes sense because it was shortly after it that a prominent member of the Resident Evil 1.5 community, a guy named Dot50Cal, 
was approached with the opportunity to purchase this prototype. I was contacted by a friend in the assembler community around late September who started asking me if I would be interested in Biohazard 1.5. Naturally, I was curious, so I asked for more details. He said that an old contact who has it was recently making suggestions that he may be interested in selling it. Not wanting to lose it, but unable to afford the asking price myself, I enlisted the help of a few figureheads of the RE communities. We all pulled our money together and waited for word from my friend. All was going as planned and we were waiting on video proof from the seller. This dragged on for a while until October 10th. I was told that the disc was already sold for a measly $300. We had been offering a bit over 4000 for it. Once I informed the group, we were pretty disheartened, but held out hope that whoever bought it would hopefully release more information on it, or even release it since it was such a low amount that was paid. Over the next few weeks, my friend informed me that it was sold because it was offered to this person first. Apparently, the buyer hadn't contacted the seller until he had already moved on to us as the possible buyers. And shortly after receiving the bad news, a brand new entry appeared on the official PlayStation Museum website a website dedicated to cataloging PlayStation rarities. Resident Evil 1.5, featuring never-before-seen photos and video clips. Obviously, the purchaser of the prototype was the owner of the PlayStation Museum website, a person who came to be known as The Curator. And The Curator very quickly became one of the most hated personalities among the Resident Evil 1.5 community. At first, prominent users of the community such as .50cal tried to befriend the curator, and at first the curator would ask them for help with things like translations and debugging and item lists. And they would gladly help, thinking that they were getting on this guy's good side and he might help them out with the game. But whenever they would ask about buying the game or potentially getting a copy, he would just ignore them. Eventually, he would claim to be receiving death threats and go on a bizarre trolling campaign that included things like faking videos pretending to be a Japanese owner of the game, demanding free PSPs and pictures of women who look like Elsa Walker, and eventually he put the prototype on eBay for $125,000. After months of back and forth, Dot 50 Cal had finally had enough and he just closed a statement on December 30th with this. So where are we now? Curator scoops the disc from under the community for $300 and states his intentions soon after. I believe I have said this already and I don't mean to throw fuel in the fire, but I personally have never had the urge to play RE 1.5 and I never understood why everyone was so interested in the game. I volunteered to test the game based on the fact that it's an important piece of PlayStation history. And in his review, he states he's played 1.5 more than Biohazard 2 itself, which couldn't have been very long considering he only had the disc for a few days when it went up. Then he tries to get as much information from the community as possible about the game, translations, item locations, etc., before giving them a big shuck you and cutting off all contact. He then registers YouTube and forum accounts, attempting to conceal his identity, goading people into paying exorbitant amounts of money for the disc, while simultaneously ignoring real offers from the community to purchase it for a healthy sum. Finally, in late December, he puts it on eBay for $125,000 with an eBay name, Bioflames, an obvious insult thrown at the community. He's shown that he is nothing but a child throughout all this, trying to get people's hopes up that a real sale will come, while saying he's interested in selling it, and then ignoring real offers from the community. And from that point on, there would be a lead here, a lead there, a few more verified copies of the game floating around, but none of them could be sold or released. It wasn't until 2011 that another potential seller appeared. A user named Darkmoon reflected on this experience a few years later. About a year and a half ago, a longtime friend of mine and a well-respected member of the Resident Evil community approached me. John, you got any cash? I said no because it was after New Year. I was pretty broke. I asked why and got told, I finally found 1.5. I should explain this a little. 1.5 was actually found a long time ago, but the individual with the disc was unwilling to sell. After years of communicating with the guy who owned the disc, my friend was the one he went to with an offer. We are talking years of dedication here. And this description makes it sound like the seller might have actually been the curator after all these years, but when asked, Dark Moon declined to identify the seller. But the price was high. I've seen a few numbers thrown around, so here's the one you want. $8,000. Yes. Those three zeros are not a typo. Eight grand in US currency. I said I could throw in a few hundred once everything was confirmed. 
a very nice video was promptly sent to me, but between the two of us, we weren't coming close. I roped in a friend, he got a couple of, yeah, we might be able to help, but there was one person I knew had the cash to get this done. My friend was a little nervous and unwilling, but we didn't have much choice, so he went. And suddenly the deed was done. It's amazing how a huge wad of cash does a thing. A PayPal account was set up and the people who could pay did. I wasn't one of them, I regret that a bit now, not, you know, enough to actually give anyone money, but a bit. Why? Because there are a couple of people who threw in a couple hundred bucks that weren't entirely trustworthy. So we, this secret cabal, played the game. And there just wasn't much to it. The script, what there is, gave some hints. But the game was pretty low on actual content. So one person, the person who put up the money, started assembling a team to fix it. IGAS. Rather than release this very disappointing prototype that people had been searching for for at this point over a decade, they decided that they were going to fix it. Team IGAS, aka Team I've Got a Shotgun, would quietly begin searching for programmers and artists to rebuild the game. And honestly, that sounds like kind of a weird decision to me, but at the same time, I'm not the one who put down thousands of dollars, so I don't really have a say in the matter. And Team IGAS would get to work pretty quickly and be able to make a lot of progress uninterrupted for about a year. It was in the summer of 2012 that some of their content started to leak out onto Facebook. The community started to stir a little bit as they were aware that someone had the game and someone was tinkering with it. But they had no idea just how close to home these people were. And as long as the game itself didn't leak, they could continue uninterrupted. And then in February of 2013, the game itself leaked. In fact, not only did it leak, but someone was selling their work. The team deliberated for a while over what to do about this, and then on February 17th, they released this statement. As stated in our open letter on the 17th of February 2013, posted on the fan site The Horror Is Alive via our only true public spokesperson, we regretfully learned that Joel Welsh, aka Colvin, tried to profit from his acquisition of this very build by shopping it around to several members of the Resident Evil community. We learned from several alarming chat logs and sales offers forwarded to us by worried and concerned parties and friends of the team who'd either been directly contacted by Colvin or knew people who had been. As with the situation where leaked media from our project appeared online in the summer of 2012, followed by a small wave of people attempting to scam people into giving them money in exchange for what they believed was 1.5 or more information on the project, we quickly investigated the situation and found our signature watermarks all over both the media Colvin had presented in public, the media he was shopping around to people, and the terminology he used to describe certain things pertaining to the build he'd obtained. People attempting to profit on our non-profit efforts and both our personal and monetary investments is something we cannot stand for and is something we feel greatly taints the Resident Evil community, the prototype community, the archival and preservation of video game history, the integrity and face value of people, and our goal and intentions for this here restoration project. While we cannot speak on behalf of Capcom, we do believe that charging money for illegal and unsanctioned duplication of their data is something that should be frowned upon and avoided at all costs. So our plea to you is, if you paid for this here build of Resident Evil 1.5, you've been cheated and should demand your money back and or file a fraud report via the service you use to complete your monetary transaction. And there is also a file attached to the statement. And that file was an ISO. A playable download of Team IGAS's Resident Evil 1.5 Restoration Project. An unfinished and incomplete version of the project, but the very first time that Resident Evil 1.5 had been publicly available on the internet. And despite this hiccup, Team IGAS would continue to work on their restoration project known as the MZD build or Magic Zombie Door build, with a number of patches being released over the subsequent years. Additionally, the unedited version of the prototype known as the 40% build is also out there. Some people think the MZD build is the best way to experience the game, others are purists who prefer the 40% build, but ultimately, I think at that point, 15 years later, most had given up hope of ever being able to play this game. And that's not where the story ends necessarily. You see, even though the 40% build is out there and Team IGAS was able to restore a great deal of it, 
there's still another, more complete prototype in existence. This is commonly referred to as the 80% build, and it's believed to be the one that was shown to Bioflames all those years back in 1999. The 80% build would be the one that they had when the game was cancelled, meaning that it is the most complete version of the game. I think it's a safe bet that that thing might still be floating around in Japan somewhere, and I wouldn't be too surprised if one day it got out there and we could finally experience the game that Shinji Mikami felt was so boring that it merited throwing away an entire year's work. But hey, if we don't, at least we're getting an Elza Walker skin. So last night, I think because I saw these pictures of these really, really detailed Ninja Turtles movie action figures, I wound up falling down this really deep rabbit hole about everything Ninja Turtles. In particular, I was looking up all kinds of things about the Ninja Turtles comics. Like a lot of people my age, I was a huge Ninja Turtles fan as a kid. I remember so clearly being like 7 or 8 years old, and I went to my friend's birthday party. And at this birthday party, he had a clown, and at some point the clown offers to either write or draw on us with these markers that he had. So I have the clown give me like a blue Leonardo wristband thing and I want him to write Ninja Turtles on me. And somehow he managed to spell Ninja wrong, I don't know if it was some kind of a clown joke, or he just didn't know how to spell Ninja, but I'm pretty sure I didn't say Niger Turtles. The point is, we are at the height of the Ninja Turtles craze, but my focus was almost entirely on the cartoon and the action figures. Aside from one issue of the comics I had that forever burned Cuddly the Cowlick into my memory, I knew almost nothing about the comics. But even then, from what I can tell from the tiny tastes of the comics I would get from different Ninja Turtles media, I could tell that they were very, very different from the cartoon. In fact, not only were the comics totally different from the cartoons, but they were two separate comics universes. The Ninja Turtles Archie comics and the Ninja Turtles Mirage comics. And both of those were very different from each other too. And strangely, probably the biggest gateway for me learning about the different Ninja Turtles comics was the game Ninja Turtles Tournament Fighters. As the name implies, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Tournament Fighters was a fighting game. Well, actually, it was three different fighting games. You see, the Super NES, the Genesis, and the NES versions were all very different from each other. And it's the Super NES version, which is the one that I had, that I think contains the biggest mystery of all of these games. I think what really made Tournament Fighters a special game was that it took characters from all the various comic universes and the cartoon and put them all together in the same game. Of course, you've got the four Ninja Turtles, Shredder and the Rat King, who existed in all three of these continuities. Then, representing the Archie comic series, you have War, who is this purple dinosaur-looking guy who honestly, at the time, I used to confuse him with Triceraton. You have Armagon, who's some kind of a shark guy, but it's not a street shark, he's a futuristic space shark. And then there was Wingnut, who was some kind of a bat guy from outer space who looked like a superhero, and him I was actually familiar with because he crossed over into the cartoon very briefly. As for characters that were exclusive to the cartoon, you just had Chrome Dome, who is uh, the samurai-looking killer robot guy. But it was really the other two characters in this game that got me curious about aspects of the Ninja Turtles universe that I was previously unfamiliar with. First, there is the character Karai. Now, when you look in the Ninja Turtles Tournament Fighters instruction manual, every character has a description, a drawing, and what their goals are in the tournament. But when you look at Karai, there's just a red box that says Restricted. Very mysterious. And then, of all the characters, and keep in mind this is a game that includes Shredder, and it includes the Rat King, Karai winds up being the last boss. Now, as someone who at the time, 1993 when this game came out, considered himself to be a hardcore Ninja Turtles fan, who had seen every episode of the cartoon, had a lot of the action figures, and the ones I didn't, I knew what was out there, I had never even heard of this character that was somehow so important that she was made the final boss of a game. Clearly, I actually knew nothing about Ninja Turtles. What I would find out later was that Karai was actually in there to represent the Mirage Comics continuity of Ninja Turtles. In fact, at the release of the game, she was a very new character having also debuted in 1993. 
Karai, at least in this continuity, was a Japanese boss of the Foot Clan. At the time she is introduced in New York, the Foot Clan is in disarray because Leonardo killed Shredder. This leads to a power struggle for control of the New York Foot Clan, and Karai comes to New York to set shit straight. And since that story arc, the character's gone through a lot of different changes in different continuities. Sometimes she's Shredder's daughter, sometimes she's Splinter's daughter, sometimes she's a love interest for Leonardo. Which, okay. I know that a turtle's got a big schwantz, and I'm not gonna show it to you, but you can look it up or you can trust me. But you're gonna get salmonella. Is it really worth it? So after learning about all these interesting twists and turns that had happened to Karai throughout the history of her character, I thought back to one other character in the game that I didn't know about. That character is Asuka. Asuka is a scantily clad lady ninja whose goal in the tournament, according to the instruction manual, is... She is a master of ninjutsu and wishes to own her own dojo. And after finding out all the interesting things that I did about Karai, her role in the Foot Clan, her different origin stories, I figured surely this other character would have just as rich and complicated of a background. And I was wrong. Officially, as I would find out, Asuka is a character who was created exclusively for the Super NES version of Tournament Fighters. But something about that just didn't smell right to me. You have this game that's very consciously making the effort to combine different characters from different versions of the Ninja Turtles universe, and rather than put some shine on another lesser known character or put in someone everybody knows like Casey Jones, they decide to put in some random Mai Shirinui cosplayer for no apparent reason? I mean, maybe they just needed some more butt cheeks in the game, but the Genesis version solved that by throwing April O'Neil in what appears to be a Blaze Fielding from Streets of Rage costume. In fact, there is a theory that the reason why Asuka exists is that at some point, they were gonna put April O'Neil in the Super NES version, but then they decided that they were gonna use her to move the story along instead. But that doesn't make all that much sense to me, because surely, by the time that they're already putting characters into the game, you would think they would have some idea that they're going to be using April as a story NPC. And also, it's a fighting game. It's not as if having her in the story, but then having her also be playable, would be some big immersion-breaking thing that would ruin the game. This is a genre where it's standard for characters to fight differently colored versions of themselves. I don't think it'd be a deal breaker. There's also a theory that Asuka was brought into the game to try to appeal to the Japanese market. And in all fairness, they did give the Japanese market some extra Asuka butt cheeks, but that's more to do with American censorship policies. But ultimately, it's not as if Asuka was ever front and center in any of the promotional materials. I don't think people in Japan, where Ninja Turtles was already pretty popular, would be like, Hey, like, I'm on the fence about this Ninja Turtles game, but hey, now they got this Japanese chicken there, so let's buy it. What's probably the real reason that Asuka was put in this game wasn't discovered until 17 years after the game came out. And it was in 2010 when a beta version of the game found its way online. In this beta version, there's two characters who aren't present. Wingnut and Asuka. At least, it was believed that they weren't in it until it was discovered that they could be accessed by using codes. They were incomplete versions of the characters, but they were present. Well, kind of. You see, there is one interesting change to Asuka. In the beta version, she was named Mitsu. And while Asuka was supposedly a character who was made up just for the Super NES version of this game, Mitsu is the name of a character who already existed in the Ninja Turtles universe. She wasn't from the Mirage comics, she wasn't from the Archie comics, and she wasn't from the cartoon. She was from the movies. So in March of 1993, when Ninja Turtles Tournament Fighters was already in development, the third Ninja Turtles movie was released. In this movie, the Ninja Turtles go back in time to feudal Japan where they find themselves entrenched in a conflict between a tyrannical ruler and a rebel faction. This rebel faction is led by a woman named Mitsu. Now, with the Ninja Turtles movies being a huge success up until this point, and with Konami making an effort to combine all of the different Ninja Turtles continuities in one game here, it's a no-brainer that they would have to include somebody from the movies. And with Turtles 3 coming out mere months before the game did, it would make sense for it to be someone from that movie. But unfortunately, as you might already know, 
The third Ninja Turtles movie was a massive flop, both commercially and critically. While it didn't necessarily lose money, it vastly underperformed its predecessors. Essentially, this movie was the canary in the coal mine for the decline of the Ninja Turtles' popularity. Nothing good could possibly come from putting this character in the game and reminding everybody once again of what a failure that movie was. But now with all that being said, even in the beta version, this character looks very different from how Mitsu looks in the movie. It's possible that Mitsu was replaced by Asuka very early in development and they only came up with a new name right before the game came out. That's hard to tell for sure, but if we had access to some concept art or maybe an earlier beta, that might tell us the truth. Perhaps the plan with including her in this game was to get Mitsu ready to go into the other Ninja Turtles continuities. After all, just look at Karai, who has had, at this point, so many different versions and different continuities with different backstories. Why not Mitsu? I don't think it's too far-fetched that there might have been bigger plans for this character had Ninja Turtles 3 not been such a huge disappointment. You might be familiar with the fact that a lot of the signage in the school in Silent Hill was actually taken from the movie Kindergarten Cop. And you also might remember the time that Nick Robinson found Wikipedia articles and diaper instructions in the Resident Evil 2 remake. Keeps diapers white and pure without boiling or bleaching. Eliminate diaper pull odor. <laughs> it's actually not terribly uncommon for video games to flesh their backgrounds out with assets like these as opposed to making them fully from the ground up. And this often leads to interesting and sometimes unintentional easter eggs. It was an Instagram user, Far Zero, that brought this one from Resident Evil 3 to my attention. Hey Justin, just thought I'd aware you of an unfolding story of a 20 year easter egg in Resident Evil 3. Basically, there is this one segment in the game where you catch a glimpse of a pinup board in the Stagla gay station that references a few movies in the 90s. Images to follow. It's gained some traction on a 4chan retro gaming board with a few movie buffs finding the images. Any chance you could help with your audience reach to find the rest? I figured you'd be the best person to ask. Kind regards, Farce. And here's the pinup board in question. Now, right off the bat, I figured out that the upper left image included Hugh Grant, and looking through his IMDb, I quickly found the exact image, which is of him and Andy McDowell from Four Weddings and a Funeral. But you see, that's one of the easiest ones to figure out, along with this one from Back to the Future 3. Both of which were identified almost 10 years ago by a YouTuber named Resident Evil user. Resident Evil user also pointed out that you could find images of Larissa Olnick from the secret world of Alex Mack in Resident Evil 3. The person who originally posted this mystery to 4chan also identified the picture in the bottom right. Now, the bottom right image in the billboard is from a 1993 film called A Home of Our Own that I stumbled upon by chance when looking up Edward Furlong's filmography. One of the images looked awfully familiar. It took another few weeks to remember I made the first association with Resident Evil 3. And this picture here was identified by another user as Winona Ryder in Age of Innocence. And the image of three people sitting in the grass was identified as Johnny Depp, Mary Stuart Masterson, and Aiden Quinn in Benny and June. And these are all of the pictures on this pinup board that have been 100% identified, but we do have some other potential leads on the rest. One user noted that the top right picture looks like Colin Firth, but he doesn't have the exact image. Although another person pointed out that maybe it's actually a time-traveling Todd Howard. In this image of a man and a woman, a lot of people think that the man is Christian Slater, and some people noted that he starred alongside Winona Ryder in the movie Heathers. However, it's also been pointed out that Winona Ryder might be too short to be the woman in this picture. And as for where you should start looking if you want to take part in this investigation, all of the pictures that have been identified so far have been promotional shots from early 90s movies. And now here are the rest of the images that haven't been identified yet. If you think you know the identity of any of them, please let me know in the comments section. 
You hear a lot these days about loot boxes being gambling for kids. And while loot boxes are a terrible game mechanic and they suck, that version of gambling for kids has nothing on the version of gambling for kids that I grew up with. Feast your eyes upon the ultimate gaming rig. Sega Genesis, Neo Geo, TurboGrafx-16, Super Famicom, a stereo, a big screen TV, a hi-fi VCR! Every 90s kid's wildest dreams were only $5 and a crossword-like puzzle away. But come on, it definitely wasn't that simple. And therefore, I present to you the story of the ultimate gaming rig. If you were an avid reader of game magazines from the early 90s to the mid to late 2000s, as I suspect many of you are, you've definitely come across one of these ads. Every console you could possibly have at the time combined with a top-of-the-line home theater system and sometimes computers. And what's even better, you know, this isn't just the usual sweepstakes where you mail it away and you have a one in a million random chance to get picked to win. No, this was skill-based. And being the high IQ gamer that you are, you're definitely gonna win this, right? It first appeared in 1991, presented by a company called Pandemonium. And it would return month after month for years with different names like Puzzle Me, or Bane Dramage, or Rattlebrain. You have the power. In this contest, you don't rely on the luck of the draw. You determine if you win or not. You win by outscoring others in a game of skill. Can you solve the puzzle below? Then you have what it takes. It looks simple, but it's only the start. Each of five more puzzles gets a little harder, but this time, it's all up to you. Stay into the end, and the gear is yours. With whatever options you want, do you have what it takes? Then play to win. Video Game Contest. Play any 16-bit game in the world with this lineup. Neo Geo Gold. Nintendo Super Famicom, Sega Genesis and the TurboGrafx-16. Get all four or trade the ones you don't want for cash. Bonus options, adapters, games, accessories, cash and more. Media Rig Contest, the ultimate gaming environment. 40 inch monitor, 130 watt receiver with Dolby Pro Logic surround sound. Infinity speakers. Subwoofer, CD player, Graphic EQ, Dual Cassette, and Hi-Fi VCR. This rig will blow you away, literally. You'll not only see it, but feel it. Directions. Fill in the mystery word grid with the correct words going across to spell out the mystery word down the end. Hint. Use the word clue. In the future, there will be four more puzzles at $2 each and one tiebreaker at $1.50, which will arrive by mail. You will have three weeks to solve each puzzle. We don't how many will play, but typically 47% will have 30% to phase 2, 25% to phase 3, and 20% to phase 4. The tiebreaker determines the winner. If players are still tied, they will split the value of the prizes. Alright, let's do this. Wow, the mystery word. Blank games. Gee, I wonder what kind of games they might be talking about. I don't know. What a test of wits this was. Alright, so as you probably guessed, I did enter this contest once. And although the puzzles did get a little bit more difficult each round, they were still mostly really easy. Each round you would get similar word puzzles, but eventually a mechanic is introduced where the points have score values, and it's not so much a thing about finding the mystery word or things like that, but getting the highest score. When you get to the last round, there is a completely blank grid, and it sort of becomes like this game of anything goes Scrabble. I remember when I got to that last round, I wrote up like 10 different versions of the puzzle, and I thought I had gotten the highest possible score, but I guess not because I didn't win. That is, unless maybe the whole thing was a scam and it wasn't winnable, but nobody really knew for sure. It was a thread started on May 7th of 2004 on the cheap-ass gamer forums that would eventually lead us to the answer. The Successful Dropout I don't know if this has ever been posted, but I've seen this contest in magazines forever, and have always wanted to try it out, so I signed up and completed the first set of puzzles. Now I'm waiting for the next set to be mailed to me. It goes like this. 
In some magazines, recently the June 04 issue of PSM on page 61, they have this contest advertised, where you pay as you play, a few bucks, filling out mystery word grids and puzzles to compete with other people who are filling out different versions of the same puzzle for prizes. You can win the ultimate gaming rig of over $20,000 in prizes. They have a computer contest, video game contest, and media rig contest. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Has anyone ever tried this? Is it a scam? Many of the other forum users expressed that they were surprised that this contest was even still going on, and many assumed that it was just a scam. But nobody could really answer for sure, and shortly after the thread fizzled out. The thread had been abandoned and forgotten about for over a year until October 2005, when it was resurrected by a user named Mr. McGee. Mr. McGee had gotten in touch with the man who ran the contest. I decided to be so bold as to email Rattlebrain and ask them whether this contest was legit or was it a scam. Amazingly enough, they replied. The following is the letter from the contest director. None of it has been manipulated. BTW I posed under a different name just in case. Hi, Stephanie. I've been doing puzzle tournaments for 20 years. At that time, if I had been a scam, none of the magazines would let me advertise. I do what I say I will do, and if you find yourself not happy at the end of the contest, I'll send you a complete refund. This is why I have lasted so long. I hope you give us a shot. Rick Lund, Contest Director of Bean Dramage Inc. I also asked several other puzzling things about their contest. I'm waiting for their answers. I might just post them. After his thread was revived, the successful dropout returned to tell us the status of his entry. I forgot all about this thread. Anyways, I didn't win. Why? Because the puzzles that they send you are all time sensitive, and they sent the last set of puzzles to me later than the due date. Great scam, bastards. Sounds pretty sleazy, right? Well, as it turns out, I guess he should have checked the fine print. Mr. McGee, I was smart enough to get my hands on their official rules. If it came after the deadline, it is not their fault. It is the postage systems. I was worried that because of Hurricane Katrina, the mail system was clogged or destroyed or something like that. Not that I wasn't worried about the victims, either. I donated a lot of money. It was just a thing that bothered me. It was like four weeks between the puzzles, so yeah. Anyway, their official rules explain a lot, too. What caught my eye the most was the possibility of getting a full refund if my puzzle came past the deadline or if I'm not happy with the contest results. I might just post it. Also, I'm in the finals and just mailed it out. On the off chance I do win something, I'll take pics or something. From this point on, the thread would remain a lot more lively, with people coming throughout 2005 to compare their contest entries, theorize about whether or not the contest is a scam, and recall the episode of Doug that had a contest like this that turned out to be a scam. A few other people from the Cheap Ass Gamer forums managed to get in contact with Rick Lund, who would either delay their responses or give them stories about sore losers giving him problems. And it was on January of 2006 that Rick Lund sent out an email clarifying the sore losers problem. To all customers of Bane Dramage who have sent us email, once again we are extremely sorry about our slowness to respond to emails. We have had an ongoing problem which has rendered our email completely unusable. A couple of disgruntled contestants who were angry at losing the contest have embarked on a massive phony email solicitation campaign. They have used our email addresses to bury us in a sea of spam, which has made it impossible to have time to distinguish between customer mail and spam. We're talking about thousands of emails per day. This, of course, jams our inbox and prevents many emails from even getting to us. We humbly ask that you forgive us for this problem. We have now established a new email address for you to direct your questions. It is banedramagehelp at mac.com. If the questions you may have had are still relevant, please resubmit them there, and we will respond in a timely fashion. Slowly, at first, and then more quickly as we catch up. If you had questions which hurt your participation in the contest when they went unanswered, let us know and we will send you a prompt refund of all entry fees if you so request. Once again, we apologize for this deplorable situation and we thank you for hanging in there. It's strange that an email spam problem was able to completely bring this operation to a halt, which makes you wonder, was this all just one guy running a contest out of his bedroom? 
But after the email problem was resolved, the contest went on as usual, but nobody from the cheap ass gamer forums was able to secure the W. And once again, that's if the game was even winnable and no one seemed to know for sure. Well, the answer to whether or not the game was winnable, as well as the explanation for the constant name changes, came in a post by a user named Karcheroth in February of 2006. Hi everyone that entered the Bane Dramage contest. I, in the past, I had entered this contest when it was known as Pandemonium Inc. At that time, I didn't win, but when I entered the second time, I won all three finals. That's where the fight began. At that time, Rick, the contest owner, lived in Minnesota and proceeded to move to Oregon with no forwarding address to me. After three or four months, I tracked him down to where he is now and confronted him over the phone. He gave me a sob story that he had no money, was going through a divorce, and had no money to pay me. I didn't care. I wanted my winnings, and after more phone calls and heated arguments, he sent me a small portion of what I was owed, about a fourth of the total. It took almost a year from when I won to when I received even that much. You could imagine my surprise when a month later I noticed the same contest advertised again, only this time under the name Puzzle Me. So to see what would happen, I entered again and I won two of the three finals, Computer and Home Theater. Once again, months went by with no prize winnings. Again, I phoned him and this time he told me he was declaring bankruptcy and wouldn't be able to pay me a dime. I thought it was a lie, but a month later I received court documents from Oregon asking me to put a claim in, but as he had no assets left, in all likelihood I would receive nothing, so I didn't bother. Well, imagine my surprise when about a year later the exact same contest was advertised yet again, but no under the rattle brain. This time I couldn't enter because I had just turned 30, but I kept track of this company looking for problems through the Better Business Bureau and sure enough, a complaint was lodged against this contest as well. I hope this time will be different for whoever wins, but from my own personal experience, I have my doubts it will. Also, my winning scores range from about 17,500 to a high of 18,418. Anything under 17,000, unless the high letters are X or J, will in all likelihood not win. I hope this helps wondering about this contest. And a month later, another former winner named Malth would come forward. I enjoyed reading all the posts on this page and decided to post my own story in case anyone else is trying to research this company. Another page you need to read is Game Set Watch, which shows many if not all of the advertisements for this contest. It is hard to find real information about the company that offers this contest. That is your first clue. I entered the contest about 10 years and countless incarnations of this company ago. I worked really hard on the final puzzle, which is difficult and variable enough that only one person is likely to get the high score. It requires you to use the Oxford English Dictionary and other dictionaries to find really obscure and small words, and fit them into a grid in such a way as to obtain the highest possible score. Long story short, I won. Imagine my pride at having beat all the thousands of people who entered the contest, and my anticipation of winning all this awesome stuff. Guess what? That's right, I got nothing. What I did get was a series of what I believe to be the official courtroom proceedings of the bankruptcy of what was Pandemonium. I cannot make a claim on what was due to me because the amount was too small. I went so far as to obtain a consultation from a lawyer who directed me toward the Better Business Bureau. I was in college and decided not to try to pursue legal action, because who has the time and money for that when what you're owed is relatively small, and you're trying to get it from a bankrupt company, and you're a broke college student? I still have all the paperwork from everything I did for the contest, all my countless words that I found and the myriad grids I filled in trying to achieve the best score that I could. And let's not forget the documents of the bankruptcy proceedings. It all serves as a reminder of the hard work I did which I am proud of, and the fact that there are people out there in this world like Rick Lund who are failed, worthless human beings who make a living preying on the dreams of innocent young people, stooping to the lowest depths and using the loopholes in the court system to continue to perpetuate a business scam, calling kids sore losers when they justifiably complain and criticize the operations of this puzzle contest. Just look at the number of times this business has changed names and addresses over the years, folks. 
legitimate businesses change locations maybe once in 10 or 20 years when they outgrow their location, want a bigger demographic, buy out another company, etc. But rarely do they change names frequently. Caveat emptor. Yes, I probably should have known better, but like the others on this page, I had seen the ad for a long time and was curious to see if it really was legit, and if so, whether I could actually do what it took to win. What I got was a lesson in the dark side. Do not enter this contest. Put your money and energy to work in other endeavors that are likely to pay off. As for Rick Lund, if I ever find him, I'm going to chop off his you-know-what and feed it to him, if somebody hasn't already beaten me to the punch. And then, a little under a year later, another former winner named Abigoria would come forward. Hello everyone, it has been a long time since I entered Pandemonium and Puzzle Me contest. I have been a winner three times while under the name Pandemonium, and three time winner under Puzzle Me, so a total of six times I have won. As of this day though, I have only received enough money to pay just one out of the six times that I have won. I have called Rick Lund so many times and been so patient with him, and have always when I talked to him on the phone, I was given a story of why he can't pay me, but always kept my hopes up that in the future he was going to be able to pay. Example, after he runs another contest he would have money to pay me then. So yeah, I kept my hopes up and yeah, I got paid only $500 a month, and that $500 a month only lasted a few months because the company filed bankruptcy and started up again under the name Puzzle Me. I entered Puzzle Me contests and won three, but it didn't matter because the same thing happened again. Although I got a little more this time than before, but still, I nearly won $50,000 in total between the six contests, and maybe received a total of 6000 The figures are vague, as it's been so long ago and I can only base it on memory, although I do have all my records of my winnings. So to anyone that enter this contest, it's impossible to win if you don't know what you are doing, and if you do know what you are doing, it's still a slim chance on winning. And finally, if you do win, I wouldn't expect to actually receive what you won, based on my past experience with Pandemonium, Puzzle Me, and Rick Lund. I am in total shock to find out that he has yet another contest going again under another name. It is unbelievable how this can keep on going for all these years, but I guess it's people like me that won and just sit back and accept what he pays us and don't push it any further or take legal action. And that is why I am guessing he can still keep on running these contests. If anyone on this forum wins the recent contests, I like to know how it turns out with actually getting your prizes slash money. Good luck to anyone doing these contests. So with all that in mind, here's what we know about these contests. They actually were winnable and you actually had to get a really good score to actually win them. This meant that the company's staff, or maybe even Rick Lund himself, had to go through thousands of contest entries by hand. This went on for over 15 years, and it seems like just about every time when people did win, they wouldn't get anything that they won or just a small piece of it. It seems strange to me that someone would create such a complicated system just to scam people when there's so many less involved, less hands-on ways to deprive people of their money. I mean, isn't the whole point of scamming people to get a lot of money for little to no work? So I have an alternative hypothesis. What if Rick Lund actually did set out to create a legitimate contest business, but at the end of the day, he just didn't have what it takes to run a business like this? When I look into the story of this contest, it reminds me of how I used to read these books on entrepreneurship and, you know, getting rich and things like that. And a lot of times, you would come across stories of people who started their empires with very simple ads in magazines and newspapers and things like that. But in the case of a business like this, where he's just advertising a very appealing thing in a video game magazine, he goes from just being some dude working out of his bedroom to all of a sudden he has thousands of pieces of mail to go through probably by himself. And we could see the evidence for that by the fact that he's sitting there 
talking to people on the phone himself and responding to emails and dealing with email spam by himself when an abler businessman would be delegating these menial tasks to employees. So he's clearly in way over his head, but at the same time, he's got envelopes full of money coming to him month after month after month, year after year. So he throws his hands up in the air and says, fuck it, and keeps the thing running until the wheels fall off. In practice, this leaves us something that's basically indistinguishable from a scam, but I think it's important to know what was going on in Rick Lund's head while running this thing to really understand the story of the ultimate gaming rig. I'll put a poll up and see what you think. And I would also like to know if there's anyone watching this who wasn't in that thread that won or actually successfully got their refund, let me know in the comment section. Rebecca Chambers, I think, is one of the most underappreciated characters in the entire Resident Evil series. The only surviving STARS Bravo team member, her obvious inexperience combined with her ability to come in clutch just made her a very likable character. Although she did eventually get her own game, it was just a prequel and I had always wished that they would do something more with her story after the mansion. And like the other characters in the first Resident Evil game, the actress behind her live action scenes remained shrouded in mystery for decades. Credited only as Linda and with far less screen time than a lot of the other characters, fans weren't left with much to work with. Yet somehow, after years and years of investigation, this mystery has finally been put to rest. So in this episode of Gaming Mysteries, let's take a look at the search for Rebecca Chambers. Recently, a lot of my old Resident Evil videos have been finding their way into YouTube's Recommended, and as a result, a lot of you have been asking about the other voice actors that I didn't cover. And although there's still a few of them that are unaccounted for, one of my favorites, Rebecca Chambers, has actually been found somewhat recently. As the only surviving member of Bravo Team, Rebecca didn't appear in the opening sequence in the woods. She first shows up in that super 80s cast of characters montage, and then Linda's seen again in the helicopter if Chris saves her. As with most of these actors, the search starts not with the live actors themselves, but with the voice cast who were also uncredited. And Rebecca's voice actress was actually one of the first ones found. She was voiced by Lynn Harris, who you might recognize from Time Crisis. Let me go! Hold it! And as it turns out, not only did she also voice the self-destruct sequence, she was also central to the game's development as the voice acting director. This put her in a prime position to identify the other actors, something that she did help do when she was contacted by the owner of the Raccoon Stars blog. And after it became more well known that it was Lynn Harris who provided the voice of Rebecca Chambers, a rumor started that she was also the live actress. And I can kind of see the logic in that, I mean, Linda could very well be an alias for Lynn. But unlike with Barry's voice actor, the resemblance wasn't quite there. And it would be confirmed later on in an interview with Barry's voice actor that Lynn was only a part of the voice crew and had nothing to do with the live action scenes. And although a lot of the live actors in Resident Evil generated a lot of potential suspects, there were far fewer for Rebecca. In fact, the most persistent rumor was that Rebecca Chambers was played by Carrie Byron from Mythbusters. This was a rumor that didn't really seem to be based on that much evidence so much, it was just that they kinda look alike. And I see a little bit of resemblance, but not so much that I would consider this a hot lead. And if she did in fact portray Rebecca, I can't help but feel that this would be a thing she would have spoken about and it would be one of those things that's just like a commonly known piece of pop culture trivia. Regardless, Alessandro Conti, the owner of Games and Movie Blog, contacted her agent for confirmation, although her agent never responded. Another theory that developed involved an unknown actress named Linda Rodriguez. This theory stemmed from an absolutely <laughs> Gloriously. Shut your mouth. Horrendous. They just told us any location without intention. There is no meaning behind this location. Game known as Deep Freeze. This game, which had some of the same voice talents as Resident Evil, had a section in its end credits labeled Actors. In this section, which was separate from the motion capture artists and the voice artists, there's a credit to someone named Linda Rodriguez. 
fueling speculation that Linda Rodriguez was our Linda. But the thing about Deep Freeze is that there are no live-action sequences, it's all CG. Although it's not really clear why the actors were separate from the voice artists, I imagine it's just because they had a more active role in the story. It was more involved, so it bumped them up from artiste to actor. None of these leads were great leads, and the search would kind of meander on for years and years until March of 2019. It was in March of 2019 that Fred Durf of the Raccoon Stars blog was put in contact with a woman named Linda X. Presumably no relation to Malcolm X. <laughs> and after getting in touch with Linda X, Fred would publish this picture. Oh yeah, that is definitely Rebecca. He also published an interview where she spoke about the shoot. Hello Linda, I'm contacting you because I believe that you are one of the uncredited actresses who played the character Rebecca Chambers in the Japanese video game known as Biohazard and Resident Evil Overseas. The filming occurred in Tokyo during the year 1995. You can check out the making of and live cutscenes there. You will remain anonymous as long as you wish it and keep your privacy. Thanks very much for your time. Hi Fred, what a surprise. You know, I've never seen this, so it was so nice to finally get a chance to see it. I was really young when I did the shoot, and never saw half of my work, so thank you. Could you tell us what you remember about the filming and how you got the job? I'll tell you one thing, the job was loads of fun. Back in the day, this kind of stuff was still fairly advanced and high tech. I remember going to the shoot, and they had these amazing man-made machine Dobermans. They were really lifelike. I also was blonde. My hair wasn't the right color for the job, so they dyed it. They spray painted it some pinkish brown color. I remember the staff being very kind. It was a nice job. Easy. The Japanese are generally extremely kind. Being a foreigner, white, blonde, skinny with blue eyes in the 90s was dreamy. I won't lie. You get a lot of attention and people just love you. She also spoke about what it was like to be doing this kind of work in general in Japan. So I felt very happy in Japan. Life was easy. I went to 10 to 15 casting every day, so I have no idea when I saw them or if they went directly with our agency and only choose model with our agency. There is a casting sheet in the model van. We would drive around from morning till dawn every single day, usually from 10 until 8 p.m., going on castings auditions. The sheet would be very basic. 10 o'clock lingerie, 12 o'clock magazine, 13, commercial for mornings, and so on. There were regular clients and huge cattle calls, hair jobs, catalog jobs. Fred would also try to find leads regarding the other actors. You have a good memory. Do you remember anything about Jason and Inez? Maybe you remember their accent. I guess everyone was talking in English on set. I mean, the actors talking with each other. I think it was American. They were nice. I was a lot younger, so I remember them looking like adults compared to me. I had smaller bones. I was thin. I remember she looked like a woman. Not like a model, more healthy and average. Pretty, but not model type. She had a body, and usually girls like that didn't work well. She was taller. I was still very young. I felt like they were older, and our roles were different so much in the shoot we weren't together. And then, you know, all these years, people are looking for one of the most legendary game series of all time. You gotta ask the question. Did you know that this video game became a huge and popular franchise? One of the best selling worldwide. This question is dedicated to the people who still call us stalkers and creeps. I had no idea. I didn't even remember that I was in it until you showed up. I went in to do other jobs. So many jobs. Sony, Toshiba, car commercials. But I love my time in Japan. Best years of my life. And that seems to be a pretty consistent story with these actors. Uh, they went in to do so many different jobs that Resident Evil was just one of many things. And there you go. Linda, the actress for Rebecca Chambers, found, and as I understand it, Fred intends to ask her some more questions in the future. As for the other actors, Inez who played Jill is still being looked for, as is Jason who played Joseph Frost in the intro. So if you have any leads on that, contact either me or the guys at the Raccoon Stars blog. Donkey Kong is one of Shigeru Miyamoto's most important creations. Without Donkey Kong, there might not be a Nintendo. Having saved them after their previous arcade game, Radar Scope, was a commercial failure. It was the massive success of Donkey Kong that allowed them to fund the NES. But after building an empire off of his back, Nintendo strangely left their old pal DK to collect dust. While his rival Mario became the face of the company, and new faces like Link and Samus joined the fold, 
Donkey Kong was barely seen outside of the odd cameo for over 10 years, until he was reborn in Donkey Kong Country. It seems odd to me that Nintendo would let such an important character just fold to the wayside for so long, but what if they had actually been planning to bring him back sooner? Well, the recent Nintendo Giga Leaks, which revealed tons of unknown Nintendo prototypes, might have revealed some evidence that Donkey Kong's comeback had been in the works longer than we realized. What does this have to do with Yoshi's Island? And for that matter, what does this have to do with Plock? For today's video, let's take a look at the strange Nintendo prototype labeled Super Donkey. As someone who's always been fascinated by lost media and weird video game stuff, these Nintendo Giga Leaks are filling me with the same sense of wonderment and magic that I used to have just sitting down with my Game Genie trying to find weird levels in the original Super Mario Brothers. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, basically two massive sets of old Nintendo data were leaked recently. In this data exist several prototypes of old Super NES and Nintendo 64 games. You can see things like early designs for Yoshi where he has these weird skinny chicken legs, and a beak, and no shoes. This version actually to me kind of looks like Shigeru Miyamoto's original idea to have Yoshi in the original NES Mario Brothers. In fact, this version of Super Mario World has everything for the reptile foot enthusiast, because we also got Bowser showing off the toes in this design that looks a lot like his Super Mario 3 version. And we've also got rooms from the original Zelda 64, and a human woman in Star Fox 2. Uncompressed versions of audio. Do a barrel roll! Oh yeah, and Luigi in Mario 64. And it seems like Luigi is everyone's favorite revelation so far, and it's totally understandable. It's probably been one of the most searched for things in all of gaming history. And while that's really cool, to me there's something even more interesting in here. To me, the most important thing to come out of this leak so far is a file included in the Yoshi's Island directory. A game labeled Super Donkey. Super Donkey features this pilot looking dude in a jungle world filled with creatures that are both friendly and unfriendly. He's very round with limbs that are disconnected from a body in a way that's reminiscent of Rayman or Plock. But this appears to be mostly a stylistic choice as he doesn't attack by launching his limbs. Rather, he can stomp enemies, charge up to fly, and he can use certain objects as weapons. The stages themselves appear to be very open and non-linear, with a map to tell you where on the screen you actually are. I imagine that if this concept was more fleshed out, it would be kind of an objective-based game. I think there probably would have been some kind of goal you had to reach before you were allowed to go through the exit doors that are on every stage. Like you have this stage with monkeys that you can pick up and maybe you had to put the monkeys somewhere to pass to the next area. So why is this thing sitting in the Yoshi's Island folder called Super Donkey? Well, the obvious place your mind would go with this being a Nintendo game is that maybe this was supposed to be a Donkey Kong game. And in fact, in Japan, they referred to Donkey Kong Country as... Super Donkey Kong! So it would make sense that this was planned to be Donkey Kong's comeback game, and there is some evidence for that. Obviously, this little pilot guy isn't Donkey Kong. But historically, up to that point, Donkey Kong had been an antagonist. It makes sense that this might be a continuation of that, and some people have pointed out that this character resembles Stanley the Bugman from Donkey Kong 3. And that's honestly where my mind first went when I saw all this. I mean, I could just picture him pumping his little bug gas. But then I took another look at how Stanley actually looked, and he's a very different character. Honestly, the Stanley connection is probably just the case of fuzzy memories filling in the blanks. But that being said, Nintendo does have a long-abandoned character that looks like this. Sky Skipper, which was released shortly after the original Donkey Kong and featured a guy in a little airplane blowing up gorillas. But if you take a look at this character's sprite sheets, they reveal something else. Who is that? Mario? It definitely looks like he's either transforming or taking off his helmet to reveal Mario. 
I doubt it was intended for him to be this character, especially considering you don't normally see the mustache. If I had to guess, maybe this was supposed to be some kind of a brief sight gag, or maybe an item that did something. I mean, it is a Donkey Kong game, so maybe there's a point where you get a hammer and you go all bup it up 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 it up 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 And while we're looking at the sprite sheets, let's take a look at this one. Now, this could just be a generic gorilla. And if that were the case, it would point towards, once again, Skyskipper. But that looks an awful lot like Donkey Kong. And to that end, I want to make two comparisons. First, look how similar this is to the design of the Game Boy game that came out in 1994. There's some differences, like the placement of the hair and the tie. And the tie, by the way, was suggested by Shigeru Miyamoto during the development of Donkey Kong Country. When he made this suggestion, he sent Rare a few sketches. When we look at Miyamoto's sketches, we see that the hair on this Donkey Kong more closely matches what we see in this sprite sheet, down to the little points of hair on the back of his head. It was always strange to me that Nintendo released these two games so close to each other with two completely different designs for Donkey Kong. Perhaps this points to the fact that at some point there is more planned for this version of Donkey Kong. It's like looking into another dimension where this is the guy that we see in Smash Brothers. And the timing of all of this works out very nicely, too. You see, the Super Donkey ROM is believed to be from early 1993. Nintendo's working relationship with Rare begins in the summer of 1993. This was after Tony Harmon, who was the product acquisitions and development manager at Nintendo of America, was impressed by Rare's 3D work. He brought this back to Nintendo, and Nintendo decided that they wanted a game in this style. There's conflicting accounts of whether Nintendo presented Rare with a catalog of Nintendo characters they can use, or whether Nintendo specifically requested a Donkey Kong game from Rare. But either way, Donkey Kong Country was the game they decided on, and it began in the summer of 1993. Obviously, Nintendo can't just put out two different Super NES Donkey Kong games with two completely different styles right back to back. So whatever was already being worked on had to go. But Game Boy, on the other hand, that's a whole other story, and really, they're just revisiting the classic gameplay with that game. And honestly, I don't think that's the first time something like that happened to Donkey Kong. You see, there is another abandoned attempt at bringing him back, and even less is known about this one. All the way back in 1987, Nintendo began promoting a game called Return of Donkey Kong. He was mentioned in the official Nintendo Player's Guide, and then later in 1988 in the Nintendo Fun Club newsletter. That barrel-throwing rascal Donkey Kong is some kind of crazy. In Donkey Kong, he has Pauline in his clutches. In Donkey Kong Jr., he gets locked in a cage. In Donkey Kong Jr. Math, he knows the score in a math jungle. In Donkey Kong 3, he makes trouble for Stanley the Bugman. And now, Donkey Kong is soon to come back with more barrel-tossing fun, but this time, you're in control. Are you video buff enough to handle the one and only Return of Donkey Kong? Watch for it. Obviously, this game never materialized, but in 1988, Nintendo did put out a game called Donkey Kong Classics, which included the original Donkey Kong and Donkey Kong Jr. With that in mind, it seems like that was their formula for a proposed Donkey Kong comeback. You remind people of the old games while teaming them up with the new game, but both times that didn't quite pan out as planned. Now, let's take a look at the Yoshi's Island connection. I've seen some people doubt that this game had anything to do with the development of Yoshi's Island, and it's a reasonable doubt, I mean, there's a lot of blanks being filled in with speculation here. There are similarities in the art style, and it was found in the Yoshi's Island directory, but to me, there's one thing that is an absolute smoking gun. I don't know if they were the first person to discover this, but it was the first person I saw pointed out. Ilor on Twitter noted that a single background from Yoshi's Island is visible in Super Donkey. Not only that, but at the top of this background graphic there are trees that you can never see through normal means in Yoshi's Island. In Super Donkey, you can see these trees. Oh, and something else that I noticed after recording this video that's probably even a bigger smoking gun is the fact that this roly-poly bug enemy is in both versions of the game. So at the very least, these games are sharing some assets. Something else that stood out to me in this regard was a comment about the old game, Plock. If you haven't played Plock, you absolutely should play Plock. It is 
hands down one of the best platforming games on the Super NES and very underappreciated. It managed to take these relatively linear stages and fill them with a genuine sense of exploration. It also features an incredible soundtrack and really distinct, almost clay-like art. It's punishingly difficult, don't get me wrong, but in my opinion, very worthwhile. Well, in an issue of Retro Gamer, Steve Pickford, one of Plock's developers, mentioned that at one time, Nintendo was actually considering publishing Plock. Shigeru Miyamoto absolutely loved this game, but ultimately Nintendo wound up passing on it. Pickford said that he suspected Nintendo was developing Yoshi's Island at the time, and perhaps Plock was too similar. And if we look at Yoshi's Island as it is, that seems like kind of a strange statement. I mean, sure, they're both colorful platforming games, but that's basically where the similarities end. Really, the look of Plock is nothing like Yoshi's incredibly distinct hand-drawn style, and the gameplay couldn't be further apart with Yoshi needing to take care of baby Mario and Plock shooting his limbs and needing to hunt a specific amount of fleas. But if we look at Super Donkey, all of a sudden these similarities get a lot closer. All of a sudden now, you have two characters with limbs floating in the air unattached to the body. I remember at this point, we're still a few years away from Rayman being in the picture. And then you have the mechanic where, in some stages, Plock needs to kill a certain amount of fleas before he can advance. If Super Donkey really did have objectives to advance to the next screen, as I theorized before, that would make it a lot more similar to Plock than Yoshi's Island wound up being. Of course, obviously for that to be true, Pickford would have had to have knowledge of Super Donkey. Maybe he did, or maybe this is all just a coincidence. Something else to think about was an interview on Nintendo's own website that came out during the promotion of the SNES Classic. In it, they spoke to the directors of Yoshi's Island. One of the directors, Shigefumi Hino, remarks on where his career was with Nintendo at the time. Hino is the creator of Yoshi, and he had been working as a character designer for Nintendo since Super Mario World. Before development of Yoshi's Island began, Miyamoto spoke to Hino and suggested that perhaps it was time for him to helm a project of his own. Here's what he said. So, Miyamoto-san was trying to say that you should stop with the art and come up with the project. Yeah. So then I entered a period of thinking up all sorts of projects, experimenting with them, and canning them over and over. It got to the point where I thought if the next project fell through, I couldn't stay at the company. You were prepared for the worst. Yeah. Just then, I had the idea of making Yoshi the main character in a game. I began by starting to think about making the game a sort of spin-off of the Super Mario series. When Hino mentions all this experimentation and the starting of new projects, I can't help think that maybe this directory, which contains not only Yoshi's Island prototypes, but other seemingly related projects are simply what remains of Hino's experimentation. And I say projects plural because there is another game in this directory, something called Sleep. Not much seems to be known about Sleep as of the time of me recording this, but it seems to involve a character that's sleepwalking. Something that could make for a pretty interesting gameplay mechanic, although I also see how this could basically just turn into a 2D escort mission. Whatever it was, it doesn't seem like it was as far in development as Super Donkey was. But something else to consider now is that in interviews, Shigeru Miyamoto has stated that development of a sequel to Super Mario World began almost as soon as the first one was done. In total, there's about five years of development in this game, so perhaps we have some kind of convergence here. Hino's Yoshi idea intersects with the Mario project that at that point, 1993, had been in development for three years. And thus, what we now know as Yoshi's Island is born. But if that's the case, what this also says to me is that perhaps, Something exists that we could call Super Mario World 1.5. An unfinished game to bridge the gap between 1990 and 1993. Something that, as of yet, we haven't seen at all. If there's one thing that's clear from this leaks, it's that, unlike most video game companies, Nintendo is incredibly fastidious about maintaining their archives. So if such a game does exist, Maybe we'll see it someday. And with all this leaked stuff being combed through, and with promises of more leaks coming, that day might be soon. Although that being said, there's really only one thing on this planet that I need to see come from all of this. And you probably already know what I'm gonna say. Earthbound 64. I need to see Earthbound 64. 
Throughout the decades, Resident Evil has amassed a large ensemble of characters, each with their own expanding story. But if there's any one of these characters that comes closest to being the main protagonist, a very strong argument can be made that it's Chris Redfield, appearing in the most games of any characters and being on the cover of the first game. At least I think that's supposed to be him. What's up with that face? It's always bothered me. Actually, wait, it appears that there's actually a theory that this isn't Chris Redfield, but Richard Aiken. But that makes no sense. Like, the entire time he spends in the game is laying on the ground dying from poison. Ouch! And then in the DS version, there's that weird little clock puzzle where he gives you the clue, and it's very obviously a completely different voice actor switched in. Here's my radio. Set the dining room clock to 8.12. Oh wait, actually, according to the artist who made the cover art, it's neither Chris nor Richard, just some guy he made up. Point still stands, Chris is the closest thing there is to Resident Evil having a character that's the face of the series. Even making a comeback in Resident Evil 8 looking like a boondock saint. But like many of the other actors in the game, Chris Redfield's live-action performer went unknown for a very long time, being credited only as Charlie. Who was Charlie, and for that matter, who was the voice actor behind the character? Find out in this episode of Gaming Mysteries. Alright, I know that all you guys are waiting for the new Jill Valentine episode, I know it was big news that her actress Inez got found. And the story behind the discovery was pretty interesting, however, as of now, Dr. Raichi and Fred Durf, Predator fanboy who runs the Raccoon Stars blog, who have made contact with most of the other actors in the past, have sent her some interview questions. I really want to wait to see what she says in that interview before I make the update video, so stay tuned for that. In the meantime, I thought it would be interesting to talk about some of the other actors from that game who I haven't spoken about yet, first of which being Chris Redfield. Let's start with the mysterious live-action sequence actor, Charlie, who spent his time on camera serving up confused, disgusted faces and lighting a cigarette with that famous lighter he would eventually gift to his sister Claire. The story of Charlie's discovery is a bit different from the other actors. Charlie became aware that he was in Resident Evil when a friend of his who was a gamer came across footage of him in Resident Evil on YouTube. The friend sent the footage over and it brought back fond memories of this shoot that Charlie hadn't seen since. A few months later in October, Charlie, full name Charlie Kreslavsky, spoke to Fred from the Raccoon Stars blog. In the interview, he explains that he lost track of the project much like the other actors in the game. It was very difficult to get production companies to make a VHS copy and mail it to you. It's not like today, where they can just email you a link. He goes on to describe how he got the job. At the time, he was represented by a Japanese agency called the Inagawa Motoko Office, which specialized in providing foreign talent for Japanese productions. It sounds similar to the agency that was mentioned by Linda, the actress for Rebecca, although she didn't recall the name. And speaking of the other actors, Charlie didn't work with most of them again, however, he mentioned that he often worked with Eric Pierius, who portrayed Albert Wesker. What this means is that there are several Japanese productions from the mid-90s that have nothing to do with Resident Evil, yet contain both Chris Redfield and Albert Wesker. When speaking of Eric, he mentions that he often saw him riding his bike recklessly around Tokyo, often running red lights to the point where he was concerned for his safety. And funny enough, Eric, in an interview with the channel J-Dub's Video Nasties, alludes to his love of cycling. It's actually a pretty interesting interview, so I'll link that in the description. And while I'm talking about Wesker, here's a fun tidbit that I noticed. If you remember from my video about Rebecca, there was a theory for a while that she was one of the voice actors in the game Deep Freeze. As it turns out, Eric Pierius, Albert Wesker, actually did perform one of the voices in that game. Credited as Eric Scott, a pseudonym that he often used. Going back to Fred's interview with Charlie, it gave us some funny insight into just how much the concept of Chris Redfield changed since the original game. I remember seeing the sketches of the characters at the audition, and how cool the costumes looked. They asked me permission to dye my hair, which is naturally very dark brown, almost black. And they also asked me to grow some stubble. I remember the stylist having a very strong opinion that the character would never grow stubble, that he would be very disciplined about shaving, while the director felt very strongly that I would have stubble because we would be on the mission for several days. 
when they dyed my hair, they used straight peroxide, which turned my hair almost a red color. That red hair with my almost black beard stubble looked ridiculous, so they decided the character would be clean shaven. Back in those days, they probably also would have never imagined that Chris would ever be punching boulders. He also speaks of that opening sequence, the one where Chris is running down the hallway before ultimately some monster gets him. At the end of the sequence, the director wanted Chris to open his eyes really big for that title screen shot. An iconic motif that's since been repeated several times throughout the series. But he just couldn't get his eyes big enough for the director's liking, so he came up with a pretty funny solution. The very last frame of the video is a close-up of my eye, just before the creature kills me. We shot this in one of the hallways at the abandoned warehouse. I remember the director saying, When the camera comes right up to your face, open your eye as big as you can in terror. I did as he asked, but my eyes are kind of small to begin with, and it did not look big enough for him. So we tried it again, and he told me to wait till the camera got close in, and then use my fingers to open my eye even bigger. I remember at the time thinking that surely they will see my fingers in the shot, but it looks like it worked okay in the end. And if you're curious about other work that Charlie's been in, he actually has a YouTube channel with some clips of projects he's been in. And, uh, I'll link the channel in the description along with the full interview that Raccoon Stars did. As for the voice actor behind Chris, he was performed by Scott McCulloch, who often went by the name Ramsey Scott and is not to be confused with the other actor Scott McCulloch, who often has his credits mixed up with Ramsey's. Scott, who also worked as a radio DJ, was like a lot of other video game voice actors in that he was very prolific and had a lot of roles that you might have heard before. Like Paul Phoenix. Guess that's a bit of foreshadowing. The narrator from Castlevania 64. Reinhard Schneider, heir to the ancient Belmont clan of vampire hunters. Oh, and while we're talking about Castlevania, probably one of the most iconic lines in the series history. Die, monster! You don't belong in this world! It's so weird how you can play Symphony of the Night a million times and play Resident Evil a million times and never put together that these are the same voice actor, but once you know it, it's so obvious. Die, monster! You say this failure is your savior? Scott's last role would be in Shenmue where he would simply provide some various NPC voices. Unfortunately, in September of 2000, Scott passed away in a traffic accident. In an interview with the Resident Evil database, Barry Jurdy, who did the voice of Barry Burton, spoke of Scott's passing. Unfortunately, Scott passed away on 24th September of 2000. I've heard that some Resident Evil fans say this is not true, that he didn't die, but it is true. I went to his funeral wake, and I saw Scott lying there before me in an open casket. I also met his widow and their young daughter. This had a great impact on me. Having traveled to India, I had seen dead bodies before in Varanasi, also one time in Taiwan. A young man lying on a street killed by a truck, but never had I seen a friend deceased in a coffin. Scott's funeral week was Friday, 29th September of 2000. I will never forget it. Many members of Tokyo's foreign voice talent community came to pay their respects. He was well known due to his radio show on Inter FM at the time, a mostly English language radio station in Tokyo. Scott's mother and sister were also there from Canada. Who knows how many classic lines he would have given us throughout the years, but one thing's for sure, the work he did do will never be forgotten. And anyway, that's the story of the actors behind the original Chris Redfield. For now, follow Dr. Raichi and Predator Fanboy on Twitter as they'll be the first ones to know when Jill Valentine responds with the interview questions. When A Nightmare on Elm Street 3 The Dream Warriors hit theaters in February of 1987, it marked a turning point for the series as well as for Freddy Krueger himself. Into the Fire by the band Dokken hits and thus begins Freddy's shift from being a terrifying monster that Wes Craven conceived of after reading news stories about people mysteriously dying in their sleep, to becoming a full-fledged pop cultural icon. The Hulk Hogan of horror with toys, games, trading cards, music albums, by the late 80s, he was inescapable. See this. This right here is an authentic Nightmare Fetty. Putting my sponsor money to good use, buying rare bootleg stuff. 
The movie itself, which I consider to be my favorite of the entire Nightmare on Elm Street series, introduces an overarching continuity to the films with its reintroduction of the first movie's protagonist, Nancy Thompson, as an intern therapist at a psychiatric hospital. A hospital full of teens who all claim to have been seeing the same man in their dreams. Cookie stuff, right? No wonder they've been institutionalized. But luckily for them, Nancy's been through this before and she saw Freddy once again with her own eyes. But where everything really changes here is with the discovery of dream powers. Each of the Elm Street teams has their own unique dream power where they can fight Freddy in the dream world. Powers like Kincaid's super strength, Taryn's knife skills, Will's magic. While leveling the playing field in this way might have made Freddy less scary, it helped keep things fresh in the increasingly saturated 80s horror movie genre. And it made for a really unique, interesting story about these characters regaining control over their own lives that had been unjustly taken from them. And it's also a concept that would have made for a great video game. And yeah, there were two games made for it, and honestly, they're not that bad. At, at the very least, they could have been way worse. But something that will always linger in the back of my head are these old screenshots of a different Nightmare on Elm Street game that we never got. A game where you are Freddy. So for this episode of Gaming Mysteries, let's take a look at the Lost Nightmare on Elm Street game. If you've watched any of my retro game streams, you've probably noticed I have a little bit of a tendency of being somewhat of a LJN apologist. Like, alright, I can see how a lot of the games are just objectively not good, but I like them. There's just something about grinding zombies in Friday the 13th, and yeah, I know there should be zombies in Friday the 13th, but, you know, you kill, like, what is it, like a hundred of them and you get a machete? There's just something about sitting there and doing that that scratches some weird itch for me. Zombies and bird attacks? It's an NES game, don't think too hard about it. And a lot of people seem to remember the Nightmare on Elm Street game for NES as one of the least worst LJN games. In a Nightmare on Elm Street for NES developed by Rare and published by LJN, up to four players take on the role of the Elm Street teens, who are on a mission to collect Freddy's bones, so that they can incinerate them and put them to sleep once and for all. Standing in their way though are not just Freddy Krueger, but all of the classic Nightmare on Elm Street monsters that you know and love. And all the stars! You really keep up with all that. Are stuff. here tonight, oh yes. But the longer you take to get those bones, the later it gets, and the more tired the teens get. Eventually, they fall asleep and wind up in the dream world with horror monsters, but also, they can become the Dream Warriors Shadow Warrior, Acrobat, and Necromancer. Clearly, this all does tie into the third movie, but at the same time, they avoid using any of the specific characters. Perhaps they wanted it to be more like you're playing yourself, which is plausible considering how much your blank slate character looks like the yourself character from another LJN game developed around the same time, WWF WrestleMania Challenge. But something else to consider is just how long it had actually been since Dream Warriors came out. In the more than three years before February of 1987 when the movie came out, and October of 1990 when the NES game came out, there had already been another two Nightmare on Elm Street movies released. And this is totally unrelated to the topic of the video, but this piece right here created by Graham Humphreys, this isn't from DeviantArt. This is legitimate promotional material from Nightmare on Elm Street 5. I, I just feel like you needed to see Pregnant Freddy. Why did it take so long? Well, one possible reason for this is that at some point, they just scrapped the whole game and started over. As far back as September of 1988, LJN had a completely different version of the game that was far along enough in development that they were showing pictures of it and promoting it in magazines. The earliest known appearance of this game is issue 2 of Nintendo Power. Bundled with the magazine was a poster from LJN promoting their interactive line of video games. Get it? Because it's entertaining and it's interactive. It's interactive. Some of these games included Friday the 13th, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, which is, in my opinion, one of the better games that LGN made, and X-Men, which, on the flip side, is a strong contender for the worst video game I've ever played in my life. Also appearing on this poster, A Nightmare on Elm Street. 
but a completely different game from the one we got. This one's showing an overhead view of what we can only assume is Springwood. And at first glance at this image, I immediately think of the PC Nightmare in Elm Street game that came out. This version was developed by Westwood Studios and was more overtly tied to Dream Warriors, giving you the ability to play as Kincaid, Kristen, Will, Taryn, or Nancy. In this one, you run through the streets of Springwood looking for Freddy's home while avoiding the giant Freddy that's hunting for you. His home is indicated by bright lights, not dissimilar from the house that you can see in this screenshot from the LJN poster. Once you get into the house, you go through several floors filled with monsters, traps, and Freddy himself with nothing but your dream powers to stop him. In my opinion, the superior of the two Dream Warriors inspired games that came out. And based off the screenshot alone, I would have guessed that originally the game was supposed to be a port of the PC version. But then the description throws that theory completely out the window. It's your greatest dream and your worst nightmare. You are Freddy Krueger. And I can't continue reading this without pointing out that both his first and last name are spelled incorrectly. He's not Freddy Mercury Krueger, the gruesome star of the Nightmare on Elm Street movies. Use all of your evil powers and special abilities to track down and destroy your pursuers before they bury your bones. So this one keeps the concept of burying Freddy's bones, as happened in the movie. But they flip the script and now you're Freddy. You're killing non-specific pursuers, which I assume would be the Elm Street teens, the Dream Warriors, although knowing that this is LJN, there's probably like zombies and birds in the mix too. I'm not quite sure how that would actually work in a game, and part of me, especially thinking about those spelling errors, thinks that maybe the person who wrote this copy was simply confused and wrote it wrong. But another LJN poster from this time period tells us that, oh yeah, no, this was the game that we were supposed to get. You are Freddy Krueger. At least I got his first name right this time. A horde of obnoxious teenagers is trying to get rid of you by finding your scattered bones and burying them. The only way to stop them is to kill them. You can travel along Elm Street through the electrical and plumbing lines or step into a mirror and step out in another room. The kids have weapons to battle you with, and some of them even possess powerful dream alter egos. But if you can strike before they wake, they'll trouble you no more. So sharpen up your finger razors and get ready to slash, cause Freddy's here. In addition to the screenshot of the overworld that the previous poster showed us, there's two more screenshots in this one. Now of what appears to be some kind of 2D side-scrolling game. One with Freddy as a snake and the camera being set in such a way that indicates that yeah, you're definitely playing as Freddy. And you're hunting down some generic green shirt brown pants guys that kind of resemble Sandman from Spider-Man and you're battling them inside the houses. If I had to guess how this game plays, I would imagine something kind of similar to Friday the 13th. Perhaps your bones were scattered about the various Elm Street houses, and then when one of the Dream Warriors was getting close to uncovering them, you'd get a little indicator, and you would have to travel to the house and stop them. Or maybe it was just a more simple side-scrolling game, and you would just clear the houses like they were levels. In any case, keep in mind that all this promotional material came out in 1988, and the game didn't come out until 1990. And it was a year after these posters came out, in September of 1989, that we would hear about this game once again. In issue 8 of Nintendo Power, there was an article talking about the NES's new peripheral, the Nintendo Satellite which would allow up to four people to play a game, and in this article, they talk about A Nightmare on Elm Street. The magazine shows a screenshot of a different title screen that's in the final game, and it also shows a screenshot of Freddy encountering two of the enemies that were shown in the poster, now of different colors and in a boiler room. But the description that's there tells us about a completely different game. You may never go to sleep again once you enter Freddy's Nightmare World. You and three of your friends, the Elm Street neighborhood gang, have only your cunning and the power of the satellite to get you through this LJN horror pack. So although the images are of the game we didn't get, the description describes the game that did come out. And note that at this point now, we're a full year before the game came out. So you have to ask, what actually happened here? It's clear that a completely different version of this game existed that was far along enough in development to have multiple locations, multiple types of gameplay, and to be promoted as something that's coming soon. 
In fact, considering the screenshots from the Nintendo Satellite article, perhaps there is even another version, a missing link between the prototype and the version we got. Maybe they switched it so you're playing as the kids instead of Freddy, but they just used the same assets. So why would a change like this happen? The most commonly accepted theory is that a game where you play as Freddy and kill teenagers would not have gone over in this time period. Although it had happened several years prior, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre game had this issue. Because you played as Leatherface and killed people, a lot of stores refused to stock the game, so it was a financial flop. But there are some other possibilities. I mean, perhaps a platformer where you play as a nearly unkillable Freddy Krueger and you just, you know, run around killing a bunch of schmucks might not be a very fun game. Actually, who am I kidding? This is LJN we're talking about. But something else to consider is that the NES satellite came out in 1989, the halfway point between when we started to see images of this game and it actually coming out. Perhaps at some point in its development, Nintendo came along to LJN or Rare and was like, hey, we want a game for the NES satellite, we gotta sell this peripheral. So the old game goes in the garbage, and then it's like, hey, we got four-player Nightmare on Elm Street. In any case, the prototype, which almost certainly does exist, has never been found. Hopefully it's just sitting around in the storage of an old LJN or Rare employee, or maybe even a Nintendo Power employee. If it does turn up someday, I imagine it will be playable, and I think we'll be surprised by the type of gameplay we see. The more I think about this game, like, the more I almost put it up there with Earthbound 64 as a game I just, I need to get my hands on. I need to see it for myself. In my recent video about the Lost Nightmare and Elm Street game for NES, there is one possibility that I neglected to mention. And when I received an email from a viewer who had personally investigated this story for years, it seems like it might be the most likely explanation. The explanation being that perhaps the prototype didn't actually exist and the screenshots we saw were simply mock-up images. So for this video, let's take another look at these screenshots. But if you have no idea what I'm talking about, I suggest you watch my other video on this topic first. If you don't feel like it, here's a super fast summary of it. So for a period of time in the late 80s, LJN was promoting a Nightmare on Elm Street game in posters alongside its other games and it also had articles written about it in Nintendo Power. This was a game where you played as Freddy Krueger and you had to kill the Elm Street kids. This wound up being completely different from the Nightmare on Elm Street game that actually came out in 1990, implying the existence of a prototype that we've yet to actually get our hands on. And that brings us to now. So on January 21st, I received an email from a person who had just watched my video about the lost Nightmare on Elm Street game. His name was Armageddon Potato. And what Armageddon Potato does is he helps document NES prototypes for the cutting room floor. If you don't know the cutting room floor, it's basically the website to look at old prototypes of video games as well as stuff that's buried in the code of retail releases. In his first email, he tells me that it's a popular school of thought that the images seen in magazines and the posters were actually just mock-up images. And he thinks that the only screenshot from this prototype that has a chance of being real is the title screen. He mentioned that LJN throughout its history had had a lot of issues with games that were butchered between the early versions and the release. A lot of this came from issues with higher-ups in the company and sometimes even Nintendo themselves. The example he used to illustrate this was Beetlejuice. He sent me a variety of screenshots comparing the prototype versions to the release versions, and the thing about this is, it is a little different from the Freddy situation. In the Beetlejuice screenshots he sent me, it's very obviously the same game that has had some change made to it, and not a completely different game. At that point, I wasn't really sold, so I asked him if he had any specific evidence for the Nightmare on Elm Street game. And as it turns out, he did, and it's actually pretty convincing. He talks about how a lot of his knowledge of NES prototypes comes from websites he used to browse, like Play the NES, Nintendo Player, and Nintendo Age. Discussions about different NES prototypes have come up a lot on these sites' forums. And Freddy was always a hot topic. There was always a lot of debate over whether these images were of a game that had actually been developed, or if these were merely concept images for a game in its ideation phase. And a lot of the community members who were more knowledgeable with how the NES actually works noticed a lot of damning inconsistencies in these screenshots. First, let's take a look at what's the least strong piece of evidence here, the prototype title screen. 
Although there doesn't really seem to be anything amiss with the artwork, there's an issue with a white speck that appears in this image. This isn't an artifact from scanning the magazine, as it appears in multiple different scans of it. Still, there exists the possibility that this is some kind of error with how the magazine was printed or something like that, but a lot of people think that this is the cursor from an art program. And adding to the cursor theory is that a similar white speck appears in other images. Next, let's take a look at the three screenshots from the standalone Freddy Krueger poster. What's interesting here is that you have two kids, one facing one way, one facing the other. And this guy's saying, what do you want from me? And they're both in the same frame of their walk cycle. NES games, unless there's something specific to the character that's different on each side of their body, will typically just flip the sprite depending on which way they're facing. Yet if you take one kid and compare him to the other, they don't match up. One kid is ever so slightly fatter, and also one kid is also centered on the floor a little bit higher. It could be some kind of weird distortion in the image, but that seems doubtful to me, especially since the top of Freddy's body in both images matches up. And there's no way in hell they would have went to draw two different versions of the kids for facing right and facing left. And something else he pointed out that's not really connected to the debunking, it's just an interesting thing. If you look closely, the Freddy snake is coming out of a sink faucet, implying that the pipes you see in the overworld map are the sewer system, and that's how you got around the map and into these houses. Finally, let's take a look at what's to me the most damning piece of evidence here, the overworld map. Now, NES games have a very limited amount of space for art. This causes them to do everything they possibly can to save room by reusing sprites. Sometimes even in unexpected ways, like probably the most classic example of this, the clouds in Super Mario are just the bushes recolored. Not only does this prototype image not take steps to make the graphics more economical, it seems to go out of its way to make it as wasteful as possible. For example, there's the case of the bottom floor windows. Not only are they shaded differently from each other with one having a broader line on the side, but they also have lights underneath them that are centered differently from each other. Now, all artwork in an NES game fits on a grid of squares. I can envision a scenario where maybe the way the houses were placed made them off the grid so they would have to make a separate sprite for it, but it would have been so much easier for them to simply make the houses fit inside the grid so they could reuse the same assets. Rather than redraw every single window for some reason and make them slightly different from each other. And after that, to me, the absolute smoking gun in this particular screenshot is the ground. Look at how the ground is speckled because, you know, that's how you make dirt look dirty. Normally, you'd see some kind of a pattern that would repeat over and over again so you're not wasting a bunch of tiles on specks on the ground. For example, let's take a look at the fence the grass, and the dirt in Friday the 13th, another LJN game. Look how you can see the patterns repeating. Compare this to the Freddy overworld, and you can see that these specks are all over the place. Although some parts of the ground do look like they repeat, there's so many different variations in the spacing that it would take so many different tiles to actually make this. It's as if it was made with a spray can tool in a graphics program. To me, that seals the deal that these were mock-ups and not images of a game playing on actual NES hardware. That being said, even if these are mock-up screenshots, that doesn't necessarily mean that there is no prototype. But if the prototype does exist, there's a chance that it looks completely different from this. Maybe the inside was finished and the overworld wasn't. Maybe the screenshots inside are from different stages of development. Maybe they were just using this to pitch the game to Nintendo who turned it down. Although, to me, it seems strange that the game would be in that phase, and then they would still spend money on advertisements and promotional material. But sometimes in that business, you just get taken off guard. You can never know for sure. And Armageddon Potato noted something else that's important. In the world of collecting rare video game prototypes, there's kind of this war going on between the people who want to get these unseen games and bring them to the public, and the investors who just want to have these games all to themselves. There's been cases where a community would pool its money together to retrieve one of these unseen prototypes just to be outbid by a single wealthy investor. If this prototype were to exist, and were ever to get to an auction, there's a chance that someone like that has it sitting all to themselves in their collection. 
But there you go, some evidence that this thing might not actually exist after all. Hellraiser, released in 1987, is one of the most classic horror films in history. It tells the story of a man named Frank Cotton. After solving a mysterious puzzle box that was the key to untold pleasures, his body is ripped into pieces, subjected to extreme torment at the hands of the Cenobites, who don't distinguish between the sensations of pain and pleasure. Hanging out skinless in the attic, he tasks his sister-in-law, Julia, who he had an affair with, to bring him human sacrifices so that he may live once again. And as I give you this incredibly oversimplified description of Hellraiser, I know there's one thing on your mind. Surely, this would make an amazing game for the Nintendo Entertainment System. Well, as it turns out, such a game was in the works. In fact, it was actually one of many Hellraiser games that never saw the light of day. So for this episode of Gaming Mysteries, let's take a look at the Lost Hellraiser games. When I spoke about the unreleased version of the Freddy Krueger game for NES, I mentioned the possibility that perhaps it was Nintendo to put the kibosh on the whole thing. Nintendo's always had a more family-friendly approach to their games, especially at that period in time. It's likely that they wouldn't have approved the game where you play as Freddy Krueger and hunt down and kill kids. So if that wouldn't make the cut, you could be damn sure that a Hellraiser game wouldn't even get its foot in the door. But what if you cut Nintendo out of the picture? say, by way of an unlicensed cartridge. It wasn't unheard of to release unlicensed Nintendo games in this day and age. This way, developers could avoid Nintendo's restrictive content policies. They could also avoid the exorbitant fees they charge publishers for each cartridge, as well as the high minimum quantities that Nintendo demanded and the wait times. There were companies like Tengen, who released the first version of Pac-Man that I ever played, and Comerica, who published the NES versions of the criminally underrated Dizzy games, as well as Quattro Adventure, a favorite of Nintendo World Champion, Thor Ackerland. There is also such a company named Colored Dreams. You know what separated Colored Dreams from the rest of the pack here? Their games were fucking terrible. They're absolutely famous for releasing some of the worst games to ever grace that console. Don't let the beauty of the streets fool you, for you are about to enter a world of laser beams, exploding mines, and secret passages. Don't let this man fool you, these games are trash garbage. I know because some of the earliest videos on my channel were me playing Color Dreams games. Fucking head until he dies, jerk off. Then one day, Dan Lawton, the founder of Color Dreams, sits down and watches Hellraiser. This movie had a profound impact on him. He was so inspired by it that he knew he had to make a Hellraiser game. So he convinces his partners in the company to get together something between $35,000 to $50,000 to secure the rights to Hellraiser. But that wasn't enough. The vision was so much bigger. This wasn't going to be the usual fare that Color Dreams had been putting out. You can't just reskin Venice Beach, put Pinhead on a skateboard, and call it Hellraiser. And now, it's often said that this NES game was intended to be on an improved version of the Wolfenstein 3D engine. A very tall order considering the relative lack of power in the NES. And looking at all the facts, I think this common telling of the story is getting a few things mixed up. Note that while Wolfenstein 3D was released in 1992, Hellraiser for NES was in development in 1990 and even had ads appearing as early as that winter. Wolfenstein, on the other hand, wouldn't even be in development until 1991. There's simply no way that Hellraiser for NES was going to get the rights to a improved version of an engine that hadn't even begun development. But that's not to say that Wolfenstein wasn't involved, but we'll get to that later. In any case, the vision for this game was absolutely huge, with ads promising things like over 1 million worlds, over 100 demons to escape from, the largest game yet for Nintendo. And now, the promise of over 1 million worlds to me suggests some kind of procedurally generated levels, like Diablo or something. And in any way, you're not cramming all this on a regular NES cart. But without being hamstrung by Nintendo's proprietary cartridges, Dan Lawton goes and hires an engineer, Ron Risley. And he tasks Ron Risley with developing a better NES cartridge, the so-called Super Cartridge. In an interview with NES World, Dan and Ron described the cartridge as using a Z80 processor that intercepted the NES processor's ROM and RAM to manipulate video in real time. To put it in layman terms, in an interview with The Warp Zone, Dan says, We had a prototype built. It was great. 
it had at least three times the processor power of the Nintendo, with the extra processor sitting in the video memory space. It could change the entire screen every scan. By changing the content of the color registers, we hoped to come up with new colors also, although we didn't get to test that out. It was working, just no software. This super cartridge would undoubtedly provide an experience unlike anything ever seen on the NES before. Which is fitting considering how the Hellraiser films are considered by many to be some of the highest achievements of movie special effects. But there's a problem. You see, these things are going to be really, really expensive to manufacture. Thinking about it, I kind of picture a situation where it's like, imagine the Sega 32X, but if it was made just for one game. That's a really tough sell. And further complicating things was that this game was very unlikely to actually be sold in stores. Not just because of Hellraiser being Hellraiser, but because Nintendo was cracking down on the sales of unlicensed games in stores. So if you wanted to actually buy this very expensive, very niche game, you would have to get on the phone after seeing an ad in a magazine, get on the phone with Color Dreams, and order it that way. Perhaps they could have built up enough hype to actually pull this off, but it would have been a huge gamble. Thus, Hellraiser for NES gets shelved, and the only thing we ever see of it is this title screen that is quite possibly just a mock-up. As for what was actually completed of the game, Dan explained more in the NES World interview. About the possibility of a Hellraiser prototype existing, or at least the game files, Dan Lawton said, the hardware was done, and the artwork was 20% done. There was no programming. It was a 45 degree down angle view with a maze of stone and walls and pits. So there you have it. So a 45 degree down angle view once again sounds more like Diablo than Wolfenstein. And then in 1991, Color Dreams discovers a way to solve their distribution problem. See, you're not going to get an unlicensed game on the store shelf with Nintendo running the show, but you know who doesn't have to worry about that? The Christians. Christians have their own ecosystem for selling their own media. And if you're in it, you don't really have to worry about having that tag at Toys R Us. And at that time, Christians didn't really have their own video games. So, Color Dreams rebrands as Wisdom Tree and begins making Christian games. They're actually learning Bible stories while they're playing Nintendo. Menace Beach gets reskinned as Sunday Fun Day. They make Bible adventures. And most famously, the only unlicensed game for the SNES, Super 3D Noah's Ark, a game based on the Wolfenstein 3D engine. It's rumored that id Software allowed Wisdom Tree to use the engine for free as a way to kind of poke fun at Nintendo censoring Wolfenstein, but I think it's likely that that's just an urban legend and Wisdom Tree did pay for the rights. In any case, now you have Wisdom Tree, formerly Color Dreams, who has the rights to use the Wolfenstein engine. And the passion for Hellraiser was still there. So at some point in 1994, they take another shot at making the Hellraiser game. This time, it's for the PC, and it's built on the Wolfenstein engine. One last Color Dreams title. Even less is known about the development of this version, however, but Scarecrow, the owner of a Hellraiser fan site at Cenobite.com, was able to get some info from contacting the developers. Essentially, they were so happy with how Noah 3D turned out that they were like, let's do it. Let's make Hellraiser, but with the Wolfenstein engine. Ultimately though, their Hellraiser license was about to expire soon, so the clock was ticking. And at this point, Doom had already come out, so this game would have felt dated. So this game kind of fell through the cracks pretty early on. That being said, Cenobite.com was provided with screenshots of what little existed of this game, with one sprite sheet even still having remnants left over from Wolfenstein. Since then, there have been several other attempts at making Hellraiser games, but every single one of them has been fruitless. Shortly after Color Dreams' license expired, Konami made a play for it. As reported by GameSpot's video game Graveyard, according to EGM's West Coast editor Wataro Maruyama, who participated in the project as an artist, the Hellraiser game was loosely based on the movie by the same name and would have revolved around the goal of your character collecting charms. Although the license would suggest fairly gory creatures with chains and piercings, the development teams were told to let their imaginations run amok and create whatever they thought the creature should look like. The only prerequisite was that the characters needed to resemble whatever their assigned names were. The only character that had to be drawn exactly was Pinhead. 
Ultimately, Konami did not get the rights to Hellraiser, although it's unclear whether that was because the rights holders were simply not interested, or if they wanted too much money for Konami. Afterwards, another Hellraiser game would wind up much further along in development, one made by Magnet Studios, entitled Hellraiser Virtual Hell. This one was, for some reason, going to be another first-person game, now based off of the Duke Nukem 3D engine. It's described somewhat in a blurb on Clive Barker's website. Doug Bradley shot his scenes on a day off from filming Hellraiser 4. The game was plotted and was to feature Pinball, a new Cenobite that flung steel spheres, a la Phantasm, at players. It was slated for an early 1996 release from Magnet Interactive Studios, and then, nothing. The prototype game opened with an image of a computer morphing into Pinhead, who then opened his mouth and in you plunged. The hell was red misted and sulfurous and, as well as being like Doom with a 360 degrees feature, the walls and corridors contained machines and beasts that could be manipulated by the gamer. If you were to journey on to the Hellbound web, see your links page, you would even be able to see a few screenshots of how it would have looked and even hear some sound samples. <laughs> No more delays, no more teasing. Time to play. Time to die. Ultimately, this game never surfaced, mainly because the developers just thought it was bad. They even internally referred to the engine as Virtual Deaf, Dumb, and Blind and they said the FMV sequences were just cheesy and not done well. The most recent attempt to make a Hellraiser game was announced in 2011, when the Weinstein Company announced that it would be creating TWC games in order to turn its properties into games. The two they announced at this time were Scream and Hellraiser. Ultimately, the company wound up only producing two mobile games, Scream 4 and Piranha 3DD. The studio produced nothing else since 2012 and ultimately shut down in 2018. Maybe one day we'll see a Hellraiser game, or at the very least, you know, a cameo in Dead by Daylight. And honestly, it's surprising to me that, to this day, outside of a few small fan projects, there has not been a completed Hellraiser game. There's just so much you could do with that universe. And really, this goes for horror movies as a whole. You imagine, like, a modern Dream Warriors game or something like that? A Dawn of the Dead game where you're playing as Ken Fury in a shopping mall? A lot of missed opportunities there. Although the Cannibal Holocaust game is still in development. Sometimes when I'm sitting around, a bit of Simlish, that vaguely Eastern European gibberish from the Sims games, pops into my head. Something like, this Grom is French shake, and I'm like, yeah, this Grom is French shake. That the Sims have their own language implies the fact of a greater spectrum of Sims culture. A whole world out there waiting to be explored, and in The Sims 2, they did explore that world a little bit more. Part of that being the existence of a pop artist named Kitty Shack, who sang this song in Simlish entitled Another World. It's a catchy song despite, you know, the words not being words, which is really quite an accomplishment. No wonder so many people still go back and listen to it to this very day. But it also leaves us with the question, who was Kitty Shack and where is she now? Let's try and find out in this episode of Tales from the Internet. The mystery of Kitty Shack is one that's bubbled up online from time to time. And it's a hot topic once again after a post in X 4chan's paranormal board went viral. After the Twitter account X Takes reposted it on Twitter, people started asking me to look into it. So let's see what we can find. The post on X goes as follows. I don't know if you remember The Sims 2 for the PS2, but in that game, there was a song in Simlish called Another World by one Kitty Shack. I wanted to know what had become of her almost 20 years after that game came out, but looking her up online only brought more questions than answers. No activity online on her end for years now, all that remains being a dead Twitter account at Kitty Shacky and a blog, similarly dead. All throughout her online presence, she posted photos of actress Carrie Lynn Pratt or musician Britney Spears and claimed it was her, while also stealing her music videos. Her email is dead and her biography is just plain bizarre. What do we make of this? 
I'm pretty sure Kitty Shack could just be a fake artist made up by the studio, but why would they go so far as to push it to the internet to the point of stealing artist identity, images, and music videos? Make an entire blog with a fake biography and manage a Twitter account that ran up to 8 years after The Sims 2 was released. If it was a fan of someone with one song in Simlish, same questions apply. Also, before you ask, the only genuine photo we have of her is the one attached to this post. I could trace every other thing to KLP or Britney Spears, but this is the only genuine kitty shack there is. What's up with her? First impressions, I think it's basically a certainty that the name Kitty Shack was a pseudonym made up by the developers. As games around this time start to have more and more real music on their soundtracks, a few times you would have these fake artists mixed in. You produce a song in-house and put a fake artist name in there to kind of world build a little bit. One of my favorite examples of this is the song from GTA 2, God Bless All the Universe. Jesus, my savior. If you look at the credits, this song was made by Reverend Rooney and the Rockstar Choir, you know, like Rockstar Games. Despite not being terribly into gospel music, this song would just get stuck in my head all the time, so I looked them up to see if they had anything else. And what I found was that this song was performed by Stuart Ross and Craig Connor, who performed a lot of songs on the GTA 2 soundtrack. There are also additional voices, voiced by the creative director Gary Penn, who I assume is the preacher in the opening of the song, and a singer named Gerard Rooney, who, considering the lack of other credits he has, was probably a session guy they brought in to sing the song. Another suggestion I saw was that perhaps Kitty Shack was a small local or indie artist that they brought in for the game. Something else that I had seen happen in GTA 2, with the band Bulla Matari, who made the song Taxi Drivers Must Die, probably the catchiest song on that soundtrack. After reading about Reverend Rooney, I had assumed that this too was a fake band that made stuff for the game, but actually these guys were a legitimate punk band with a few other songs unrelated to the game. But that being said, it would be kind of goofy if there was just some independent artist out there just making songs in Simlish. Like, maybe I could see someone doing that today in 2021 as a kind of like a, you know, you do this thing that's tied to a popular game and you go viral online, like that kind of approach. But I just don't see someone taking that route back then. In my opinion, whoever sang this song was almost certainly a hired session musician. And unfortunately, the credits for Sims 2 aren't as clear-cut as the credits for GTA 2. Sims 2's music was produced by Mark Mothersbaugh, who you might know as the singer and main songwriter of the band Devo. There's also several other musicians credited in the game, and I searched the female names that turned up looking for the singer. Most of the names I searched just didn't really turn up any results or they weren't vocalists, but there were a few that came up. One was Jamie Myers, who sang for the metal bands like Flies on Flesh and the Hammers of Misfortune, and she has a song from Sims Bustin' Out credited to her. This is a very different type of song, I do not think this is Kitty Shack. Another person who turned up was Laurie Sue Shanneman of the band Ludicra. She's also credited on a song in Sims Bustin' Out called Blarg. Also a metal vocalist, I don't think this is Kitty Shack. A third possibility that turned up from the credits was Sunshine Becker, a singer who at one time performed with Further, a band consisting of former Grateful Dead members. Although to me her voice sounds like a bit deeper and more soulful than Kitty Shack, you might just have the range to do it. For that matter, I suppose it's also possible that the metal vocalists could have done the song, but it seems unlikely that they would hire them for both a metal song and a pop song. As of now though, we do not know who sang as Kitty Shack, but I think it's likely someone in this list of names. Now, some people have attributed the song to someone not in this list, a singer named April Start. And I believe this is due to a misconception caused by the really, really weird online presence of Kitty Shack. So let's take a look at this bizarre Kitty Shack blog. Some thought that this might have been a stunt done by EA to promote the game. 
And in this time period, we're looking at stuff like this being relatively new and popular. A lot of reality bending online promotional stuff with movies and games. Someone in a movie mentions a website and you go and it's a real website and you're like, wow! But this theory just doesn't pass the smell test to me for several reasons. For starters, if they were doing this to promote Sims 2, it would have began in 2004 when the game came out, but it did not. By the time this started, and throughout the decade it persisted, EA had a lot of other games they could have been promoting. And also, a lot of the things that this online kitty shack persona did would have gotten EA in legal trouble if they were behind it. And I just don't see EA playing so loosey-goosey with their marketing like this. All that being said, whoever did do this is safe to say is kind of a weirdo. Let's begin by taking a look at the Kitty Shack blog itself, which was created on February of 2014, 10 years after the game came out. Here's the biography that's on the blog. Biography. Kate Seymour Pratt, also known as Kitty Shack, and if you Google Kate Seymour Pratt, you only get this blog itself, as well as a Spanish article written about this mystery, is an American singer-songwriter actress born in Kentwood, LA. At 2004, she moved to LA to sign with The Sims 2 to record her song Another World to the game and won some money. And that right there is just not how this works at all. You don't sign to a video game like it was a record label. If anything, she wouldn't be performing quote unquote her song. She would be hired as a musician to perform the songs that were written for the game. Also, won some money like she was on a game show? It's called getting paid. According to an interview, the singer was broke, but the song and her talent gave her $50,000. In 2006, she recorded All About You. The single didn't make so much money, Maked, of course, being the past tense of make. After it, she just got a job of actress in a few movies, and sometimes she works singing at a few coffee houses around LA. After all, this is why they call LA the land of broken dreams. And of course, all of these pictures ostensibly of Kitty Shack are of other people. The childhood picture is Jennifer Aniston. The last picture is of the actress Carrie Lynn Pratt. Now, if you reverse image search the second image, the one that's supposed to be the real Kitty Shack, only the Kitty Shack blog turns up. But then someone in the 4chan thread found that this is actually just from porn. So whoever made this blog just happened to have this random naked blonde chick on his computer and was like, hey, I'm gonna make this Kitty Shack. The blog also has song lyrics listed for these songs including Another World in English and not in Simlish. Let's compare. Okay, that actually matches up, I can hear it. That one, not so much. Sounds like something about a zebra umbrella. Alright, I can hear it again. Alright, now that one is a huge stretch. You see, at first I thought it might have been a thing where they were translating the Simlish, but it's clearly supposed to be a sound-alike type thing. Like if you remember back in the day that Waking the Cadaver song and it was supposed to be shredded wheat. Or the Trivium one that was like, it's a curse that makes these wands out of Opeth. So if there is any doubt before, this person is definitely not connected to EA. They're just making up their own headcanon. Next point of interest is the Twitter account Kitty Shaggy, created in 2013, a year before the blog. A lot of what's posted on the blog is just more pictures of random blonde chicks, interactions with pop stars like Britney Spears, and amusingly, instances of her searching the Kitty Shack name in the song title and thanking her fans for their support. She also posts links to her YouTube channel, which was created on February 7th, 2014. Same time as the blog. And the day the channel was created, Another World was uploaded. And the next day, she posted her elusive song, the one that maked her less money, All About You. Except, wait a minute, YouTube's automatic copyright algorithm says that this song is actually All About You by April Start. And now, this right here is why people think that April Start was the one who sang Another World in The Sims game. But that's not what that means. What that means is basically this person just took a random song and said it was Kitty Shack. And then later on the same day, she posts a music video for the song, which is just low quality footage, super low quality footage from some teeny bopper cheerleading movie that I don't know what it is. I'm sure someone watching does. And then the next day, she posts Britney Spears Rockstar and says it's Kitty Shack Rockstar. 
and the day after that, the last track would be posted. This time, it's Sims 2 Chameleon, labeled as Kitty Shack featuring the Humble Brothers. It's an actual song from Sims 2, but Sims 2 just says it's by the Humble Brothers. And after that, this person basically vanishes from the internet. But this all actually does go back a lot further. On the Twitter account at some point, she links back to MySpace. You go to the MySpace, which was created on June 24th of 2006, eight years before the blog, two years after the game was released, and it has a bio. Hello, my name is Catherine McDuff. And in case you're curious, that name does not turn up anything either. AKA Kitty. Welcome to my MySpace. I am a solo artist. I have a recorded and whole unreleased album. My two most popular songs are Another World and All About You. Well, send me a comment, message, or feedback. Mwah. Consistent broken English across a decade. The blog posts on the MySpace are unfortunately not archived, but there is a link to a Yahoo group. In the Yahoo group, there's not really anything about Kitty, but in the archive of the group, there's a single post on the same day it was created, June 24th, 2006, entitled Kitty in No Blonde Article, and it links to an article on a site, winglitch.com. Articles, the end of blondes. In the article, the author basically just talks about how blonde hair may be bred out of humans within 200 years due to how genetics works. It doesn't appear to have anything to actually do with Kitty Shack, and considering that the site is mostly just tutorials on tech stuff and graphics, it's kind of a weird article. And in every archived version of this article, the image inside of it is broken, but I assume that it is one of the images that were used to represent Kitty Shack at some point. It makes me wonder if the person behind these Kitty Shack blogs was someone connected to this website, but absolutely no information is given about the people who created it. And this is basically where the trail runs cold. But one thing that, as I go through all this, that's really strange that sticks out to me and I just can't really figure out what the deal with it is. Why was there such a big gap between the Kitty Shack pages? The MySpace and the Yahoo group get made in 2006, and then nothing happens for seven years, then all of a sudden we have a Twitter account and a blog that refers back to these old pages. It makes me wonder if there wasn't actually two people who for some reason felt inclined to LARP as Kitty Shack from The Sims 2. But considering the similarities between these two phases of the character, maybe it really was just a person who decided to take a seven year break in the middle of their LARP. It's a very strange mystery and I can't help but think that maybe one day we'll see a continuation of this. It seems like lately we're on a big winning streak with these internet mysteries here. Mysterious song, still ongoing. Saki Sanabashi, the evil farm game. But these new mysteries are just getting knocked down one by one. One such case being Kitty Shack, the mysterious Simlish singer from Sims 2. A poster on my subreddit, homework busy, homed in on a lead that I missed when I first made my video, and followed it all the way to solving a mystery that's been discussed for well over a decade. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, check out my first video on Kitty Shack, but if you missed it, here's a summary. In The Sims 2, there's a number of songs that can be heard using Simlish lyrics, Simlish being the fake language in The Sims universe. In particular, people have been interested in the singer of a song called Another World. It was credited as being by a singer named Kitty Shack. But any search for Kitty Shack just turns up this weird blog that's clearly owned by some sort of role player and has nothing to do with the actual game, and is just full of statements that are very easily debunked. Although I found some potential candidates to be Kitty Shack, none of them really fit the bill. And that pretty much gets us up to speed. So when I was trying to find the artist behind Kitty Shack, I was basing most of my search on the credits that were listed on Moby Games. This caused me to home in on Devo's Mark Mothersbaugh, as well as the list of session musicians who were credited for the game. However, as it turns out, The Sims Wiki would have a different piece of information. A piece of information that would eventually lead to Kitty Shack being found. See, on their list of credits, each song had individual writers with Another World credited to Eric Presley. But you hear the vocals in that song. And I'll be well. That don't sound like no Eric I ever heard. A Redditor named Homework Busy goes on the Sims wiki and notices the Eric Presley listing. So he posts on my subreddit that there's a new lead. And he finds that if you search the Sims Eric Presley, you get a bunch of other songs. Like this one from Sims 3 called Da Linup with a vocalist that sounds like Kitty Shack.
he comes to the conclusion that Eric Presley was probably using the same vocalist for all of these songs. So we start searching for Eric Presley and eventually he comes across a Facebook page with a profile picture that shows him with a blonde woman who, as Homework Busy points out, looks like the woman that was used to represent Kitty Shack. Although, once again, note that the image of Kitty Shack that we have was just from the Role Players blog and not from the actual Sims content. In any case, she did seem to fit the bill, and it turned out that she was a singer. Her name is Natalie Noon, and she does sound kind of like Kitty Shack. So Homework Busy sends Natalie Noon a message. But while everyone's waiting for her response, a user named Tricepta has a different theory. I think you were on the right path, but took a wrong turn. I'm pretty sure I know who it is. I'm still looking for confirmation. Homework Busy thinks he's gonna say April Start, which we ruled out in the first video. But Tricepta's thinking of someone else. Nope, it's someone with a connection to Eric Presley, and someone that listed that she did work for The Sims 3. Also, I'm certain that's a different Eric Presley that you have linked. It almost seems like he's speaking in riddles at this point, but after taking a closer look, Homework Busy does think he might actually have the wrong guy. Because the Eric Presley from The Sims turned out to be a bass player for Belinda Carlisle, and he had a MySpace for his music that was a different guy from this guy. And also, as it turned out, that Eric Presley passed away in 2011. So Natalie Noon's resemblance to Kitty Shack was most likely just an odd coincidence. So what was the other theory that Tricepta had? At this point, Homework Busy suggests that Tricepta is thinking of another singer called Carrie Jo Crosby. And that was, in fact, who he was thinking of. Homework finds Carrie on Facebook and shoots her a message. Pardon me, but are you by any chance the singer for Sims 3, Dalinip? And if so, were you the singer for the Sims 2, Kitty Shack, Another World? I don't mean to bother you. I'm just trying to find the singer for these video games. And if by chance, did you do any other songs for EA slash The Sims? Thank you for your time. And she responds. Yes, I sang a couple songs on Sims 3, but not Sims 2. Did you also message me on Insta by chance? It turns out that at this point, Tricepta had already contacted her on Instagram, commenting on a video of The Sims she posted, which, interesting side note, in the caption of one of these Sims videos, she noted that it was the strangest gig she had ever done and received lyric sheets in both Simlish and English for the same song. So it's quite possible that every Simlish song was written with an English version. So Homework Busy brings Carrie up to date on the mystery and asks if there's someone she can reach out to who might know who sang the song. She says she can message a producer friend of hers who might know. And she comes back with an answer pretty quickly. Keely Hawks. She was the singer. At another poster, Chris Klein Fangirl noted that this wasn't the only time that Keely Hawks and Eric Presley would have collaborated. I've been investigating this too after watching Wang's video. Keely Hawks was in a band called Transistor, which according to Wikipedia, also had a member called Eric Presley, who is credited to doing other Sims songs. Here is a clip of one of their songs. The voice has to be Kitty Shack. So weird hearing her voice in English. I'm always swimming against the flow of the tide. Tricepta managed to get a hold of Keely Hawks through email and she confirmed that this is her. And in a comment on her YouTube channel, she verifies it again. Are you the girl from Sims 2 song Another World? Yep, that was my vocal. The song was produced and written by Charlton Pettis. And you can listen to the songs on her channel and hear, yeah, this is definitely Kitty Shack. Although I have to say it is a bit odd to hear her singing in actual English. Thus concludes the Kitty Shack mystery. One night, a long time ago, I was browsing a ROM site for legal backups of games I already owned, of course. And I happened upon a game called Drax Night Out. I had never heard of this game, so of course I had to download it and crack open the old nesticle to see what it was all about. And apparently, Count Dracula got himself some Reebok pumps. Never knew Dracula was a sneakerhead. If there's a way to slap an advertisement on something, you better believe that someone's gonna figure out how to do it. And these days, commercial tie-ins generate billions of dollars, but back in the 8-bit and the 16-bit days, they were nowhere near as common, and they were of varying quality. 
I'm still resentful of the fact that as a kid I never got to use my Pizza Hut coupon that came with Turtles 2. There just wasn't a Pizza Hut by me, and yeah, I could get better pizza anywhere else, but the important thing was the act of using the coupon. But back when companies were still figuring out how they were going to use video games to advertise to audiences, Dracula's Night Out was an attempt to get Reeboks out to kids. And the Reebok branding was extremely prominent in this game. It appears in the title screen as a power-up on the game and right square in the middle of the box art. Here's Count Dracula looking like a cross between Uncle Pennybags and Grandpa Monster doing his best hype beast look at my shoes pose. Although granted, he doesn't have the sync to complete the look. Still, despite the amount of branding in this game, it wasn't presented as a game about Reebok, like say Cool Spot or the severely underrated Chex Quest. And the game itself is actually pretty fun and unique. You begin in Dracula's castle, which has now been overrun by villagers who are presumably there to end his reign of terror. You can't attack them directly, though. Instead, you have to stun them using your vision and knock them down using traps that are strewn all about the castle. Most of the traps are timing-based, and once you knock them down, you can then suck their blood. Get enough blood, and then you turn into a bat that helps you get through the castle more quickly. The other way to get through the castle more quickly... Put on some Reebok pumps, of course. Once Dracula gets his pumps on, he's way faster and he gains the ability to jump. And that makes sense because a lot of the hype around Reebok pumps was that they make you jump higher. I'm not so sure that Reebok ever specifically claimed that they make you jump higher, but that's what everybody thought. I had a pair back then, and I remember not even being so sure that when I was pumping on my shoes that I could even feel the air, but it was still fun to do. And they look pretty cool too, in fact, now I'm actually thinking that I kinda wanna get myself a pair again. I guess the product placement worked. After you finally escape the castle, you get a cool little title card that's a reference to the original Nosferatu. The title card tells you that you're now going to town to look for Mina. And once you get to the town, the gameplay is completely different, switching to this aerial view that looks a lot like the Nightmare in Elm Street PC game. Now the angry mobs are searching for you in the streets, and it's really easy to screw yourself by walking into a dead end. And now in addition to the angry mobs, there's also regular unsuspecting villagers that you can feast on, and now you can turn into a wolf if you get enough blood. They also drop keys to let you go into houses, and inside the houses you'll find helpful old men, items, or sleeping women that you can turn into hot vampire babes who try to lead you to Mina. Emphasis on try. And then if you actually manage to find Mina on this surprisingly large map, you go back to Dracula's castle and the game starts all over again. Ultimately, this game, despite being finished, never came out, which is kind of strange to me considering the commercial tie-in and the fact that there wasn't a lot to it, but there were way worse games that came out for NES. In an interview with DigitPress.com, one of the game's developers, Mark Lesser, explains what happened. My favorite title at Microsmith's was Drax Night Out which Rex Bradford and I designed and programmed for the Nintendo NES. This was a fun game where the user controlled Dracula in his attempt to escape his castle by tricking and avoiding or hypnotizing the pursuing villagers and gaining strength from their blood. We designed a series of Rube Goldberg-like contraptions on each floor of the castle that, when properly triggered, could thwart the villagers. We developed this game as consultants to Parker Brothers. As we neared completion of the game, PB insisted that we include Reebok as a sponsor of the game by having Dracula wear Reebok pump shoes. Reluctantly, we complied, but the sponsorship was not enough to save the game, and although completed, it was never marketed. Ultimately, I think it's too bad that the game never came out. Maybe it could have used something a little extra in terms of different stages or game modes, but I think what does exist of the game is pretty interesting and worth a try if you can find it. Final Fantasy VI is probably my favorite of all the Final Fantasy games, and a big part of that is just how vivid and alive the world feels. You have so many little quirky side stories and unsolved mysteries that there's just a real sense that life goes on in this world, with or without the main characters. Of all of these mysteries, I think the one that I've thought about the most over the years is the character Siegfried. It just always seemed like there was so much more to that character than we ever saw in that game. I mean, he had his own unique sprite, a very compelling, random, quirky encounters that just seemed like it was building towards something more than it wound up being. It just seemed like way too much work was put into this character for it to have been left off as just like some unexplained running gag. As a kid, there was a time when I was so convinced of how important he was that 
I would sit there with a game genie and try to find a way to get him into my party, and although that never really uh, amounted to anything, I might not have been so off base with that theory. You see, recently I found out about a fan theory that Siegfried was actually supposed to be a bigger part of Gogo's storyline, and that makes so much sense. You see, when you meet Siegfried at the Colosseum, he tells you that there's a person that's been going around recently, impersonating him, and the, the Siegfried at the Colosseum is so much stronger than the guy you meet earlier in the game, and the guy you meet earlier in the game is characterized differently, he's kind of like a bungling idiot treasure hunter. And yet, despite what an idiot Siegfried comes across as, you have characters like Ultros trying to impress him, he says something like, when he's trying to steal the Esper statues that he hopes this gains Siegfried's respect. So clearly the Siegfried guy has some kind of a good reputation that the imposter is trying to capitalize on. Now of all the characters in the game, who else would do this besides Gogo? But at this point we're just making guesses and we don't really have anything substantial to back up this theory. What makes it actually plausible to me is the fact that Gogo was changed slightly before the release of Final Fantasy VI. As Gogo is in the game now, you find him by going to the Triangle Island, getting eaten by the Zone Eater, and then you just find him inside the maze. There's never really any explanation for why, and nothing to prompt us to do this. A lot of people probably would never have found Gogo if they didn't have a guide to tell him to do this, because there's no reason for it. The original plan for Gogo was going to be that he was going to travel to different towns in the game in real time, and you would have to meet him at a pub impersonating one of your characters. The developers found that this was just way too hard, you would never actually be able to be in the right place at the right time to find him, so they just changed this at the last minute. So here's what I think happened. I think the original plan was for you to go to the Colosseum, speak to Siegfried who tells you about his impersonator. That conversation would be the thing that triggers you to go out into the world and look for Gogo. However, they were so far along in development when they decided to change the way you find Gogo that they just left the unfinished quest in there. And there you go, all these weird little encounters with the fake Siegfried that never really amount to anything. Now it's just a little unsolved mystery to add some character to the game. But really, this is all just guesswork. I don't know if we'll ever know the true story about what Siegfried was supposed to be, or if it was totally intended for him to be the way that he is in the game. I don't think we'll ever know for sure. Anyway, if anybody else has any other video game mysteries that they would like me to talk about, please let me know in the comments section. If I use your idea for a video, I'll give you a shout-out. Right now, I'm gonna shout-out my dude Kevin, who he sold me so fucking hard on Final Fantasy XV that it kind of reignited my interest in the series, so thanks for that. Anyway, until next time, everybody get...